Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best, dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Tonight, I'm doing something a little bit different in the fact that it's not truly an old-time radio show, but I still believe that it qualifies for retro radio in what we're doing here. It's a canticle for Leibowitz. It's a post-apocalyptic social science fiction novel by American writer Walter M. Miller Jr., which was first published in 1959. The story is set in a Catholic monastery in the desert of the southwestern United States after a devastating nuclear war, and the book spans thousands of years as civilization rebuilds itself. The monks of the Albertian Order of Leibowitz preserve the surviving remnants of a man's scientific knowledge until the world is again ready for it. The novel is a fix-up of three short stories that Miller published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction that were inspired by the author's participation in the bombing of the monastery at the Battle of Monte Cassino during World War II. The book is considered one of the classics of science fiction, and it's never been out of print. It won the 1961 Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction Novel, and its themes of religion, recurrence, and church versus state have generated a significant body of scholarly research. A sequel, St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, was published posthumously in 1997, but we're only dealing with the first novel here. It is the entire novel that was made into an audio theater production. This audio production was adapted for radio by John Reed, and it aired in 15 episodes, all of which I am about to share with you, and it originally ran in 1981 on national public radio stations. Directed by Carl Schmidt, the series starred Fred Coffin, Russell Horton, Bart Heyman, and Herb Hardig, with narration by Carol Collins. Music for the series is by Greg Fish and Bob Budney and the Edgewood College Chant Group. The story starts approximately the year 500, after a global nuclear war has reduced mankind to barbarism. It centers around an order of monks living in an abbey in the former U.S. Southwest. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness Retro Radio. A Canticle for Leibowitz Part 1 of a series in 15 parts Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz Here begins the chronicle made and kept each in his generation by the monks of blessed Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Now it came to pass that mankind, as in the time of Noah, was swollen with pride. 
and the wise men of that age among them blessed Leibowitz placed great engines of war in the hands of princes. And the princes thought each to himself, If I but strike swiftly enough and in secret, I shall destroy those others in their sleep, and there will be none to fight back, the earth shall be mine. Such was the folly of princes. And there followed the flame deluge. Nations vanished from the earth. Great clouds of wrath engulfed the forests and fields. And in those places of the earth where men still lived, all were sickened by the poisoned air, so that while some escaped death, none was left untouched. In all parts of the world, much wrath was kindled against the princes and the magi who devised the weapons. And the wrathful said, Let us stone and disembowel and burn the ones who did this thing, together with their hirelings and their wise men. Burning let them perish, and all their works, their names, and even their memories. Let us make a great simplification, and then the world shall begin again. And so it was, that after the flame deluge and the fallout, there began the bloodletting of the simplification. And there perished in it rulers over empires and kingdoms, men of authority and wisdom, teachers of skills and sorceries, yea, even artisans. For the people were greatly wroth that the place of their habitation was become a slaughterhouse and a wasteland and a breeding ground of monsters. And they said, Let those who have dealt this destruction themselves be destroyed. And so it was. But there were some that perished not, that fled for sanctuary to holy church. And among them there survived our founder, the blessed Leibowitz. And this was in the days before he entered religion, who, while he was yet in the world, was wedded to a wife whose name was Emily. And by mischance she was not with him on the day of the flame deluge. Accordingly thereafter he searched for her long and zealously, but he found her not, neither alive nor dead. So he entered religion as a monk and was ordained priest. And many years passed, and in the fullness of time he searched his heart, and it seemed good to him that there should be instituted a new community of religious, given over to the preservation of learning. And he sent messages to New Rome, for old Rome was a heap of ashes and a desolation. And New Rome gave answer and said yes. So a monastery was builded in the desert of the southwest, and the brethren were robed in a habit made of burlap, and they were sent forth across the land, charged to bring back to the abbey secretly whatever books there might yet be that had escaped burning. And these brethren were called book-leggers. And other brethren there were who were charged with burying the books in great sealed casks, lest they be found and destroyed by vandals. And these same brethren were charged also to learn the books by rote, that the words might live, even though the books themselves be found and destroyed. And these brethren were called memorizers. Now it came to pass that our blessed founder, himself journeying as a booklegger, fell into an ambush, for he was betrayed by a traitor artisan known to him, who gave out, alas truly, that Leibowitz was not only a man of learning, skilled to read, but more, a maker and deviser of the great engines of war. This Judas our founder swiftly forgave. But the multitude, not so forgiving, gave our founder over to death, nay, to two deaths in one. For some would that he were burned, others that he were hanged, so not to make great divisions thereupon. They strangled him in a noose depending over a fire. Thus came our blessed Leibowitz to his martyrdom. And since that day, six centuries have passed. Nor in that time hath the world changed its ways, for there is still a great darkness abroad, and only within Holy Church doth the light of learning yet shine, and that chiefly here in this abbey, for here alone do the words of the ancient wisdom live on. We do not comprehend them, yet we do preserve them. Nor shall we ever forsake that duty, for this is our charge, that these, our memorabilia, endure to live on into a new age of light, 
Yea, even though the darkness in the world last ten more centuries, or even ten thousand years. For we, though born in the darkest of ages, are still the very bookleggers and memorizers of the Beatus Leibowitz. On the horizon, a small figure, wiggling in a shimmering haze of heat. It suggested a tiny apparition spawned by the heat demons who tortured the land. It was growing out of the mirror glaze on the broken roadway. It was coming toward him. Oh, no. He clutched at his rosary. At high noon, desert creatures lay motionless in burrows or hid beneath rocks from the ferocity of the sun and the heat of the wind. Only a thing monstrous, a thing with addled wits, would hike down the trail at noon. He added a prayer to St. Raoul, the Cyclopean, patron of the misborn, for protection against the saint's unhappy protégés. For who did not then know there were monsters in the earth in those days? the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Francis, brother Francis Gerard of Utah, on his Lenten vocational fast. He stared at the approaching figure. It squirmed its way out of the heat risers into clear air, where it manifestly became a distant pilgrim. A, a pilgrim? Just like that? The pilgrim was a spindly old fellow with a staff, a basket hat, a brushy beard, and a water skin slung over one shoulder. He was chewing and spitting with too much relish to be an apparition. And he seemed too frail and lame to be a successful practitioner of ogreism or highwaymanship. Nevertheless, Francis slunk quietly out of the pilgrim's line of sight and crouched behind a heap of rubble stone where he could watch without being seen. The pilgrim approached with inhaling distance, but the novice stayed behind his mound of rubble. The pilgrim's loins were truly girded with a piece of dirty burlap, his only clothing except for hat and sandals. Doggedly, he plodded ahead with a mechanical limp while assisting his crippled leg with the heavy staff. But now, close by, he broke his stride and paused to reconnoiter. There was no shade, just the ruins of age-old buildings. But some of the larger stones could provide cooling refreshment if one was wise in the ways of the desert. The pilgrim found a rock of suitable size. Approvingly, Francis noted, he did not grasp the stone and rashly tug, but instead stood at a safe distance from it and using his staff as a lever and a smaller rock for a fulcrum, he jostled the weightier one until the inevitable buzzing creature crawled forth from below. The pilgrim killed the snake with his staff and flipped the carcass aside. Then he overturned the stone, pulled up the back of his loincloth, and sat his withered behind against the stone's coolness. Thus refreshed, he wriggled his toes, smiled toothlessly, and began to sing again. A kind of crooning chant. While he sang, the pilgrim unwrapped a biscuit and a bit of cheese. Then his singing stopped, and he stood up. Blessed be Adonai Elohim, king of all, who maketh bread to spring forth from the earth. He sat down and commenced eating. Who maketh bread to spring forth? Well, 
Harmless enough. He'd come a long way indeed, thought Francis, who knew of no king with such strange pretensions. The rule of silence for the Lenten fast days did not permit him to talk to the old man voluntarily. So he stood up and loudly cleared his throat. <clears throat> the old man grabbed his staff. Creep upon me, will you? But stand back there now. Just keep your distance, sport. I've got nothing you're after unless it's the cheese. You can have that. If it's the meat you want, I'm nothing but gristle and I'll fight to keep it. Now back now. Back. Wait! Courtesy could take precedence over the rule of silence when circumstances demanded speech. He tossed back his hood to show his monastic haircut. Oh. The pilgrim studied the novice's sun-blistered, adolescent face. You're one of them. Huh. He'd made a natural mistake. Grotesque creatures who prowled the fringes of the desert often wore hoods to hide deformity. Among them were those who sometimes looked on travelers as meat. What are you doing out here? Francis picked up a fragment of stone and wrote three words in the sand. Penance, ah. solitude, oh. Oh. silence. Oh, you're still writing things backward. If the pilgrim understood the words, he did not admit it. He laid aside his staff, sat on the rock again, and picked up his bread and cheese. Here, have some. Francis had eaten nothing but cactus fruit and parched corn since Ash Wednesday. Come on. The rules of fast and abstinence were rather strict for vocational vigils, so that now his mouth flooded. His eyes refused to move from the hand that offered the food, that sandy tidbit of dark bread and cheese. Take it. His hand touched the hand of the pilgrim. His fingers felt the food. They seemed even to taste it. But then he pulled away, ashamed, and turned back to his labors. While the pilgrim cooled his feet, Francis wandered around in the ruins, staggered around, with rocks the size of his own chest. The pilgrim watched him select a stone, estimate its dimensions, reject it, select another, to be pried free from the rock jam of the rubble, to be hoisted and stumblingly hauled away. He dropped one stone after a few paces and suddenly sitting, placed his head between his knees. After panting a while, he got up and finished by rolling the stone end over end toward its destination. When the pilgrim had washed down the last of his sandy bread and cheese with a few squirts from his water skin, he slipped feet into sandals, arose with a grunt, and hobbled through the ruins toward Francis to inspect the novice's work. Brother Francis had dug a shallow trench. He had roofed it over with a heap of brush and used the trench by night as refuge from the desert's wolves. But on the previous night, Something had leaped to the top of his brush pile and howled. So he had determined to fortify the burrow, had begun to build a wall. The wall tilted inward as it grew. By a careful selection of rock, he would be able to complete a dome. You will need a strange shape of a rock to fit that gap. <laughs> the youth nodded and looked away. Well, well I, I best be on my way. Tell me, were your brothers at the abbey let an old man rest a bit in their shade? Yes. Oh, well, for that, I'll find you a rock to fit that gap before I go. Francis watched the pilgrim hobble away. Mm -hmm. He would pause occasionally to inspect a stone or 
pry at one with his staff. Doubtless he'd soon exhaust his patience and wander on his way. Ahoy! Over here! Francis looked up, saw the pilgrim's staff waving to him, and decided to ignore the old man. Hey, boy! I found you a stone! I'll mark it and set a stake by it! Try it or not, as you please. God with you. Later, by accident, he found the pilgrim's stone. Wandering around, he stumbled on the stake and found himself on his hands and knees, staring at a pair of marks, freshly chalked on an ancient stone. The marks were carefully drawn. Symbols. They must be symbols. The symbols of a witch. But no. The old man had called out, God with you. A witch wouldn't have done that. He pried the stone free from the rubble and rolled it over. In the place where the rock had been wedged, there now appeared a small black hole. Something in there? Holes are often inhabited. He found a stick, poked it into the opening. No resistance. He released it. The stick slid into the hole and vanished. Nothing slithered out. He sniffed at the hole. No animal odor. No hint of brimstone. He dropped a small rock into the hole. It bounced once a few feet below the opening and then kept rattling its way downward, struck something metallic in passing, and finally came to rest far below. Echoes suggested an underground opening the size of a room. He climbed to his feet and looked around. He seemed alone, as usual, except for his companion buzzard soaring on high, watching him with interest. The pilgrim had long since vanished. But he'd been right. The stone's size and shape did suggest probable fit. Francis hoisted it and staggered back to his burrow. The stone slipped neatly into place. The pilgrim's marks, though blurred by Francis's handling of the stone, were still clear enough to be copied. He redrew them on another rock, using a charred stick as a stylus, so he could show the symbols when the prior came on his next visitation. He worked on his burrow through the heat of the afternoon, but a corner of his mind kept reminding him of the hole. The interesting, yet fearsome, little hole. And the faint echoes from somewhere below ground. How could anything of interest have been missed by several centuries of stonemasons? Still, he'd never heard anyone mention buildings with basements or underground rooms. So he went back to the hole and stood looking at it, unable to put off the desert dweller's conviction that wherever a place exists to hide from the sun, something is already hiding in it. But no tracks except his and the old man's and the tracks of wolves. And what if there's something for the memorabilia down there? He began clearing rubble and sand from the hole. Suddenly, the rocks under his feet gave way and caved in. He fell, gasping, down into the widening hole. His belly hit solid ground and he hugged it. Blinded by dust, he lay gasping for breath and wondering whether he dared to move. A soft beating of wings. He 
glanced up to see the buzzard landing at the edge of the hole. But Francis moved, and the bird took wing again at once. Francis rolled over and climbed to his feet. In front of him, a square opening yawned in the earth. Stairs led downward. On one wall of the stairwell, a half-buried sign. Fallout. Survival shelter. Huh. Maximum occupancy. Fifteen. Fallout survival shelter. Maximum occupancy. Fifteen. The words of the litany flashed in his mind. He'd never seen a fallout, but he'd heard the legends. He crossed himself and backed away. Tradition told the Beatus Leibowitz himself in the flame deluge had encountered a fallout, had been possessed by it for many months. He stared at the sign. Surely the meaning was plain. He had broken into the place of not just one, but 15 of the dreadful beings. Brother Francis lowered himself gingerly into the ancient fallout shelter. He saw battered metal lockers leaning awry, waist deep in rubble. At the far end of the room was a metal door, hinged to swing toward him, but tightly sealed by the ancient disaster. Still legible, in flaking paint on the door were the stenciled words, Inner Hatch, Sealed Environment. Warning, this hatch must not be sealed before all personnel have been admitted or before all steps of safety procedure prescribed by Technical Manual 83A have been accomplished. Huh. He found himself confused by the warning, but he intended to heed it by not touching the hatch at all. He began to explore whatever might remain uncovered by debris. The ruins above ground had been worked over by generations of scavengers. But this underground ruin had been touched by no hand, but the hand of a personal disaster. To find a bit of the past which had escaped both the bonfires and the leading scavengers was a rare stroke of luck these days. He pried at the doors of the rusty lockers, tugged at the drawers of a battered metal desk. They might prove to be priceless finds. Documents, maybe. Or even a small book. There might... Oh. He stopped. There was a skull lying among the rocks in a darker corner with a gold tooth in its grin. The gold incisor flickered in the half-light. He picked his way across the debris for a closer look. Clearly the person had died on the spot struck down by a torrent of stones and half buried by debris. Only the skull and the bones of one leg had not been covered. The femur was broken. The back of the skull crushed. According to the memorabilia, the founder's wife, Emily Leibowitz, had had a gold tooth. From the curse of the fall
While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz Part 2 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz Here continueth the chronicle, set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of blessed Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. This is our daily task, that we live according to the holy rule, chanting the divine office and living in poverty, chastity, and obedience and conversion of life as befits a monk. But also that we inscribe these chronicles, that a record remain of each generation in its time. And chiefly are we charged that a record remain of that great age which prospered in the days before the flame deluge, before the world was laid waste by the great engines of war and the earth fell prey to the demon fallout. And to that end we preserve all books and writings from those days and memorize them lest they perish that their wisdom may live on unto whatever generation may seek it out. This chronicle concerns itself here with one of our memorizers, by name Brother Francis Gerard. He it was who, spending the Lenten vigil of his novitiate outside the walls of the abbey, in solitude in the desert, built himself a hut, lest he be devoured by wolves at night. And this hut he built from stones that lay to his hand, for there were in that place ruins where once had stood the buildings of men before warfare laid them low. And in the gathering of these stones he was helped by a pilgrim who came that way on his journey and had speech with him and nigh broke his fast with an offering of food and sought out on his behalf the keystone of his roof. And this same brother Francis after the pilgrim had departed, found in the place where the keystone had been a passageway descending into the earth, where there was much rubble and fallen rock, which nevertheless he was able to pass by and so enter an ancient room beneath the ground. And this room had within it an inner sanctum, and the door thereto was sealed. And on that door there was writing in great letters, and this is the writing that was written, Fallout, Survival, Shelter. And outside the door, at his feet, there lay a skull, and in the skull one of the teeth shined, for it was of gold. It was a fact recorded in the memorabilia the founder's wife, Emily Leibowitz, had had a gold tooth. This did not occur to Francis when he came upon the skull. His mind was filled with the possibility of finding ancient documents. His eyes fell on a rusty box, shaped like a satchel, obviously a carrying case of some kind, rather badly battered. Gingerly, he worked it loose from the rubble. The lid had rusted shut. The box rattled when he shook it. Not an obvious place to look for books or papers, but it might contain a scrap or two for the memorabilia. He battered at the rusty hinges with a stone. The lid fell free. Small ceramic cylinders with wires at each end bounced from trays, spilled among the rocks, some of them falling into crevices. But... In the bottom of the box... Papers. 
Radio Gracias. He gathered up the scattered tidbits as best he could. With the box hugged under one arm, he climbed the hill of debris toward the thin patch of sky. The sun was blinding after the darkness of the hole. He searched for a flat slab of stone to spread the contents of the box. Inside the lid, a note had been glued. The glue had powdered, the ink faded, and the paper was so darkened by rusty stains that even good handwriting would have been hard to read. But this was written in a hasty scrawl. Carl, must grab plane for, uh... The place name was indecipherable. For God's sake, keep M there till we know if we're at war. Please, try to get her on the alternate list for the shelter. Don't tell her why I sent her over with this box of junk, but try to keep her there till we know... The next phrase was also indecipherable. The note was signed with I three e initials. L. I E L. And there was a postscript. I told M this was top secret just to keep her from looking inside. First t toolbox I happened to grab, shoved in my locker or something. It was gibberish to Francis. Hmm. Impatient with the note writer's scrawl, he began removing the trays to get at the papers in the bottom of the box. Only a handful, and yet a treasure, for they'd escaped the flames of the simplification. He handled the papers as holy things, shielding them from the wind. All were brittle and cracked from age. There was a sheaf of rough sketches and diagrams. There were hand-scribbled notes, two large folded papers, and a small book entitled Memo. First he examined the notes, scrawled by the same hand that had written the note glued inside the lid. The penmanship was no less abominable. Pound pastrami. <laughs> Can kraut. Six bag... Bagels. Bring home for Emma. <laughs> Another one read... Remember, pick up form 1040, Uncle Revenue. Another was only a column of figures with a circled total from which a second amount was subtracted and finally a percentage taken followed by one word. Damn. Damn? He checked the figures. See, six and four, he could find no ten, fault with the penman's arithmetic at least, five, 15, although he could tell nothing about what the quantities might represent. Memo he handled with a special reverence because its title was suggestive of memorabilia. Works of our hands and our Before hearts. opening it, he crossed himself and murmured the blessing of the Lord, our strength and our redeemer. But the small book was a disappointment. He'd expected printed matter, but found only a handwritten oh, list of names, places, numbers, uh, and dates. October seventh, nineteen seventy-two. February fifteenth, nineteen seventy-eight. July 26th, 1983. Oh, well, that proves it. It's all 20th century. The contents of the box came from the twilight period of the Age of Enlightenment. <clears throat> of the larger folded papers, one was tightly rolled as well. It began to fall apart when he tried to unroll it. He could make out only two words at the top. R racing form. He turned to the second folded document. Its creases were so brittle he dared inspect only a little of it by parting the folds slightly and peering between them. A diagram. A diagram, it seemed, but a diagram of white lines on dark paper. A blueprint. There was not a single original blueprint left at the Abbey. Only facsimiles. Originals had faded long ago from overexposure to light. He shielded the print from the sun while trying to unfold it further. In the lower right-hand corner was a printed rectangle containing in simple block letters various titles, dates, patent numbers, reference numbers, and names. 
His eye traveled down the list until it encountered Circuit Design. Circuit Design by Leibowitz. He closed his eyes and shook his head. Then he looked again. There it was, quite plainly. Circuit Design by Leibowitz. I e. He looked again at the initial oh. signature of the note in the lid of the box. I e l, and again at circuit design by, and the same initials appeared elsewhere, throughout the notes. Blessed Leibowitz, pray for me. His hands were trembling. They threatened to ruin the brittle documents. He had uncovered relics of the saint. Of course, New Rome had not yet proclaimed Leibowitz a saint, but Francis was convinced. Saint Leibowitz. Had he been granted a token of his vocation by heaven itself? <gasps> yes, he felt he'd found what he'd been sent into the desert to find. He felt he was called to be a professed monk. Twilight came, and the wolves as well. His fire was rekindled. There'd been no time to gather purple cactus fruit, his only source of nourishment, except on Sundays, when a handful of parched corn was sent from the abbey after the prior had made his rounds with the holy sacrament. Tonight, though, the gnawing of hunger was less troublesome than his urge to run back to the abbey. And announce the news of his discovery. But to do so would be to renounce his vocation no sooner than it had come to him. He was here for the duration of Lent, vocation or no vocation. Dreamily, from near the fire, he squinted into the darkness in the direction of the fallout survival shelter. And tried to visualize a towering basilica rising from the site. Well, maybe not a basilica. Too far off the beaten track for that. But if not a basilica, at least a church, a smaller one, with a garden and a wall around it, and a shrine of Saint Leibowitz. That would bring the pilgrims. Yes, pilgrims out of the north with girded loins, and Father Francis would conduct them on a tour of the ruins, even through Hatch Two, into the splendors of sealed environment. Beyond the catacombs of the Flame Deluge, and then afterwards, he would offer mass for them on the altar stone, which would be set on top of a relic of the saint. Yes. A relic, a bit of burlap, or perhaps racing form. The fantasy withered. Chances of his becoming a priest were slight. The brothers of Leibowitz needed only a few. Furthermore, the saint was only a beatus. Would never be declared a saint unless New Rome took more interest in the case. The fantasy church dwindled to a wayside shrine. The river of pilgrims shrank to a trickle. Francis drowsed. When he awoke, the fire was only embers. Something seemed amiss. Was he quite alone? He blinked at the darkness. Beyond the bed of reddish coals, a wolf blinked back. He dived for cover into his stone hut, where he lay hugging the metal box and praying the days of Lent might pass swiftly, while padded feet scratched about his enclosure. Sunday came, and with it, Prior Cherokee. Riding a mare, carrying the host to Francis, and hearing his confession, and and then, Father, 
I almost took the bread and cheese. But you didn't take it? No. Then there was no sin by deed. But I wanted it so badly. I, I could taste it. Willfully? Did you deliberately enjoy the fantasy? No. You tried to get rid of it? Uh, yes. So? There was no culpable gluttony of thought? Well, no, Father Cherokee I, stared at the I boy who knelt in profile before him in the scorching simple. sunlight. Well, therefore, this confession was taking up quite a lot of time. There can be no sin. The priest's arthritis was bothering him again. But because of the presence of the Holy Sacrament, he preferred to stay on his knees along with the penitent. He'd lighted a candle before the small golden case containing the hosts. But the flame was invisible in the sun glare, and the breeze might even have blown it out. Now, what next? Uh, gluttonous thoughts. My boy, I thought we were through with that. Oh, uh, oh is this another time? Y y yesterday. I see. Uh, there, there was this lizard, Father. This what? A lizard. Uh, it, it had blue and yellow stripes, and as thick as your thumb, plump. Uh, I, I, I kept thinking how, how it would taste like chicken, all, all roasted brown and crisp outside, and right. tender. And, all right. Uh, I, you took pleasure in these thoughts? You didn't try to get rid of the temptation? I... I tried to catch it. I see. It, it, it got away. So, not merely thought, deed as well. Just that one time? Well, yes, just that. All right. In thought and deed, willfully meaning to eat meat during Lent. Please be as specific as you can after this. I thought you'd examined your conscience properly. Is there anything else? Quite a lot. Then please get on with it as quickly as you can. Uh, I I impurity? Once. Thought, word, or deed? Well... There was this succubus, and she... Succubus? Yes. Oh, nocturnal. You were asleep. Yes, Well, then why confess it? Well, because afterwards... Afterwards what? When you woke up? Yes. I, I kept thinking about her. I kept imagining it all over again. All right. Can keep us in thought, deliberately entertained. You're sorry? Oh, yes. Now, what next? Uh... All this was the usual sort of thing one kept hearing time after endless time from postulant after postulant, novice after novice. It seemed to Cherokee the least Francis could do would be to bark out his self-accusations, one, two, three, in a neat, orderly manner, without all this prodding and prompting. Now the boy seemed to be having more difficulty. I think my vocation has come to me, oh, Father. has it? Y yes. But well, would it be a sin, Father, if when I first got it, I thought rather scornfully of the handwriting? I mean... Have you and Brother it, Alfred been passing notes to each other? Oh, no, Father, no. Well, the, whose handwriting are we talking about? The Blessed Leibowitz. Cherokee paused, tried to remember... Was there in the memorabilia any manuscript penned personally by the founder of the order? Yes. There were a few scraps of it, carefully kept under lock and key. Are you talking about something that happened back at the Abbey before you came out here? N no, Father. It happened right over there in the ruins, three mounds over, near the tall cactus. Involving... Your vocation, you say? Yes. Of course, but... but I, I, just a minute. You could not possibly be trying to say that you have received from the Blessed Leibowitz, dead the last 600 years, a, a, a handwritten invitation to profess your solemn vows, and you deplored his handwriting? Forgive me, but that's the impression I'm getting. Well, it, it, it is something like that, Father. Brother Francis produced a scrap of paper from his sleeve and handed it to the priest. Pound pastrami, can, kraut, six ba ba bagels, bring home for Emma? This was written by whom? The Blessed Leibowitz. Son, you're not in your right mind. But We'll talk the, it over the, after you're better. The for the present, I want you to gather up your things and go back to the Abbey at once. But, but Father... Go I... back to the Abbey at once. Yes, Father. All right. You know my poetry's The priest blessed him, got up, genuflected before the sacrament, reattached it to a chain round his neck, pocketed the candle, collapsed the table, strapped it in place behind the saddle, 
gave Francis a last solemn nod and rode away to complete the circuit of the Lenten hermitages. Francis sat in the hot sand and wept. He could not blame Father Cherokee for leaping to the conclusion that he'd gone out of his mind. More than one novice had addled wits after a vocational vigil in the desert. There was nothing to do but obey the command to return. He walked to the fallout survival shelter, looked into it again to reassure himself it was really there. Then he went to get the box. By the time he had it repacked and was ready to leave, a dust plume had appeared in the southeast. The supply carrier was coming with water and corn from the abbey. Francis decided to wait for his supplies before starting on the long trek home. Three donkeys and a monk at the head of the dust streamer. The monk riding the lead donkey. The monk's shoulders were hunched, and the long, hairy shins dangled on either side of the donkey. In spite of the hood, Francis recognized him, the cook's helper. Brother Fingo? Oh, there you are, Francisco. I mistook you for a bone pile. Help yourself to the Sunday slop. How goes the hermit trade? Think you'll make it a career? Uh, hey, boy. You look like a sick sheep. Uh, what's the trouble? Is Father Cherokee in one of his slow rages again? Not that I could tell. Uh, then what's wrong? Are you really sick? He ordered me back to the abbey. Oh, what is it? The jaundice? No. He thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> well, that's true. But we all knew that. Why is he sending you back? Francis glanced down at the box near his feet. I found some things that belonged to the Blessed Leibowitz. Well, I started to tell him, but he didn't believe me. He wouldn't let me explain. He just said, you back found to the... what? Well, this, for instance. Fingo dropped to his knees and opened the box while Francis watched nervously. Fingo stirred the small ceramic cylinders that had wire whiskers at each end. These he had seen before. The Abbey's small museum had a few of them of various sizes and shapes and colors. Once, he'd seen a shaman of the hill pagan people wearing a string of them as a ceremonial necklace. The similar tidbits in the museum were connected together, too, not in the form of a necklace, but as a complex maze in the bottom of a small metal frame exhibited as radio chassis, application uncertain. Oh, this is old, Francisco. This is really old. He glanced at the handwritten scribble of the note inside the lid. What's this gibberish? It was written by the Beatus himself. This? <laughs> Fingo stared from the note to Francis and back to the note. He shook his head, clamped the lid back on the box, and stood up. Well, maybe father's right. You better hike back. Get Brother Pharmacist to brew you up a toadstool special. You got the fever, brother. Maybe. Where did you find this stuff anyway? Over that way, a few mounds. I moved some rocks, there was a cave in, and I found a basement. Uh, but go see for yourself. Uh, no, I got a long ride ahead. Francis picked up the box and started toward the abbey. But after a few paces, he stopped and called back. Brother Fingo? Yeah? Could you take two minutes? What for? Walk over there and look into the hole. Why? So you can tell Father Cherokee if it's really there. All right. And if it's not there, I'll tell you. Francis watched for a moment while the gangling Fingo rode out of sight among the mounds. Then he turned to shuffle down the long, dusty trail toward the abbey, munching corn and sipping from the water skin. Occasionally he glanced back. Then... Hey! Francisco! You're right! Yeah, it's here! 
Francis waved, then hiked wearily on his way back to the abbey. Two weeks of near starvation had exacted their toll. After two or three miles, he began to stagger. Then, while still a mile from the abbey, he fainted beside the road. It was late afternoon before Cherokee, riding back from his rounds, noticed Francis lying there, hastily dismounted, and gradually brought him around. Cherokee had encountered the supply donkeys on his way back, had paused to hear Fingo's account, which had confirmed Brother Francis's find. Francis, mind you, I still don't think it could be anything really important. Then he noticed the box lying nearby, with its contents half spilled in the road. One thing was obvious. Well, the stuff's real enough. You just let your imagination run away with you. Yes, Father. He was too weak to insist on anything. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Part 3 of a series in 15 parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continueth the Chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of the order of blessed Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. And here we set down further the record concerning Brother Francis, he who found by chance the ancient room beneath the earth in the ruins outside the abbey walls. And lo, this room was of very great age, yea, six hundred years, and its name was inscribed Fallout, survival, shelter. And there were three mysteries. The pilgrim who passed by that day where Brother Francis was inscribed upon a rock two letters in an ancient tongue that the brother comprehended not. And the second mystery, a skull lying within the sunken room. None knew whose it was, but in the skull was a golden tooth. And the third mystery, another writing, for nigh at hand to the skull was a box, fashioned of tin, and in the box were papers, 
and these papers were written upon, so it seemed, by our martyred founder himself, the blessed Leibowitz, yea, and in his own hand, with his name subscribed beneath. And among the papers was a picture, fashioned in blue and white, superscribed, circuit design. These mysteries did Brother Francis relate unto the prior, Father Cherokee, whereupon the Father Prior brooked no delay for the Lenten vigil, but ordered the brother back to the abbey. Much wasted by the long Lenten fast in the desert, and mystified by what had happened to him, Brother Francis staggered back to the abbey. To Francis, still dazed by the sun and by starvation, the whole thing was a mystery. To his fellow novices, it had the makings of a miracle. To the Lord Abbot, Dom Arcos, it was something best hushed up, a figment of Francis's imagination, a possible source of embarrassment. You did the right thing, Cherokee. You did the right thing, though heaven knows it's all over the abbey. Barefooted, fresh from a plunge in the bathing barrel, wearing a coyote skin robe, Arcos glared down at his prior. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen this stuff? Yes, he dropped it beside the road when he fell. I helped gather it up, but I didn't look at it carefully. Well, look it over. Tell me what you think. It's impossible. You did the right thing to send him back before he uncovered more. But of course that's not the worst part. The worst part is the old man he babbles about. It's getting too thick. I don't know anything. It could damage our case worse than a whole flood of improbable miracles. A few real incidents, certainly. It has to be established. The intercession of the Beatus has brought about the miraculous. But there can be too much. Look at Blessed Chang, beatified two centuries ago, but never canonized. And why? His order got too eager. That's why every time somebody got over a cough, it was a cure by the Beatus. Visions in the basement, evocations in the belfry. Well, that could happen here. Last year, Brother Noyan and his miraculous hangman's noose. <laughs> and now this Francis. He meets a pilgrim wearing what? <laughs> wearing for a kilt the very burlap cloth they hooded Blessed Leibowitz with before they hanged him. What? Oh, you haven't heard this yet. Well, all Francis said was, I met an old man. He was wearing a burlap sack tied around with a piece of rope, and he made a mark on a rock, and the mark looked like this. And I couldn't figure out what it meant. Do you know? No, I'm afraid I don't. Ah, I wasn't asking you. That's what Francis said. I didn't know either. You do now? Yes. Somebody looked it up. That is a lamed. And that is a sadi, Hebrew letters. Sadi, lamed? No, no, right to left, lamed, sadi, an L and a T-S sound. Now, if it had vowel marks, it might be lutes, lets, lots, lits, anything like that. If it had some letters between those two, it might sound like, oh, guess who? Libo. Oh, no! Oh, yes. Brother Francis didn't think of it. No, somebody else thought of it. Brother Francis didn't think of the burlap hood and the hangman's noose. One of his chums did. So what happens? The whole novitiate's buzzing with a sweet little story. Francis met the Beatus himself out there, and the Beatus escorted our boy over to where this stuff was and told him he'd found his vocation. Did Brother Francis say that? No! Haven't you been listening? He tells it sweet and simple, rather stupidly, in fact, and lets the others read in the meanings. I see. So, send him to me. Now. <clears throat> come in, my boy, come in. Uh. The Lord Abbot sent for me? Yes, the Lord Abbot sent for you. Do 
come right in and shut the door. It's more. Or perhaps it would be more fitting if the Lord Abbot were sent for by you? Now that you've been so favored by Providence, and have become so <laughs> famous, huh? Oh, oh no, my lord. Oh. You are seventeen and plainly an idiot, are you not? That is undoubtedly true, my lord Abbot. Hmm. Then you are prepared to deny that you met anyone in the desert the other day? That you stumbled on this, this, this junk box with no help? And that what I've been hearing from others is only oh, feverish uh, raving? Uh, no, Don Marcos. Oh, no, what? I... I cannot deny what I saw with my own eyes, Reverend Father. Dear God. So, you did meet an angel, or was it a saint? Or, or perhaps not yet a saint, and he showed you where to look? Uh, I, I never said and he was an angel. And this is your excuse for believing yourself to have a true vocation? That this, shall we call him a creature, spoke to you, and marked a rock with his initials? And told you it was what you were looking for, and when you looked under it, there this was, huh? Uh, yes, Don Marcos. Dear God. What's your opinion of your execrable vanity? But my execrable vanity is unpardonable, my lord. To imagine yourself important enough to be unpardonable is an even vaster vanity. Uh, uh, my lord, I am indeed a, a worm. Very well. Now, about this creature. Yes, my lord. No one else saw such a person, you know. I understand he was supposed to have been headed in this direction. Yes. That he even said he might stop here? That's right. That he inquired about the abbey, yes? Yes. Well, where would he have disappeared to? <laughs> if he ever existed, no such person came past here. The brother on duty at that time in the watchtower didn't see him. So, aren't you ready to admit you imagined him? Reverend Father, if there are not really two marks on that rock where he marked, well, then I will The marks certainly... are there. Faintly, we checked. Oh. But you might have made them yourself. No, my lord. All right, very well. One last time. Will you admit you imagined the old creature? No, my lord. All right. You know what's going to happen to you now. Yes, Reverend Father. Then prepare to take it. The order was in an ancient tradition and had retained from that tradition all of its rigorous austerities. Dear gracias! Among these was corporal punishment. Care to change your mind, my Reverend, boy? Reverend Father, I cannot deny it. Ah, Dear gracias! Dear gracias! Dear gracias! Ten times. With Brother Dear Francis gracias. yelping his thanks to heaven for each lesson in virtue of humility as he was expected Dear to do. Gracias. The abbot paused after the tenth whack. Francis was on tiptoe and bouncing slightly. Tears squeezed from clenched eyelids. Now, my dear brother Francis, are you quite sure you saw the old man? I'm certain. Oh. Well, all right, you've convinced me, boy. Worse luck for you. You may sit down. If it's... All the same to the Reverend Father Abbot. All right, then. Stand. I won't keep you long. You're to go out and finish your vigil. Oh, but, thank you, but Reverend. But you're not going back to the same place. You'll trade hermitages with Brother Alfred and not go near those ruins again. Furthermore, I command you not to discuss the matter with anyone except your confessor or with me. Although heaven knows the damage is already done. Do you know what you've started? Reverend Father, with all due respect... I don't know that I actually started anything. What? Well, I mean, yesterday being Sunday, we weren't required to keep silent, and, and at recreation, I just answered the fellow's questions. I, well, your I fellows just have cooked to... up a very cute explanation. Did you know it was the blessed Leibowitz himself you met out there? Oh, no, my lord Abbot, I'm sure it couldn't have been. The blessed martyr wouldn't do such a thing. Wouldn't do such a what thing? Well, he wouldn't threaten somebody physically with a staff. Oh, I don't know about that. It was you he was threatening, wasn't it? Well, yes. Yes, I thought so. Now I doubt if there are very many people the Beatus would threaten with a stick. But you! <laughs> all right, son, all right. Dear God. 
Who do you suppose he could have been? Well, I, I, I thought perhaps he was a pilgrim on his way to visit our shrine, Reverend Father. It isn't a shrine yet, and you're not to call it that. In any way, he wasn't, or at least he didn't. And he didn't pass the gates unless the watch was asleep. And the novice on watch denies being asleep. Uh, if the Reverend Father Abbott will forgive me, I've been on watch a few times myself. And? Well, uh, on a bright day when there's nothing moving, after a few hours you just start looking up at the buzzards. Oh, you do, do you? When you're supposed to be watching the trail. Uh-huh. And if you stare at the sky too long, you just kind of blank out. It's not really asleep, but sort of... Preoccupied. So that's what you do when you're on watch, do you? No, no, no not necessarily. I, I mean, I mean, no, Reverend Father. I, I wouldn't know it if I had. I don't think. But, but, Brother, Je- I, I mean, a brother I I relieved once was like that. He, well, he didn't even know it was time for the watch to change. He he was just sitting there in the tower and staring up at the sky with his mouth open in a daze. Yes, yes. Well, you could be right about the watch. Yes, he could have missed seeing the old man. But tell me he was just an ordinary old man, not anything more, not uh, an angel, not a beatus. Reverend Father, do angels or saints cast shadows? Yes. I mean, no. Uh, How should I know? Uh, He did cast a shadow, didn't he? Well, it was such a small shadow you could hardly see it. What? It was almost noon. Oh, you imbecile. You imbecile. Wasn't he just an ordinary old man? My Lord Abbott. You don't suppose he might have been... I'm asking you not to suppose. I'm asking you to be flatly certain. Was he or was he not an ordinary flesh and blood person? I... I think he was flesh and blood, Reverend Father, but but not exactly ordinary. In some ways, he was rather extraordinary. What ways? Well, like... like oh, how straight he could spit. Dear God. And he could read. I think. Oh... The abbot closed his eyes and rubbed his temples. Get out. Get out. He said at last. At once, Reverend Father. Without opening his eyes. Who? Who could he have been? Mystified by the whole thing, Francis went back to the desert that same day. Interest in the old pilgrim surprised him. Even the abbot had summoned him not to ask about the box, but to ask about the old man. His fellow novices asked him a hundred questions about the pilgrim, to which he could reply only, I, uh, didn't notice. I wasn't looking right then. If, if he said, I, I don't remember. I, uh, didn't notice. So he questioned himself. Should I have noticed? Was I stupid not to watch what he did? Wasn't I paying enough attention to what he said? He brooded on it in the darkness while the wolves prowled about his new encampment and filled the nights with their howling. He caught himself brooding on it during times of the day that were assigned as proper for prayers and spiritual exercises of the vocational vigil. And he confessed as much to prior charity I, the next time the priest prayers, rode his I, Sunday circuit. I can't seem to get my mind off of the old man. Y- yes, my yes. Well, yes. now, Francis, don't let the romantic imaginations of the others bother you. You have enough trouble with your own. They don't think up questions like that on the basis of what might be true. They concoct the questions on the basis of what might be sensational if it happened to be true. But it's ridiculous. I can tell you, the Reverend Father Abbott has ordered the entire novitiate to drop the subject. Um, there really wasn't anything about the old man to, well, suggest the supernatural, was there? Brother Francis began to wonder himself. If there had been a suggestion of the supernatural, he'd not noticed it. But then there's lots of questions I can't answer. So I guess I didn't really notice very much. The questions made him feel guilty about his failure to observe. Had he interpreted events in terms of his own interests? Had he? Did he truly have a vocation? 
Was he wrong to suspect that God had beckoned him to become a professed monk of the order? Should I do something else? There was no returning to his homeland, the Utah. As a small child, he'd been sold to a shaman. Having run away, he could not return because, in running, he had stolen the shaman's property himself. And while thievery was an honorable profession among the Utah, getting caught was a capital offense. When the thief's victim was the tribal warlock. So what else is there? What else, indeed? Now, in the twenty-sixth century, six hundred years after the flame deluge, the world was very lightly settled. There were mostly small, scattered communities who lived by hunting, by gathering, and by primitive agriculture. The schooling Francis had been given at the abbey prepared him for nothing of practical value in a dark, ignorant world. He was a booklegger, a memorizer, a preserver of the memorabilia. What else? It doesn't seem to be much else I could do with my life if I'm not called to the order. At least, not much else I'd like to do. His certainty of his vocation, although not broken, had been slightly bent, and he was unhappy enough to be overcome by temptation. So that on Palm Sunday, with only six days of starvation remaining until the end of Lent, Prior Cherokee heard from Francis, or from the shriveled, sun-scorched remains of Francis, a few brief croaks, which constituted the most succinct confession Cherokee ever heard. Bless me, Father. I, 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 I ate a lizard.、Hmm. Cherokee. For many years, confessor to fasting penitence replied with perfect equanimity. Was it an abstinence day? Did you artificially prepare it? And then it was over. The vocational vigils were over. It was Holy Saturday. The monks carried the novices in one at a time, famished and raving. Francis, thirty pounds lighter than on Ash Wednesday. When they set him on his feet in his own cell, he staggered, and before he reached the bunk, he fell. The brothers hoisted him into it, bathed him, shaved him, anointed his blistered skin, while he babbled about something in a burlap loincloth. Sometimes calling it an angel, sometimes a saint, frequently using the name of Lebowitz and trying to apologize. His brethren, forbidden to speak of the matter, exchanged significant glances or nodded mysteriously among themselves. Reports filtered to the abbot, who sent for Francis. Do you deny saying these things? I, I don't remember saying them, my lord abbot. I, I may have been raving. Would you say it again now? About the pilgrim being the beatus? Oh no, reverend father. Then assert the contrary. I don't think the the pilgrim was the beatus. Why not? Just a straightforward. He was not. Well. Never having seen the blessed、oh. Leibowitz personally, I, I enough know too much.、Myself. That's all I want to see or hear of you for a long, long time. Out! But just one thing: don't expect to profess your vows with the others this year. You won't be permitted. Nor was he permitted to talk about the pilgrim, the relics, the fallout shelter. Still, he could not help hearing things now and then. He knew in one of the abbey workshops. Monks were at work on the documents, not only his own, but others that had been found in the ancient room. But then, the abbot ordered the shelter closed. Closed. Scarcely been touched. No attempt to penetrate further the secrets of the shelter. Closed. They haven't even tried to see what's behind the inner door, hatch two, or to find out what's inside sealed environment. They haven't even removed the stones. Closed. 
closed. The investigation choked off without apparent cause. Francis returned to the desert the following year and fasted again in solitude. Once more he returned, weak and emaciated, and was summoned into the presence of Abbot Arcos, who demanded to know whether Francis claimed further conferences with members of the heavenly hosts. Oh, no, my lord abbot. Nothing by day but buzzards. Uh, by night? Only wolves, I think. No, what about last year? The old man? The old man. Yes, Domarcos? Just an old man, nothing more. We're sure of that now. Uh, I think it was just uh, an old man, my lord. Oh. Arcos reached <laughs> wearily for the discipline. Uh, Deo gracias. Deo gracias. By the way, I intended to mention... Yes, Reverend Father? No vows this year. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Part 4 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continueth the Chronicle. Set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of blessed Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. It came to pass that Brother Francis Gerard found an ancient room beneath the ground. And this room was inscribed in the ancient speech, Fallout Survival Shelter. And within the room were writings found, and a skull. The writings, it was said, were those of the blessed Leibowitz himself, and the skull that of his wife. Moreover, it was said by some that the blessed Leibowitz had appeared in a vision unto Brother Francis and shown him the way to the room. Now this was not said by Brother Francis. He spoke only of an old man who was very flesh and blood. Nevertheless, much scandal had arisen over these things. So the Lord Abbot was not willing for the present that Francis should pass beyond the rank of novice. Brother Francis 
spent seven years in the novitiate, seven Lenten vigils in the desert. He became highly proficient in the imitation of wolf calls. For the amusement of his brethren, he summoned the pack by howling from the abbey walls after dark. Then one day, a messenger from New Rome. After a long conference with Abbot Arcos, the messenger came looking for Francis and found him on his hands and knees, scrubbing the kitchen floor. We have been studying the documents you discovered. Yes. Yes, quite a few of us are convinced they're authentic. I'm not permitted to mention the matter, Father. Oh, that. That's all right. Your abbot's given us permission to talk about it. Oh. Now, we expect the case for canonization of your founder to be reopened soon. And if it is, it will be because your abbot Arcos is a wise and prudent man. Yes. By turning the relics over to someone else for examination, he... Well, you do understand, don't you? Uh, no, Father. I, I had supposed he thought the whole thing too trivial to spend any time on. Trivial? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> if your order turns up evidence, the court has to consider the source. So your abbot very wisely told you, hands off the shelter. You're going to open it again? No, not I. But when the court is ready, it will. Now tell me, how did it happen? I'll need the whole story from you. Well, it started because of the wolves. You see, they prowl around here at night. I was building the stone shelter... A few days later, the messenger left, and Arcos called for Francis. Do you still feel your vocation is with us? If my lord abbot will pardon my execrable vanity... Oh, I let's ignore feel... your execrable vanity for a moment. Do you or don't you? Yes, reverend father. Well, I think we are convinced of it too. If you're ready to commit yourself... I think the time's right for you to profess your solemn vows. Oh. What's this? You're not glad to hear it? You're not? What's wrong? Francis had fainted. Dear God. Two weeks later, vowing poverty, chastity, and obedience, also the vows of a booklegger and memorizer. Francis received blessings and a bindle stiff and became a professed monk of the Order of Leibowitz, chained by chains of his own forging to the foot of the cross and the rule of the order. He was transferred from the kitchen and apprenticed to the master of the copy room, an aged monk named Horner. Most of us do better work on the assigned copy if we have our own projects too. I, if you finish your assigned work before the day's over, you may turn to your own project. Uh, may I use the time to make a copy of the Leibowitz blueprint I found? Oh, well, I don't know, son. Our Lord Abbot is a little sensitive on that subject. But you know they fade, brother. And it's been handled a lot in the light. Well, I, I, I suppose it would be a rather... A brief project? Well, perhaps I, I could include it as one of a set. If, if I made several duplicates, some of the others... What you're suggesting all be... is that by including the Leibowitz blueprint in a set, you might escape detection. Well, uh, Father Abbott might not notice uh, if, if he happened to wander uh, through. I, I certainly but, didn't mean to right, see that. All right, make duplicates of any recopied prints in bad condition. And if anything else gets mixed up in the lot... I'll try not to notice. So Francis worked on the blueprints. Not the Leibowitz print at first, but others that needed recopying. He did not know why the ancients used white lines and lettering on a dark background. But if they'd taken the trouble to put ink where blank paper would ordinarily be, they must have had their reasons. So Francis recopied the documents as best he could even though spreading blue ink around tiny white letters was tedious and wasteful of ink. Only after a year of spare time work on other blueprints did Francis go to the memorabilia files, take out the Leibowitz print, the one he'd found so many years before. 
He studied it till he could see the whole amazing complexity with his eyes closed. But still, he knew no more than he'd known before. It made no sense. But he began work at duplicating every detail. Even to the copying of a central brownish stain, which he thought might be the blood of the blessed martyr, but which Brother Jarrus suggested was only the stain left by a decayed apple core. Brother Jarrus, who joined the copy room at the same time as Francis, seemed to enjoy teasing him. What, pray, is the meaning of transistorized control system for Unit 6B? Clearly it is the title of the document. Ah, oh, clearly. But what does it mean, learned brother? It is the name of the diagram which lies before your eyes, Brother Simpleton. What does Jarrus mean? Oh, very little, I'm sure. Forgive my density, please. You have successfully defined the name by pointing to the creature named. But now the creature diagram itself represents something, does it not? What does the diagram represent? The transistorized control system for Unit 6B, obviously. <laughs> Quite clear. Eloquent. If the creature is the name, then the name is the creature. <laughs> I would imagine that the diagram represents an abstract concept rather than a concrete thing. Oh? And, uh, perhaps the ancients had a method for depicting pure thought. It, it's, it's clearly not a recognizable <laughs> picture of an object. <laughs> yes, yes. It's clearly unrecognizable. On the other <laughs> hand, perhaps it does depict an object, but only in a very stylistic way. So that one would need uh, special training. Or, or special eyesight. In my opinion, in my opinion, it's an abstraction of perhaps transcendental value expressing a thought of the Beatus Leibowitz. Oh, bravo! Now, what was he thinking about? Why, circuit design. That's what it says here. Ah. Uh, and what discipline does that art pertain to, brother? What is its, its genus, species, property, and difference? Or is it only an accident? Well, all right. Observe this column of figures and its heading electronic parts numbers. Now, there once was an art, or, or a science, called electronics, which might belong to both art and science. Ah, uh -huh. thus settling genus and species. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as to difference, if I, if I may pursue the line... Mm. Uh, what, what was the subject matter of electronics? Well, that too is written. The subject matter of electronics was the electron. Ah, so it is written indeed. I am impressed. I know so little of these things. Uh, what, pray, was the electron? Well, there is one fragmentary source which calls it a negative twist of nothingness. What? How did they negate a nothingness? Wouldn't that make it a somethingness? Well, perhaps the negation applies to twist. Ah, then we would have an untwisted nothing, eh? Have you discovered how to untwist a nothingness? Not yet. We'll keep at it, brother. Oh, how clever they must have been, those ancients. To know how to untwist nothing, keep at it, and you may learn how. Then we'd have the electron in our midst, wouldn't we? Whatever would we do with it? Put it on the altar in the chapel? Jairus's teasing did not lessen Francis's devotion to his project. But the copy of the relic did not seem enough. It was too stark. It did not commemorate the saintly qualities of the Beatus in any visible way. Then, one day, the answer came to him. Glorificamus, an illuminated copy. He found the finest available lambskin cured it, stretched it, stoned it to a perfect surface, then bleached it to a snowy whiteness and stored it away while he planned his design. He spent every available minute of his spare time looking through the memorabilia, looking for clues to the meaning of the Leibowitz print. He found nothing resembling the squiggles on the drawing, nothing to help him interpret its meaning. But after a long time, he stumbled across a fragment of a book whose subject matter was blueprinting. It seemed to be a piece of an encyclopedia. The reference was brief, and some of the article was missing. But after reading it several times, he began to suspect he had wasted a lot of time and ink. 
the white-on-dark effect seemed to result from peculiarities of a cheap reproduction process. The original drawing from which the blueprint had been made had been black on white. He had to resist the sudden impulse to beat his head against a stone wall. All that ink and labor to copy an accident. So, the color scheme of blueprints was an accidental feature. His glorified copy could reverse the color scheme. <coughs> His sketch work was interrupted one afternoon by a presence which loomed behind him and cast its shadow across his copy table. Well, what have we here? A, a drawing, Lord Abbott. Oh, so I notice. But what is it? The Leibowitz blueprint. The one you found? Yes, my lord. What? Yes, my lord. Oh. It uh, doesn't look much like it. Why the changes? It, 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 it's going to Speak be... Speak louder! It's going to be an illuminated cup. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I see. Arcos shrugged and walked away. Brother Horner, a few seconds later, wandering past the apprentice's desk, was surprised to notice Francis had fainted. To the amazement of Brother Francis, Abbot Arcos no longer objected to the monk's interest in the relics. The abbot had relaxed. Francis began the actual illumination of the lambskin. The intricacies of scroll work, the excruciating delicacy of the gold inlay work, would be a labor of many years. Slowly, painfully, Brother Francis was making the lambskin a blaze of beauty. Word of his project spread beyond the copy room, and the monks often gathered round his table to watch the work and murmur admiration. Except for Brother Jairus. Brother Horner fell ill. Within weeks, he was on his deathbed. A mass for the dead was chanted early in Advent while the community expressed its grief in prayer. Arcos quietly appointed Brother Jairus, master of the copy room. On the day after his appointment, Jairus came over to Francis's desk. Brother, I think it would be appropriate now if you were to put away the things of a child and start doing a man's work. Francis wrapped his precious project in parchment, protected it with heavy boards, and put it away. He made no protest, realizing someday the soul of dear Brother Jairus would depart by the same road as the soul of Brother Horner. And afterwards, afterwards, thought Francis, I will finish my work. Providence, however, took an earlier hand in the matter without summoning the soul of Brother Jairus to its maker. From New Rome, Monsignor Malfredo Aguera, the postulator for the Beatus Leibowitz in the canonization procedure. He had come to observe the reopening of the shelter and the exploration of sealed environment, also to investigate such evidence as the Abbey could produce that might have a bearing on the case, including, to the Abbot's dismay, reports of an apparition of the Beatus, which had, so travelers said, come to one Francis Gerard of Utah. Dear God. On the third day of Aguera's visit, the abbot summoned Brother Francis. You sent for me, my lord abbot? Yes, I did. Tell me, have you ever thought about death? Frequently, my lord abbot. Yes, you pray that your death will not be an unhappy one. Oh, yes. Often, Reverend Father. Yes. Then I suppose you'd not care to be suddenly stricken. To have someone use your guts to string a fiddle. To be fed to the hogs. To have your bones buried in unconsecrated ground. N no, my lord. I thought not. So, be very careful about what you say to Monsignor Aguera. I? You. Yes, I can see it clearly. The Leibowitz cause shelved. 
And poor brother Francis struck down by a falling brick. Struck down? There he lies, in the very midst of us, mind you. And there we stand, looking down in pity, clergy among us, watching him croak his last under our very noses. Pity, huh? My lord. Oh, don't blame me. I'll be too busy trying to keep your brothers from carrying out their impulse to kick you to death. Why? Not at all, I hope. Because you are going to be careful, aren't you, about what you say to the Monsignor. Otherwise, I may let him kick you to death. But... The postulator wants to see you. Please, stifle your imagination. Be certain what you say. Please, try not to think. Francis felt fright when he tapped at Aguera's door. Ah, Brother Francis, uh, good to see you. Yes, uh, uh, come in, uh, come in. Yes, but he saw quickly was... fright was unfounded. Aguera was a suave and diplomatic elder who seemed interested in the monk's life. After several minutes of preliminary amenities, Aguera approached the slippery subject. Now, about your encounter... Yes, Monsignor. With the person who may have been the blessed founder. Oh, I never said he was our blessed Leibowitz. Of course you didn't. Of course you didn't. Now, uh, I have here an account of the incident, uh, gathered from hearsay sources, of course, and I'd like you to read it and then either confirm it or correct it. Uh, yes, Monsignor. Uh, this version is based on traveler stories. Only you can describe what happened firsthand. So I want you to edit it most scrupulously. Yes, Monsignor. But what happened was really very simple. Yeah, read, read. Uh, then we'll talk about it, eh? Yes, Monsignor. Francis read with apprehension. Oh. The apprehension grew to horror. Oh, no. Is something wrong? Oh, Monsignor, th this... It, it wasn't like this at all. No? No. He, he, he only spoke a few words to me. I... I saw him just that once. He threatened me with a stick. He asked me the way to the abbey and made marks on a rock where I found the shelter. Then I never saw him again. I see. Uh-huh. Uh, no halo? No, Monsignor. No heavenly choir? No. What about the carpet of roses that grew up where he walked? No, no, nothing like that, Monsignor. Uh, he didn't write his name on the rock? He only made those two marks. I don't know what they meant. Ah, yes. Well, uh, traveler's stories are always exaggerated. Now, uh, suppose you tell me how it really happened. So, Francis told him. It didn't take long. Well, I see. So much for that. Oh, senior, I'm sorry. Don't I give it a second thought. <laughs> we have enough evidence. The rumor started because of the shelter. We reopened it today, by the way. Uh, d did you find anything more of St. Leibowitz? A blessed Leibowitz, please. No, not yet. We opened the inner chamber. Had a devil of a time getting it unsealed. Fifteen skeletons inside and many fascinating artifacts. Apparently the woman... Uh, oh, it was a woman, by the way. Oh. Those remains you found had been admitted to the outer chamber. But the inner chamber was already full. Was she Emily Leibowitz? I don't know yet. I believe she was, yes. Yes, I believe... But perhaps I'm letting hope run away with reason. We'll see what we can uncover. Monsignor Aguera spent ten days at the archaeological site before returning to New Rome. On the day of his departure, he visited Brother Francis in the scriptorium. Brother Jarrus listened closely. They tell me you were working on a document to commemorate the relics you found. And judging by the descriptions I've heard, I should very much like to see it. Yes, Monsignor. Francis went to get it. Ah. His hands were trembling yes. as he unpacked the lambskin. He saw Brother Jarrus looking on and wearing a nervous frown. Oh, yes. Yes, beautiful. What glorious color. It's superb. Superb. Finish it. Uh, brother, finish it. Francis looked at Jairus. The master of the copy room turned away, the back of his neck red. The following day, Francis unpacked his quills, dyes, gold leaf, and resumed labor on the illuminated diagram. 
A few months after the departure of Monsignor Aguera, there came a second donkey train from New Rome. This time, the expedition was headed by a Monsignor with small horns and pointy fangs, who announced that he was charged with the duty of opposing the canonization of the blessed Leibowitz, and that he had come to investigate certain incredible and hysterical rumors. I understand you are prone to fainting spells, brother. Uh, uh, yes, Excellency. Tell me, is there epilepsy in your family? No, Excellency. Madness? N no, Excellency. Mutant neural patterns? None, Excellency. I'm not an Excellency. Now we're going to get the truth out of you. Yes, Ex... Uh, uh, Monsignor. How did you happen to discover that shelter, and what is this fantastic twaddle about an apparition? Francis explained. When he finished, the devil's advocate seemed to find the monk's story too simple-minded to warrant attack. Well, brother, if that's your story and you stick to it, I don't think we'll be bothered with you at all. Even if it's true, which I don't admit. It's so trivial, it's silly. Do you realize that? But that's what I always thought, Monsignor. Well, it's high time you said so. Well, I, I, I always said I, I thought he was probably just an old man. Monsignor Flout covered his eyes with his hand and sighed heavily. Before leaving the abbey, the devil's advocate, like the saint's advocate before him, stopped at the scriptorium and asked to see the illuminated commemoration of the Leibowitz blueprint. Monsignor Flout gazed at the lambskin in silence. He swallowed hard. At last, he forced himself to nod, then to smile. His horns immediately shortened by an inch, and his fangs disappeared entirely. He departed the same evening for New Rome. Years flowed by, seeming the faces of the young and adding gray to their temples. On the Feast of the Five Holy Fools, a Vatican messenger arrived with glad tidings for the order. Monsignor Flout had withdrawn all objections. Monsignor Aguera's case was proved the Pope had posted a decree recommending canonization. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. The announcement was followed by rejoicing at the Abbey. Arcos, now withered by age and close to dotage, summoned Francis once again. His Holiness he invites us to New Rome for the canonization. Prepare to leave. I? Alone? You alone. Brother Pharmacist forbids me to travel. It would not be well for Father Cherokee to leave while I am ill. Yes, my lord. Uh, 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 don't faint on me again. Uh, no, my lord. You're getting more credit than you deserve. But His Holiness invited you anyway. M me? Brother Francis it's tottered. Holiness? Yes, yes. Now, we're sending the original Leibowitz blueprint to New Rome. What do you think about taking along your illuminated commemoration as a gift to the Holy Father? Oh. Brother Francis struggled to remain standing. Don't you dare faint on me! Brother Francis lost his struggle. Dear God. The abbot revived him, blessed him, called him a good book legger, and sent him to pack his bindle stick.
Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Part 5 of a series in 15 parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continueth the Chronicle. Set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Now come we to the time, forever to be held in grateful memory, when our order, and therefore these chronicles, cease to be dedicated to the blessed Leibowitz. Name we him now Saint Isaac Edward Leibowitz. For in the last year of the life of Brother Francis Gerard, it was decreed that our founder be canonized. And this happened in part through the findings of that same Brother Francis. For he it was who found the ancient room, hidden beneath the ground, wherein sacred relics of our founder had lain hidden six centuries and more. And beside these relics, Francis found the skull of our founder's wife, who perished in the flame deluge, unto whom Leibowitz was wedded before he entered religion. Now among the relics was a picture made by our founder in blue and white, and superscribed circuit design. This picture Brother Francis was charged to take to New Rome as a gift on the day of the canonization. And with it he took also, for presentation to the Holy Father, an illuminated copy thereof, made by himself on finest lambskin, resplendent with inks of many colors, and inlaid throughout with gold. The trip to New Rome would take three months, perhaps longer, the time depending, to some extent, on the distance Francis could cover before the inevitable band of robbers relieved him of his donkey. He traveled alone and unarmed, with only his bindle stiff and begging bowl, and carrying the relic and its illuminated replica. They won't take them. They wouldn't have any use for them. They don't always take everything. If something doesn't seem to have any value to them, they leave it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they even let you go without killing you. Two months after leaving the abbey, he met his robber on a heavily wooded mountain trail at the edge of a canyon, far from any human settlement except the Valley of the Mistborn, which lay a few miles to the west, where a colony of these misfortunates lived in seclusion, They'd congregated there several centuries ago, their ranks continually replenished by other monstrously deformed beings that sought refuge from the world. Even within the church, some said such creatures had been deprived of the image of God, that their souls were but animal souls, that they might with impunity be destroyed as animal and not man. No, said New Rome. Let that which is born of human parents be suffered to live. So it was that the misborn came to be called the Pope's children. Mm -hmm. 
the robber who accosted Francis was not in any obvious way one of the malformed, but that he came from the Valley of the Mistborn was evident, because from behind the robber, a strange figure arose up on the slope, and its mocking hoots echoed off the canyon walls. The figure was wearing a robe with two hoods. The robber himself stood in the trail directly ahead, a short man, heavy as a bull, armed with a knife and chewing on a bone. The figure up on the slope unleashed an arrow. The missile whipped into the trail just behind the donkey. Get off! Not bad. A bit skinny, though. Not this time. Too scrawny. Francis was not entirely convinced they were talking about the donkey. Good day to you, sir. You may take the donkey. Walking will improve my health, I think. He smiled and started away. Another arrow slashed into the trail at his feet. Now, strip. And let's see what's in that roll and in the package. Well, you can see I'm carrying a begging bowl. I don't have anything. I've seen that trick before. Last man with a bowl had gold in his boot. Now, strip. Francis untied his bindle stick, spread its contents for display, and began to undress. The robber searched his clothing, found nothing, and tossed the clothing back to him. Now, let's see inside that other package. Uh, oh, uh, it, it contains only documents, sir, of value to no one except the owner. Open it. Francis untied the package, unwrapped the original blueprint and the illuminated Ooh. commemoration. Ooh. Gold leaf Ooh. inlay and a colorful design flashed in the sunlight. <laughs> what a pretty. <laughs> now, wouldn't a woman like that to hang on the wall? Oh, no. <laughs> He's <Please>. got gold. <laughs> gold. <laughs> <Yeah>. We'll eat <laughs> later. He gets hungry after a couple of days just sitting there. <laughs> Business is bad. Traffic's light these days. Yes. Uh, I'm sure it hey, is. What's this? Uh, a charm? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> what? One is a ghost of the other. Uh, what magic is this? What's it called? It's a uh, transistorized control system for unit 6P. Uh, oh, please. The gold is so thin, sir. It's it's, it's worth nothing to speak of. Uh, 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 weigh it in your hand. Uh, it's of no use to you. Mm. Please, sir, take my clothing instead. Uh, take the donkey. Take whatever you will. But leave these. Please. They mean nothing to you. Keep your clothes. I'll take the charge. Oh, for the love of God, sir, please. What are they for? <laughs> nothing. Uh, nothing, sir. One one is a memento of a man long dead, uh, an ancient. The other is only a copy. Well, what good are they to you? Uh, uh, you know the forest tribes, how they venerate their ancestors. And we despise our ancestors. Cursed be they who gave us birth. Uh, you know who we are, where we are from. Huh? Yes, yes, I know. And I meant no offense. Well, good. The, the ancient, whose relic this is, he's not our ancestor. He was our teacher. Mm. We venerate his memory. But this is only a keepsake. No more. What about the other one? I, I, I made it myself. Please, sir. It took me 15 years. <laughs> it's nothing to you. Please. <laughs> you wouldn't take 15 years of a man's life for no reason. 15 years? Yes. <laughs> you spent 15 years making this? Oh, but... <laughs> Francis was suddenly silent. The robber's <laughs> finger was tapping the original blue. Yes. <laughs> this took you 15 years? <laughs> it's ugly. 15 years? <laughs> so that's what you do way out there, huh? Why? <laughs> What's it good for? Fifteen years to make this. <laughs> Francis watched in silence. The robber had mistaken the relic itself for the copy of the relic. 
still laughing. The robber threw both documents to the ground, then took his knife from his belt and tossed it down beside the papers. Tell you what, boy, I'll wrestle you for them. Them against my knife. Well, <laughs> at least a contest would give heaven a chance to intervene in an unobtrusive way. Done. They squared off. They circled, briefly. Three seconds later, the monk lay groaning on the flat of his back under a short mountain of muscle. Now, you gotta buy him back. I want him fair enough. I have nothing. I am poor. That's all right. If you want him bad, you'll get gold. Two hecklos of gold, that's a ransom. Bring it here any time you want him back. Bring gold. Yes. They're important to other people, not to me. I was taking them to the Pope. Maybe maybe they'll pay you for the important one. But let me let me have the other one, please. Please. Just, just, just show them. Please. The robber stuffed the illuminated copy into his shirt, mounted the donkey, and threw back to Francis the ancient blueprint. Take it, then. Fifteen years. <laughs> Remember, two hecklos of gold will ransom your keepsake. And tell your Pope I want it fair. <laughs> ride, ride, eat later. <laughs> Praise God for robbers who could make such a mistake. Tenderly, Francis held the original blueprint as he limped down the trail toward New Rome. But gradually, a sadness engulfed him. The taunting voice still rang in his ears. Fifteen years! So that's what you do over there. His heart was troubled by the robber's mock. He thought of Brother Jairus's gentler mockery of earlier years. Maybe Jairus had been right. His head hung low in his hood as he traveled slowly on. <coughs> the hour had come Francis knelt in the basilica before the beginning of the ceremony. Here and there among the crowd, someone stifled a cough or stumbled. Suddenly, a peal of trumpets. The crowd arose and then knelt in a slow wave that followed the movement of a chair containing a frail old man in white who gestured his blessing as the procession moved him toward the throne. <coughs> Breath kept choking up in Francis's throat. The ceremony was brief. Someone approached the throne. A saint's advocate. Monsignor Aguera. Sancte Pater, absabientia, summa petimus utile beatus libuis, cuius miracula miratis ut multi, ad perpetuum ecclesiae sancte omnem subsidium... Aguera called upon the Pope for definition concerning the belief that the Beatus Libowitz was indeed a saint. Gratissima nobis causa est fili directissime, Deo volente diebus per paucis urbi et orbi annunciabo ilum conditorem. The Pope chanted in response, explaining it was by divine guidance alone that he might comply with Aguera's request. He asked all to pray for that guidance. 
and the litany of the saints was chanted. After that, Aguera pleaded again for the proclamation, and at last it came. Pope Leo XXI intoned the decision of the Church, rendered under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming an ancient and rather obscure scientific technician named Leibowitz to be a saint. And after a brief prayer, the ceremony was over. Monsignor Aguera escorted Francis to an audience with the Pope. Francis experienced a sudden dizzy spell, then remembered. Arcos had threatened to flay him alive if he fainted during the audience. So he steeled himself against it, found courage to focus his eyes. In the Basilica, the Pope had been a spot of white in a sea of color. Here, at closer range, he could see the Pope was not nine feet tall, was much less ferocious than Abbot Arcos. He knelt to kiss the fisherman's ring, then gave to the Pope the Leibowitz blueprint. This, then, is the original relic you found in the fallout shelter? Yes, Holy Father. So the bandit thought your work was the relic itself? Yes, even a robber can have a keen eye for art, huh? Mm. Uh, Monsignor Aguera told us of the beauty of your commemoration. What a pity it was stolen. It, it was nothing, Holy Father. I only regret that I wasted 15 years. Oh, wasted? How wasted? If the robber had not been misled by the beauty of your work, he might have taken this, might he not? Yes, I, I suppose he might. Brother Francis, do you understand these symbols used by Leibowitz? The meaning of the thing represented? No, Holy Father. My ignorance is complete. <laughs> so is ours. <laughs> the old man chuckled, uh. pressed his lips to the relic as if kissing an altar stone. Uh. We, we thank you for those 15 years. Never think of them as wasted. Those years were spent to preserve this original. Someday the meaning of the original may be discovered and may prove important. Huh? <laughs> the old man blinked. <laughs> or was it a wink? Without your work, the world's amnesia might well be total. Hmm. And now, goodbye. Goodbye. Monsignor Aguera touched Francis's arm and escorted him out of the audience room, then embraced the monk warmly and handed him a package. A token from the Holy Father. The package contained a purse. Two hecklos of gold. Oh, you did say the robber won the commemoration from you in a wrestling match, didn't you? Yes, Monsignor. <laughs> then I don't think you'd be wrong to buy it back. Francis trudged back toward his abbey on foot. There had been days and weeks on the trail, but his heart was singing. Buy it back, Monsignor Aguera had said. With the two hecklos of gold, he'd be able to buy back his commemoration. But the robber was not waiting where Francis had hoped. Footprints had the place, but no sign of the robber. Sun filtered through the trees to cover the ground in leafy shadows. The forest was not dense, but it offered shade. He sat down to wait. 
and watched the buzzards circling overhead. It seemed peaceful in the forest that day. Can't say I'll mind if I have to wait a day or two for him. <laughs> Make a nice break. <clears throat> he glanced down the trail toward his distant home in the desert. From here, one could see a mile of trail in either direction while remaining hidden in the thatch of forest. Something moved out there in the distance. He shielded his eyes, studied the movement. Whatever it was, it wiggled, shimmered in the heat. At times it seemed to wear a head. At times it was completely obscured in the heat glaze. But it was approaching. Once, when the edge of a cloud brushed at the sun, the heat shimmer subsided for a few seconds and he could see... It was a man. He shivered. Something about that figure was familiar. Could it be? The old pilgrim? The old man? Who led me to the fallout shelter? No. No, no not, not possibly. Not after all these years. He crossed himself, began telling his rosary beads. While Francis watched the distant pilgrim limping towards him, a debate about Francis was in progress. Behind him, on the canyon wall. Soon the debate was over, and the Pope's children, eyes fixed on Francis's back, stole quietly down the canyon wall. As we forget toward him against us. with drawn bows but it is not ten feet behind Francis a pebble rattled he turned to look the arrow hit him squarely between the eyes <laughs> The buzzards circling overhead swooped down for a closer look. Out on the trail, the pilgrim saw the buzzards and stopped. He sat in the sunlight and watched them congregating over that wooded patch, as if impatient to land. As long as the buzzards remained interested but reluctant, the pilgrim remained the same. There were cougars in those hills. And beyond the peak were things worse than cougars who sometimes prowled afar. So the pilgrim waited until the buzzards descended among the trees. Then he stood up and limped ahead toward the forested patch, dividing his weight between his game leg and his staff. The buzzards were busy at the remains of Francis. The pilgrim chased the birds away from the body. There was an arrow through the skull protruding at the back of the neck. No one in sight, but many footprints. It was not safe to stay. But safe or not, the job had to be done. He found a place where the earth was soft. While he dug, the angry buzzard circled low over the treetops, sometimes darting down, but then flapping their way up again. For an hour, they fluttered anxiously above the wooded hillside until the pilgrim was gone. Then one bird landed. It strutted indignantly over a mound of fresh earth with a rock marker at one end. Disappointed, it took wing again. A flock of dark scavengers abandoned the place and soared high on the rising currents of air while they hungrily watched the land. 
There was a dead hog beyond the valley of the Mistborn. The buzzards glided down for a feast. Later, in a far mountain pass, a cougar licked her chops and left her kill. The buzzards seemed thankful for the chance to finish her meal. The buzzards laid their eggs in season and lovingly fed their young. The younger generation waxed strong, soared high and far on black wings, waiting for the fruitful earth to yield up her bountiful carrion. Sometimes dinner was only a toad. Once it was a monsignor from New Rome. Their flight carried them over the Midwestern plains. They were delighted with the bounty of good things which the nomads left lying on the land during their ride over toward the south. The buzzards laid their eggs in season and lovingly fed their young. Earth had nourished them bountifully for centuries. She would nourish them for centuries more. Pickings were good for a while in the region of the Red River. But then, out of the carnage, a city-state arose. For rising city-states, the buzzards had no fondness, although they approved of their eventual fall. They shied away from Texarkana and ranged far over the plain to the west. After the manner of all living things, they replenished the earth many times with their kind. Eventually, it was the year of our Lord, 3174. There were rumors of war. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Part 6 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the chronicle, set down daily by the Brethren the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, in the year of our Lord 3174, 
the labors of this community bore their first fruits. For in that year it came to pass that signs and tokens were manifest how the world might cast off the mantle of darkness and put on again the armor of light, the light of learning, which all had long rejected, yea, these twelve hundred years, save only the monks of our order, who in their generations have preserved the writings from of old. Nor had our labor been in vain, for in the world there were some now once again who esteemed knowledge and valued understanding, to whom the memorabilia of our order were a treasure to be greatly sought. They would seek out holy church as a source of knowledge, even as they sought out kings and governors as a source of wealth. Still it was an age of strife, and the tribes warred often, and every man's life might hang on the word of his prince, and if peace was established, none could say it would last. Unquote. A party at the court of King Hannigan II. The papal representative, Monsignor Marcus Apollo, is present. Apollo is convinced war is imminent. King Hannigan's messenger has returned with his skin intact from a mission to the tents of Mad Bear. Supposedly, the emissary's mission had been to tell Mad Bear that the civilized states at Hannigan's urging had entered into an agreement concerning disputed lands and would hereafter wreak stern vengeance on Mad Bear for any further raiding activities. But no man carried such news to Mad Bear and came back alive. Therefore, Apollo concluded, the ultimatum had not been delivered, and Hannigan's emissary had gone out to the plains with a different purpose. Apollo picked his way politely through the crowd to his clerk, Brother Claret. Brother Claret, I just overheard some interesting news. Sarko came back alive. Oh? I take it you understand the implications. Oh, yes, Monsignor. It means the agreement was a fraud, and Hannigan intends to... Shh, sure, later. Uh, do you have a... Well done to Deo. I thought you shunned these gatherings. <laughs> what could be so special about this one to attract such a distinguished scholar? Well, you are the attraction, of course. I? Yes, they told me you'd be here, otherwise I would... Care for some punch, Don Tadeo? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Monsignor, I wanted to ask you more about the Leibowitz documents. Yes. I had a letter from a fellow named Cornhor at the Abbey. He tells me they have writing that date back to the last years of the 20th century. Yes, they're quite authentic, I'm told. Well, it strikes me as very mysterious that nobody's heard it. Uh, well, never mind that. Uh, Cornhauer lists a number of texts they claim to have and describes them. Now, I've got to see them. Oh? Yes, if it's a hoax, it should be found out. But if it isn't, the data might well be priceless. I assure you, there is no hoax. Now, the letter contained an invitation to visit the Abbey and study the documents they have evidently heard of me. Not necessarily. They aren't particular about who reads their books as long as he washes his hands and doesn't deface their property. I beg but there, then, you have no problem. Accept their invitation. Go to the Abbey, study their relics. They'll make you welcome. And travel through the plains at a time when Mad Bear's clan... It... You were saying? Uh, it's a long, dangerous trip. I, I, I can't spare six months' absence from the Collegium. Hmm. Now, I want to discuss the possibility of sending an armed party to fetch the documents here for study. I'm afraid that would be quite impossible. Aren't you the Vatican's nuncio to the court of Hannigan? Precisely. I represent New Rome, not the monastic orders. The government of an abbey is in the hands of its abbot. But with a little pressure from New Rome... We'd you... better discuss it later, Don Tadeo. This evening, in my study, if you like. Hmm. I'll be there. Say, seven o'clock? Oh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, I'll, I'll see you then. Why didn't you tell him flatly no? Transport priceless relics through bandit country in these times is unthinkable, Monsignor. Certainly. Well, then why? Two reasons. First, Tadeo is Hannigan's kinsman. Second, he started to say something about Mad Bear and then broke off. I think he knows what's going to happen. If he volunteers information, I want to include it in the report you're about to deliver personally to New Rome. I? To New Rome? But what? It's the kind of thing one doesn't put in writing. If Hannigan's people intercepted such a dispatch, you and I would be found floating face down in the Red River. What am I to say? That Hannigan's ambition to unite the continent isn't so wild a dream as we thought. The agreement is probably a fraud by Hannigan. He means to use it to get both the empires of Denver and Laredo into conflict with the Plains nomads. 
If Loraden forces are tied up in a running battle with Mad Bear, it wouldn't take much encouragement for the state of Chihuahua to attack Laredo from the south. After all, there's an old enmity there. Hannigan can then march victoriously to Rio Laredo. With Laredo under his thumb, he can tackle both Denver and the Mississippi Republic without worrying about a stab in the back from the south. Do you think Hannigan can do it, Monsignor? <sighs> I don't know. In any case, we must forewarn you, Rome, of what may be coming. Forewarned, we may be able to keep out of the squabble. Do you really think so? Of course not. Don Tadeo arrived at Marcus Apollo's study as arranged. Monsignor, hmm. I've just come from a meeting of the faculty of the Collegium. We talked about Brother Cornhor's letter and the list of texts. I take it there was skepticism. Shall I be polite? <laughs> Don't bother. There was skepticism. Yeah. Incredulity is more nearly the word. My own feeling is that if such papers exist, they're probably forgeries dating back several centuries. Mm -hmm. Now, I doubt that the present monks at the Abbey are trying to perpetuate a hoax. Naturally, they would believe the documents valid. Uh, kind of you to absolve. Well, them. I offered to be polite, shall I? No, go on. Uh, the papers. Now, no matter what we may believe of them, the idea that such documents may still exist intact, even the slightest chance of their existing, is... Well, so arousing a thought that we simply must investigate them. Very well, they invited you. But tell me, what do you find so arousing about the documents? Are you acquainted with my work? I must confess, I haven't read a good well, deal of Well, never technical. mind. Most of it's highly abstract theories of electrical essence, planetary motion, matters of that sort. Well, now, Cornhor's list mentions such names as Laplace, Maxwell. Einstein. D do they mean anything to you? Not much. History mentions them as natural philosophers, doesn't it? Yes, and that's all anyone knows about them. Physicists, according to our not-so-reliable historians, responsible for the rapid rise of the European-American culture, they say. <laughs> historians list nothing but trivia. I'd nearly forgotten them. But Cornhoe's descriptions of the old documents they say they have might well be taken from physical science texts of some kind. It's it's just impossible. Why? Look around you, Monsignor. Can you bring yourself to believe that men today are the lineal descendants of men who invented machines that flew, who traveled to the moon, harnessed the forces of nature, built machines that could talk and, and seem to think? Can you believe that there were such men? Look around you. Tell me if you see the progeny of such a civilization. No, I can't accept it. How could a great and wise civilization have destroyed itself so completely? You reject all history, then, as myth? Oh, no, not reject, but it must be questioned. Who wrote your histories? The monastic orders, there, of course. There, there, you have it. Have what? There was on this continent a more advanced civilization than we have now. That can't be denied. You can look at the rubble, the rotted metal, and know it. You, you can dig under a strip of blown sand and find their broken roadways. But where is there evidence of the kind of machines your historians tell us they had in those days? Where, where are the remains of self-moving carts, of flying machines? Beaten into plowshares and hoes. If they existed. If you doubt it. Why bother studying the Leibowitz documents? Well, because a doubt is not a denial. Doubt is a powerful tool. It should be applied to history. And what do you want me to do about it, Learned Don? Write to the abbot of this place. Assure him the documents will be treated with care and will be returned after we've examined them for authenticity and studied their content. Hmm. Why uh, do you insist you must see them here instead of going to the abbey? Tell your abbot, if I go to the abbey and find the documents are authentic, my finding won't mean much to others. You mean your colleagues might think the monks had tricked you into something? Mm, that might be inferred. But also important, if they're brought here, they can be examined by everyone who's qualified to form an opinion. We can't move the entire collegium to the southwest desert for six months. I see your point. Will you send the request to the abbey? Yes. Oh, uh, good. But it will be your request, not mine. And it's only fair to tell you, I don't think the abbot, Don Paolo, will say yes. When Tadeo had gone, Marcus called his clerk, told him to stop at the Leibowitz Abbey on his way back from New Rome, told him to tell Abbot Paolo, quote, Sheba expects Solomon to come to her.
Time seeps slowly on the desert. There's little change to mark its passage. Two seasons had passed since Abbot Paolo had said no. Now it seemed Sheba was coming to Solomon after all, but unhappy about it, maybe even angry. The abbot paced along the abbey walls at sundown. His thinning hair fluttered in white pennants on the desert wind. His shadow fell across the courtyard, and monks crossing the grounds glanced up at the old man. Their ruler had been moody of late. It was whispered the old man was not well, not well at all. It was whispered that if the abbot heard the whispers, the whisperers should speedily climb over the wall. The abbot had heard, but it pleased him not to take note of it. He knew the whispers were true. He turned to the clerk beside him. Read it to me again. Which one, Dominic? You know very well which one. The one from Apollo. Yes, my lord. <clears throat> this is to notify you that Don Tadeo Fardentrot, sage of sages, scholar of scholars, fair-haired... All right, all right, all right. Skip the formalities. Mind. Yes, my lord. Um, <clears throat> ah, has finally made up his mind to pay you a visit, having exhausted all hope of transporting your memorabilia to this fair realm. He will bring his misgivings and a small party of armed cavalry courtesy of Hannigan too, whose corpulent person is even now hovering over me as I write, grunting and scowling at these lines, which he commanded me to write. You will remember Hannigan cannot either read or write. He expects me to acclaim his cousin Tadeo in the hope that you'll honor him fittingly. I shall be no less than candid here. <clears throat> so, let me caution you about this person, Don Tadeo. Treat him with your customary charity, Paulo, but trust him not. He is a brilliant scholar, but a political captive of the state. Furthermore, the Don is rather anti-clerical, I think, or uh, perhaps solely anti-monastic. Uh, after his embarrassing birth, he was spirited away to a Benedictine monastery, and, but no, ask the courier about that. You've heard about his childhood, brother. Oh, no, Father Abbot, I haven't. Well, well, um, briefly... <clears throat> He's Hannigan's cousin. He's illegitimate. Oh, my. They put him to school with the Benedictines. And as so often happens in such cases, he grew up starved for affection with nothing going for him but his brains. I see. So what we have here is one of your cold intellectuals. Mm. He's scarcely 30, yet people are talking about him as the kind of major scientific thinker that only crops up maybe once or twice in a hundred years. I see. Go on with the letter. Yes, my lord. He... Ah, he will behave if you are firm, but be careful, my friend. He has a mind like a loaded musket, and he can go off in any direction. Hmm. Uh, there's a postscript. A certain chalice is being filled for me of late, Polo. Pray God will strengthen me. I doubt it will pass away. I hope that you and the brethren will pray often for Marcus Apollo in his fear and trembling. Farewell in Christ. Mm. I wonder if Hannigan had someone read the letter to him. If so, my lord, would the letter have been sent? I suppose not. All right, thanks very much. You'd better go back to your other duties now. Yes, Father Abbott. Several weeks had passed since the arrival of that letter. During those weeks, Abbot Paolo had slept badly, had suffered a recurrence of an old gastric trouble, had brooded on the past, as if something might have been done differently back then to avert this future. What future? There seemed no reason to expect trouble. No signs of turmoil came from the tribes to the north and the east. Imperial Denver was not pressing its attempt to levy taxes on the monastery. The oasis was still furnishing water. No plague among animals or men. The corn was doing well in the irrigated field. There were signs of progress in the world. And yet he felt forebodings. Some nameless threat. The feeling had been gnawing at him, as annoying as a swarm of flies buzzing around one's face in the desert sun. There was a sense of the imminent, coiled like a rattler, ready to strike. What nonsense, old man. When you tire of living, change itself seems evil, does it not? Do you suppose the buzzards have eaten old Eliezer yet? Oh. 
Paolo looked around, squinted into the twilight. Hello, hello. It was God. Father Pryor. His Pryor. Eh? And probable successor. Uh, uh, Eliezer, you mean Benjamin. Why, have you heard something about him lately? No, but you seem to be looking toward the Mesa. I thought you might be wondering about the old Jew. There's a wisp of smoke up there. I guess he's still alive. We shouldn't have to guess. I'm going to ride over there and pay him a visit. Oh, you sound like you're leaving tonight. In a day or two. Uh, better be careful. They say he throws rocks at climbers. I haven't seen him for five years. And I'm ashamed I haven't. He's lonely. If he's lonely, why does he insist on living like a hermit? To escape loneliness in a young world. Uh, that perhaps makes his kind of sense, Domine, but I just don't see it. Well, you will, when you're my age or his. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't expect to get as old as Benjamin. He lays claim to several thousand years. And you know, I can't dispute him. I met him when I was just a novice. Fifty odd years ago, and, and I'd swear he looked just as old then as he does now. He must be well over a hundred. Three thousand two hundred and nine, so he says. Sometimes even older, I think he believes it, too. An interesting madness. I'm not so sure he's mad, Father. Just devious in his sanity. What did you want to see me about? Oh, uh, three small matters. First, how do we get the poet out of the guest house before Don Tadeo arrives? He's due in a few days, and the poet's taken root. I'll handle the poet. What else? Vespers, will you be in the church? Not until Compline. You take over. What else? Controversy in the basement in the library over Brother Cornhower's experiment. Who and how? Well, a silly gist of it seems to be, Brother Armbrose to the librarian has the attitude that doomsday will come soon enough without Brother Cornhower pushing it. While with Brother Cornhower, it's the dawn of a new age. Cornhower moves something to make room for a piece of equipment. Armbruster yells, perdition. No. Brother Cornhower yells, progress. Mm. And they have at each other. <laughs> then they come fuming to me to settle it. I scold them for losing their tempers. They get sheepish and fawn over each other for ten minutes. Six hours later, boom, and the floor shivers again down in the library. Mm -hmm. I can settle the blow-ups, Domini, but there seems to be a basic issue. A basic issue. breach of conduct, I'd say. Yes. What do you want me to do about it? Exclude them from the table? Not yet, but, but you might warn them. All right, I'll track it down. Now, is that all? That's all, Domini. Oh, by the way, do you think Brother Cornhower's contraption is going to work? I hope not. Then why let him continue? Because I was curious at first. The work has caused so much commotion by now, though, that I'm sorry I let him start it. Then why not stop him? Because I'm hoping he will reduce himself to absurdity without any help from me. Oh. Now, if the thing fails, it'll fail just in time for Don Tadeo's arrival. That would be the proper form of mortification for Brother Cornhower. I see. To remind him of his vocation before he begins thinking he was called to religion for the purpose of building a generator of electrical essences. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Father Abbott... Yes? You'll have to admit it would be quite an achievement if successful. No. No, I don't have to admit it. The Abbott decided to handle the problem of the poets before the problem of perdition versus progress. The simplest solution to the problem of the poet was for the poet to get out of the guest house and preferably out of the abbey, out of the vicinity of the abbey, out of sight, hearing, and mind. But no one could expect a simplest solution to get rid of the poet. The abbot left the wall and crossed the courtyard. At the guest house, he knocked. No answer. So he tried the door. It opened. Faint red light from a charcoal burner softened the darkness. The room reeked of stale food. Poet? He went to the burner, raked up the coals, and lit a splinter of kindling. He transferred the flame to an oil lamp and went to explore the rest of the suite. It would have to be thoroughly scrubbed and fumigated. Also, perhaps exorcised before Don Tadeo moved in. Yes. In the second room, Paolo suddenly felt as if someone were watching him. He paused and looked slowly around. Uh -huh. A single eyeball peered at him from a vase of water on the shelf. 
the poet's glass eye, which the poet often took out. The abbot nodded at it familiarly and went on to a third room, where he met the goat. It was their first meeting. The goat was standing atop a tall cabinet, munching turnip greens. It had a bald head, a bald, bright blue head. Poet. Over here. Wake up. You're moving out of here huh? immediately, tonight. Mm. We need the guest house for Don Tadeo. Oh. Dump your stuff in the hall. Let's get this place aired out. Mm. Sleep in the stable boy's cell downstairs if you must. Then come back in the morning and scrub this place up. Who used these quarters last? Monsignor Longi. Why? Oh, well, I wondered who brought the bed bugs. Mm. Don Tadeo can have them. I don't want them. I've been eaten up alive ever since I moved it. I was planning on leaving, but now that you've offered me the stable, well, I'll be I happy did not to mean... accept your hospitality a little longer until my book is finished, of course. What book? Oh, never mind. Just get your things out of here. Now? Now. Good. I, uh, I don't think I could stand these bugs another night. <laughs> Give me that wine. Sure. Have some. It's a pleasant vintage. Thank you. Since you stole it from our cellars, Whoa. it happens to be sacramental wine. Did that occur to you? Uh, well, it hasn't been consecrated. I'm surprised you thought of that. <laughs> I didn't steal it anyway. I no, got never it. Never mind the wine. Where did you steal the goat? I didn't steal it. Oh, oh it, it just materialized. It was a gift, Reverend Decimi. Oh, from whom? A dear friend, Dominicimi. Whose dear friend? Mine, sire. Oh, now, there's a paradox. Where? Uh, now, now, did, did you... Benjamin, sire. You stole it from old Benjamin? Please, not stole. Well, then what? Benjamin insisted I take it as a gift after I composed this sonnet in his honor. The truth. <laughs> well, I... I want it from him at Mumbly Peg. I see. No, it's true. The old wretch nearly cleaned me out, and then he refused to allow me credit. Well, I had to stake my glass eye against the goat, and I want everything back. Get the goat out of the abbey. Oh, it's a marvelous species of goat. The milk is an unearthly odor, and it contains essences. In fact, it's responsible for the old Jew's longevity. How much of it? All 5,408 years of it. Hmm. I thought he was only 3,200. Oh, never mind. Just get yourself moved out, and, and tomorrow get the goat back to Benjamin. But I want it fairly. We will not discuss this. Take the goat to the stable, then I'll have it returned to him myself. Why? We have no use for a goat. Neither have you. Oh, oh. <laughs> what does that mean, pray? Don Tadeo is coming. <laughs> There'll be need of a goat. A scapegoat before it's finished. You can be sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> Paolo stomped out of the guest house. Don Tadeo was coming. Twelve centuries after the flame deluge, Don Tadeo was coming for the memorabilia. The brethren of Leibowitz had pressed a sort of Veronica's veil to the face of a crucified civilization. It had come away marked with an image of ancient grandeur. But the image was faintly printed, incomplete, hard to understand. But the books could help, Paolo hoped. The books could point out directions and offer hints. It had happened once before. But this time, thought Paolo, we'll remind him of who kept the spark burning while the world slept. What was that? He thought he heard a bleat, a sarcastic bleat, from the poet's goat. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more 
starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Part 7 of a series in 15 parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, it came to pass in the reign of Hannigan of Texarkana that a cousin of the king was a man of great learning, and his name was Don Tadeo. The king esteemed not learning, but he gathered learned men unto him. He said, They will devise me great new weapons, strong engines of war. But for Don Tadeo, learning was more to be valued than warfare. He set out on a journey to the southwest, attended by armed men on horseback, for safe conduct through the tribal places. His journey was to the Abbey of St. Leibowitz. He journeyed here that he might read the ancient writings of our memorabilia and garner from them a knowledge of the ancient skills, such as were largely lost twelve centuries since, when the world laid waste to itself in the War of the Flame Deluge. In the year of Tadeo's coming, there was at the abbey a brother much given likewise to the study of the ancient learning. His name was Cornhor, and he devised a new manner of making light, and the source of this light was a mysterious power, which he called electrical essence. And the source of this power was a mighty machine, with wheels and cords and treadmills, worked by not less than four stout young men, strong in wind and limb. And this machine was installed in the cellar library, for it was passing heavy. The librarian, Brother Armbruster, was much displeased, and there arose great discord. The Lord Abbot, therefore, made his way thither, that the dispute might be resolved. Unquote. Bedlam in the basement, as Abbot Paolo cautiously descended the stairs. Someone was hammering metal pins into stone. Sweat mingled with the odor of old books. A feverish bustle of unscholarly activity, confusion by lamplight. Novices hurried past with tools. Novices stood in groups and studied floor plans. Well, Abbot Paolo! Brother Cornhor stood beside a makeshift piece of machinery with a grin of enthusiasm. Oh, we'll soon have a light such as no man alive has ever seen. This is not without a certain vanity, brother. Vanity, Domni? To put to good use what we've learned? I had in mind our haste to put it to use in time to impress a certain visiting scholar. Oh. But never mind. Tell me about this machine. Yes, my lord. This axle connects by these pulleys and belts to this turnstile. Now, these wagon wheels are mounted on the axle. Now, they, they, their iron tires are scored with deep grooves so we can wrap all this copper wire around them. The wheels are free to spin in midair. The tires don't touch anything. Then these stationary blocks of iron face the tires, but don't quite touch them. Then the blocks themselves are wrapped with all this wire. Mm -hmm. And what are they called? Field coils, they're called, Father Abbott. It'll be the greatest physical improvement in the Abbey since we got the printing press on the musical. Mm -hmm. Will it work? Oh, I'll stake a month's extra chores on it, my lord. Really? And where does the light come out? Oh, we have a special lamp for that. What you see here is only the dynamo. It produces the electrical essence which the lamp will burn. Uh, this essence, um, can't it be extracted from mutton fat? No, no, no. The electrical essence is, um, well, do you want me to explain? Better not. 
Natural science is not my bent. I'll leave it to you younger heads. But tell me, if by studying writings from the memorabilia you can learn how to construct this thing, why do you suppose none of our predecessors saw fit to construct it? Well, uh, well it's not easy to explain. Uh, actually, in the writings that survive, there's no direct information about the construction of a dynamo. Uh, rather, you might say the information is implicit in a whole collection of fragmentary writings, partially implicit, and it has to be got out by deduction. But to get it, you also need some theories to work from, theoretical information our predecessors didn't have. Mm -hmm. But we do. Well, yes. Now that there have been a few men like... like Don Tadeo. Mm. Was that a complete sentence? Uh, well, well un until recently, not many philosophers concerned themselves with new theories in physics. Actually, it was the work of Don Tadeo that gave us the necessary working axioms. His work on the mobility of electrical essences, for example, and his conservation... He theory, should be pleased, a... then, to see his work applied. Oh, I certainly hope so, my lord. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, but... Uh... Where's the lamp itself, may I ask? I hope it's no larger than the dynamo. Oh, no, Dominic. Uh, no size at all. Uh, this is it. These are the carbons. Uh, the ancients would have called it an arc lamp. There was another kind, but we don't have the materials to make it. Amazing. And where does the light come from? Here, in this gap between the carbons. It must be a very tiny flame. Ooh, bright. Brighter, I expect, than a hundred candles. No. Uh -huh. Oh, you find that impressive? Well, yes. Just think how we've been limping along on beeswax and mutton fat. I've been wondering if the ancients used carbons on their altars instead of candles. No, no, definitely no. I can tell you that. Please dismiss that idea as quickly as possible and don't ever think of it again. Yes, Father Abbott. Now, where are we going to hang that thing? Well, oh, I hadn't given it any thought. I suppose it should go over the desk where Don today will be working. We'd better ask Brother Armbruster about that. Oh. Mm, what's the matter? Have you and Brother Armbruster been... Oh, really, Father Abbott, I haven't lost my temper with him even once. Oh, we, we've had words, but well, he doesn't want anything moved. He keeps mumbling about witchcraft and the like. It's, it's not easy to reason with him. His eyes are half blind now from reading by dim light. And yet he says it's devil's work we're up to. I don't know what to say. So it's up to me to sort him out for you, I Ed. wish you would, sis. Well, Speak well, of the devil. Well, you've got your way now, Brother Cornor. When will you be putting in a mechanical librarian? We do find hints, Brother Arm Brewster, that once there were such things... Uh -huh. In descriptions of the Machina Analytica, you I'm find references... Enough, enough, the Machina. enough! Brother Arm Brewster, Don Tadeo will need a place to work. What do you suggest? Let him read at the lectern in the natural science alcove like anyone else. What about setting up a study for him here on the open floor, Father Abbott? Besides a desk, he'll need an abacus, a wall slate, and a drawing board. We could partition it off with temporary screens. I thought he was going to need the memorabilia. He will. Well, then he'd have to walk back and forth a lot if you put him in the middle. The rare volumes are chained, and the chains won't reach that far. Well, that's no problem. Take off the chains. What? It's silly anyway. No, no, you don't. Those chains stay on. But why? <laughs> It, brother, it is not the book burners now. It's the villagers we have to worry about. Those chains stay on. Oh. You see, my lord. Brother Armbruster's right. There's too much agitation in the village. The town council expropriated our school, don't forget. Now they've got a village library, and they want to fill its shelves, preferably with rare volumes, of course. Not only that, we had trouble with thieves last year. No. No, the rare volumes stay chained. All right. So he'll have to work in the alcove. Now, where do we hang your wondrous lamp? Well, if he's going to work in the alcove, we'll just have to take down the crucifix from the take arch and hang the lamp the there instead temporarily. Well, there's Heathen, no other... Pagan! Desecrator! God help me out. Tear him apart with these hands. Where will he stop? Take him away. Brother Armbruster, please. Uh, speak more calmly when you address me. But Father Abbott, you heard what he... Brother Armbruster, you will please get the shelf ladder and remove that crucifix. What? This is not a church. Uh, the placement of images is optional. For the present, 
he will please take down the crucifix. Lord it's Abbot. the only suitable place for the lamp, it seems. Now, later, we may change it. Lord Now, Abbot. I realize that this whole thing has disturbed your library Lord and Abbot. perhaps your digestion. But we hope it's in the interests of progress. If it isn't... Lord then... Abbott, you would make our Lord move over to make room for progress? Brother Armbruster! Why don't you just hang the witch light around our Lord's Brother, neck? I do not force your obedience! Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, my Lord. You will see me in my study after Compline. I'll... I, I'll get the ladder, Father Abbott. <laughs> Abbot Paolo glanced up at the crucifix. Do you mind, he wondered. There was a knot in his belly. The knot would exact its price later. He left the basement before anyone could notice how such trivial discomfort could overcome him these days. The installation was completed the following day. Twice, Paolo had been forced to warn Brother Armbruster privately and then to rebuke him publicly during chapter. And yet, he felt more sympathy for the librarian's stand than he did for Cornhorse. He sat, slumped at his desk, and waited for news from the basement. He kept one hand tucked into the front of his habit. He patted his belly as though trying to calm an hysterical child. <laughs> Cramping in the gut. It always seems to come when there's some kind of unpleasantness in the offing. Sometimes goes away again if the unpleasantness breaks out into the open where I can wrestle with it. But, but now it is not going away. I'm being warned, yes. By an angel? Or a demon? Warned. Or perhaps conscious? Yes, of myself. And something I haven't faced yet. He winced at the pain. But what? And quickly looked toward the corner of his study at the wooden statue of St. Leibowitz. The statue was of Leibowitz at his martyrdom, caught by a mob and hanged over a fire. The abbot had grown fond of the old 26th century wood carving. Its face wore a curious smile, unusual for a sacramental image. <laughs> Curious look, considering you've got a hangman's rope around your neck. <laughs> Where did the idea come from? The idea for the smile. Tradition said Brother Francis Gerard, 500 years ago. It was said he'd made sketches of the old pilgrim who'd helped him find the fallout shelter. And someone had carved the statue from those sketches. Who do I know who grins that way? That grin will ruin you someday. But surely the saints must laugh in heaven. The Psalms say God himself shall chortle. <laughs> yes, but that little grin will ruin you someday. You're not sanctimonious enough, my son. Someday. Another grim dog will sit in this chair and he'll replace you with a plaster, Leibowitz. <laughs> the abbot fanned himself with a fan of buzzard feathers, but the breeze was not cooling. The air from the window was like an oven's breath off the scorched desert. It made the cramping worse. Maybe it's the cheese, does it? Gummy stuff this season and green. <laughs> no. No, face it, Paolo. It's not the food for the belly that does it, it's the food for the brain. Something up there is not digesting. But what? The wooden saint gave him no ready answer. Well, sometimes his mind worked in snatches. It was better to let it work that way when the cramps came and the world weighed heavy on him. What does the world weigh? The world weighs, but is not weighed, he thought. Sometimes its scales are crooked. It weighs life and labor in the balance against silver and gold. That'll never balance. But fast and ruthless, it keeps on weighing. It spills a lot of life <coughs> and sometimes a little gold. 
and blindfolded a king comes riding across the desert with a set of crooked scales, a pair of loaded dice, and upon the flags emblazoned, vexillary ages, uh, banners of the king. No. But of course, the saint's no. wooden smile seemed to insist. Of course. Paolo glared at the statue. Oh, sometimes I think you're laughing at me. Do they laugh at us in heaven? Saint Maisie of York herself. Remember her, old man? She died of a laughing fit. Well, that's different. She died laughing at herself. No, that's not so different either. Again, the pain. And the king is coming to weigh books in the basement with his pair of crooked scales. How crooked, Paolo? And what makes you think the memorabilia is free of dross? Treasured fragments of a dead civilization, yes, there are those there, true. But how much of it has been reduced to gibberish, embellished with olive leaves and cherubim, by forty generations of monastic ignoramuses. I made him travel all the way from Texarkana through dangerous country. Now I'm just worrying that what we've got may prove worthless to him. He glared at the smiling saint again. And again. Vexila rages. Vexila rages. Inferni pro deum. The banners of the king of hell go forth. The perverted line from an ancient comedy and nagged like an unwanted tune in his head. The knot in his belly pulled tighter. Oh, does the chalice have to be right now? But crucifixion is always now. Now ever since before Abraham even is always now. Before Dante Dale even now. Always for everybody, anyhow, is to get nailed on it and then to hang on it. And if you drop off, they beat you to death with a shovel. So do it with dignity, old man. If you can belch with dignity, then you may go to heaven if you're sorry enough about messing up the rug. He waited a long time. The room went pink. He let his head fall onto the desk. Well, Powell, are we going to hemorrhage now? Or are we just going to fool around with it? He probed the haze and found the face of the statue again. Such a small grin. And sad. <laughs> and understanding. And something else. Laughing at the hangman? <laughs> no, no, laughing for the hangman. Laughing at the Stultus Maximus, at Satan himself. It was the first time he had seen it clearly. In the last chalice, there could be a chuckle of triumph. Oh, my Lord Abbott. Brother Cornhor found him slumped over the desk, blood between his teeth. The young priest oh, felt for a pulse. You it's ridiculous. Oh, awakened. It's absolutely idiotic. Nothing could be more absurd. What's absurd, Domine? What? What? Uh, I'll get Brother Andrew at once. Come, come back here. Huh? What? What did you want? Oh, nothing, Father Abbott. I'll be back as soon as I get. Brother oh, Andrew. bother the medic! You didn't come in here for nothing. Sit down. Say what you wanted. But the test, the test was successful. The lamp, I mean. All right. Let's hear about it. Sit down. Start talking. Tell me all about it. Well, he was still dizzy. It, 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 it was just beautiful. But the knot in his belly had exactly. loosened. Exactly. As he could not have cared less about Cornhor's account like the of the test. But he tried to appear lost, attentive. And had to keep Cornhor here until he was awake enough to think. Couldn't let the brother go for the medic. Not yet. The news would get out. The old man is finished. I have to decide whether or not it's a safe time to be finished. Don Tadeo was coming. And Leibowitz needed an abbot. Meanwhile, out on the plains between Texarkana and the Abbey, Don Tadeo 
was the guest of Mad Bear. Tadeo sat huddled in a blanket close to the fire. There were twelve guests in all. The leader of the party was obviously a madman. Mad Bear did not object to insanity. Indeed, it was prized by his shamans as the most intense of supernatural visitations. But he did not know that the grass eaters likewise regarded madness as a virtue in a leader. This one spent half his time digging in the earth down by the dry riverbed, and the other half writing in a small book. Obviously a witch. Probably not to be trusted. Besides, he was a grass eater, and grass eaters were enemies. But he would not treat them all together as enemies. Not yet. Their king, Hannigan, who was almost as wise as a man, had secretly treated with him to supply the tribe with arms. He would accept the arms and leave the grass eaters undisturbed for a while and bide his time. So when these twelve from Texarkana rode into his camp, he treated them with condescending courtesy, as was proper to cowards and weaklings. A pitcher of blood was placed in front of Mad Bear. It was fresh from a butchered steer and still warm. A bowl of blood! Blood to fatten this man's arms! Give this grass eater a cup of red. Your name is? Uh, Don Tadeo, Mad Bear. Don Tadeo drinks! Don Tadeo drinks! Uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, how is it your people drink no water? Do your gods object? Who knows what the gods drink? It is said that water is for cattle and farmers, milk is for children, and blood for men. Should it be otherwise? No, no, not in a land of drought, where the men need the cattle and the cattle need the water. Mm. But uh, let us leave that. I have, O oh, chief... A request to make of your greatness. Mm. Tomorrow we shall continue our journey to the west. If some of your warriors could accompany our party, we would be honored. Why? Oh, why, uh, as, as guides. Uh... <laughs> oh, Chief, I'll, I'll be quite truthful. Ooh, some do. of your people disapprove of our presence <laughs> here. Now, while your hospitality has... <laughs> changed, uh... You are afraid. You fear ambush when you leave my tents. You eat grass and are afraid of a fight. <laughs> Don't fear. Real men shall accompany you. <laughs> I thank you. Uh, tell us, uh, what is it you look for in the dry land? New places for planting grass. I can tell you there are none. Except near a few water holes, nothing grows. That even cattle will eat. Now we look for no new land. We're not all of us farmers, you know. We are going to look for, um, for the skills of an ancient sorcery. Ancient sorcery in the West? I know of no magicians there, unless you mean the dark-robed ones. They are the ones. <laughs> what magic do they have worth looking for? Their messengers can be captured so easy it is no real sport. What sorcery can you learn from them? Well, for my part, I agree with you, but it is said that writings, uh, uh, incantations of great power are kept by them. Mm. Now, if it is true, then obviously the dark-robed ones don't know how to use them, but we hope to master them for ourselves. Will the dark-robed ones give you their secrets? I think so. <laughs> they don't dare hide them any longer. We could take them. <laughs> <laughs> A brave saying. You're braver among your own kind, but meek among real men. <laughs> Don Tadeo had his fill of Mad Bear's boasts. He went to bed. The soldiers stayed at the campfire to plan with Mad Bear the war. But the war, after all, was none of Tadeo's affair. The political aspirations of his ignorant cousin were far from his own interest in a revival of learning. Except when cousin's patronage proved useful. Meanwhile, it seemed their journey could go forward safely. And all the while, at the abbey, Paolo held his belly and tried to forget the warning pounding in his head. 
vexilla regius inferne prodeunt. Forth come the banners of the king of hell. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz Alleluia, Alleluia. Part 8 of a series in 15 parts Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz Here continues the Chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, and it came to pass during the abbacy of Paulo de Pecos that a time of much change was at hand. In the world of secular power, nation conspired against nation. The prince of our realm, Hannigan of Texarkana, plotted secretly that he might overthrow the rulers of Denver, and Laredo, and unite all in one empire under his sway. In the world of learning, the greatest sage of the time, Don Tadeo, was likewise intent on bringing all knowledge under his sway. To that end, he set forth to journey unto us, that he might reap in our memorabilia the harvest of twelve centuries of our toil. For our task it had been since the world was laid waste long ago, and all skills and wisdom destroyed. Our task, to preserve whatever was left in writing of the ancient lore, against the day when it might once more be understood. Even in the world of religion, here in this community, there was change. For one of the brethren, Cornhower by name, had fashioned a new method of making light, which he called electrical essence, Nevertheless, the old ways endured. Still the divine office was chanted daily, and still the holy rule observed. Still the prayers went up for the redemption of the world. And still, daily, a prayer more ancient yet went up in the desert nearby, from the lips of a hermit, Benjamin Eliezer, a Jew great in years, who prayed ever for the redemption of Israel. And there was between this hermit and our Lord Abbot, Paulo de Pecos, an abiding friendship. Unquote. The old hermit stood at the edge of the mesa and watched the approach of a dust speck across the desert. Could it be? I, I, he muttered I, 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 words and chuckled softly into the wind. His withered hide was burned the color of old leather by the sun, and his brushy beard was stained yellow about the chin. He wore a basket hat and a loincloth of rough homespun, 
that resembled burlap. His only clothing except for sandals and a goatskin water bag. Maybe. Oh! Suddenly, he went down the arroyo like a cat with three legs, using his staff, bounding from stone to stone and sliding most of the way. The dust from his rapid descent plumed high on the wind and wandered away. At the foot of the mesa, he settled down to wait. Soon, a pony appeared from around the bend. The hermit blinked angrily. Ah! It's not him! Recognition dawned. Sure, it's you, Paolo. I thought you'd be dead by now. What are you doing out here? I brought back your prodigal, Benjamin. <laughs> and I thought I'd pay you a visit. The animal belongs to the poet. He won it fairly in a game of chance. Although he cheated miserably. <laughs> Take it back to him and let me counsel you against meddling in worldly swindles that don't concern your good day. Benjamin, Benjamin, are you really going back up that hill without even saying a hello for an old friend? Hello. <laughs> you needn't look so hurt. It's been five years since you troubled to come this way, old friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Benjamin. Benjamin, I, I, I would have come. I, I have not been free. Well... Paolo, since you're here... <laughs> it's good to see you, you old grump. Aye, a grump. Well, I'm getting cranky too, I guess, Paolo. The last century has been a trying one for me. I hear you've been throwing rocks at my novices who come hereabouts for their Lenten fast in the desert. Hmm? Can this be true? Uh, only pebbles. <laughs> Miserable old pretzel. Now, now, Paolo. One of them mistook me for a distant relative of mine, name of Leibowitz. He thought I'd been sent to deliver him a message. Or oh, some of your other scalawags thought so. I don't want it to happen again, so I throw pebbles on him sometimes. Mistook you for whom? St. Leibowitz, now, Benjamin, you're going too far. Mistook me for a distant relative of mine, name of Leibowitz, so I throw pebbles at them. St. Leibowitz has been dead a dozen centuries. How could you... Oh, 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 now, Benjamin, let's don't start that tail wagging again. You haven't lived 12 centuries. Nonsense. I didn't say it happened 12 centuries ago. It was only six centuries ago, long after your saint was dead. That's why it was so preposterous. Of course, your novices were more devout in those days and more credulous. I think uh, Francis was that one's name, uh, poor fellow. I buried him later. Told them in your home where to dig for him. That's how you got his carcass back. The abbot gaped at the old man as they walked through the mesquite toward the water hole, leading the horse and the goat. Francis. Francis? Could that be the venerable Francis Gerard of Utah? Found the old fallout shelter in the village after a pilgrim told him where to look. About six centuries ago. And now here's old Benjamin claiming to have been the pilgrim. Where did Benjamin pick up enough knowledge of the Abbey's history to invent such tales? From the poet, perhaps. <laughs> that was during my earlier career, of course, and perhaps such a mistake was understandable. Earlier career? Wanderer. Uh, how do you expect me to believe such nonsense? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The poet believes me. Undoubtedly, the poet certainly would never believe that the venerable Francis met a saint. That would be superstition. The poet would rather believe he met you six centuries ago. A purely <laughs> natural explanation. <laughs> Abbot Paolo watched as Benjamin lowered a leaky cup into the well, emptied it into his water skin, and lowered it again for more. The water was cloudy and alive with creeping uncertainties, as was the old Jew's stream of memory. Or was his memory uncertain? Playing games with us all? Except for his delusion of being older than Methuselah, old Benjamin seemed sane enough. Want a drink? Thank you. Paolo accepted the cup. Must not offend. He drained the murky liquid at a gulp. Not very particular, are you? Wouldn't touch it myself. I collect it for the animals. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. You've changed, Paolo. 
grown pale as cheese and wasted. I've been ill. You look ill. Come up to my shack if the climb won't tire you out. Oh, I'll be all right. I had a little trouble the other day, and our physician told me to rest. Uh Uh-huh. If an important guest weren't coming soon, I'd pay no attention. But he's coming, so I'm resting, and it's quite tiresome. (laughs) Riding ten miles across the desert is resting? For me, it's rest, and I've... Been wanting to see you, Benjamin. Oh, what will the villagers say? They'll think we've become reconciled, and that will spoil both our reputations. Our reputations never have amounted to much in the marketplace, now have they? (laughs) Uh, True. For the present. Still waiting, old Jew. Certainly. The abbot found the climb tiring. Twice they stopped to rest. By the time they reached the mesa top, he was dizzy and leaning on the hermit for support. A dull fire burned in his chest, warning against further exertion. But there was none of the angry knot that had come before. This way, Paolo, to my mansion. It was a single room, windowless and stone-walled. Its rocks stacked loosely as a fence with wide chinks through which the wind could blow. I'll get you some milk. You can tell me about this Don Tadeo who's worrying you. You've heard of Don Tadeo? Tell me, how is it you've always managed to know everything and everybody without stirring from this hill? One hears, one sees. Tell me, what do you think of him? I haven't seen him, but I suppose he will be a pain. A birth pain, perhaps, but a pain. Birth pain? You really believe we're going to have a new renaissance, as some say? Uh Uh-huh. Now stop your smirking. I'll get you your milk. Tell me your opinion. You're bound to have one. You always do. Why is your confidence so hard to get? Aren't we friends? On some grounds, on some grounds. But we have our differences, you and I. What have our differences got to do with Don Tadeo and a renaissance we'd both like to see? Tadeo is a secular scholar and rather remote from our differences. Differences, secular scholars. I have been called a secular scholar at various times by certain people, and sometimes you've staked me and stoned me and burnt me for it. Here's your milk. Benjamin. Benjamin. Now, come on. I am Paolo. Torquemada is dead. I was born 70-odd years ago, and pretty soon I'll die. I have loved you, old man. And when you look at me, I... I wish you'd see Paulo of Pecos and no other. I, uh... Well, sometimes, uh... I forget. And sometimes you forget that Benjamin is only Benjamin and not all of Israel. Never for 32 centuries... Why? Why do you take the burden of a people and its past upon yourself alone? You fish in dark waters. Forgive me. The burden, it was pressed upon me by others. Should I refuse to take it? Drink your milk. Paolo drank. For a time there was no sound in the shanty but the sound of the wind. There was a touch of divinity in this madness, Paolo thought. The Jewish community was thinly scattered in these times. Benjamin had perhaps outlived his children or somehow become an outcast. Such an old Israelite might wander for years without encountering others of his people. Perhaps in his loneliness, he'd acquired the silent conviction that he was the last, the one, the only. And being the last, he ceased to be Benjamin, became Israel. And upon his heart had settled the history of 5,000 years, no longer remote, but become as the history of his own lifetime. And the last old Hebrew sat alone on a mountain and did penance for Israel and waited for a Messiah. God bless you for a brave fool, even a wise fool. Uh Uh-huh, wise fool. But you always did specialize in paradox and mystery, didn't you, Paolo? If a thing can't be a contradiction to itself, then it doesn't even interest you, does it? (laughs) You have to find threeness in unity, life in death, wisdom in folly. Otherwise, it might make too much common sense. (laughs) To sense the responsibility is wisdom, Benjamin. 
To think you can carry it alone is folly. Not madness? Oh. <laughs> a little, perhaps, but a brave madness. Then I'll tell you a small secret. I've known all along I can't carry it, ever since he called me forth again. But are we talking about the same thing? You would call it the burden of being chosen. I would call it the burden of original guilt. In either case, the implied responsibility is the same. Although we might tell different versions of it and disagree violently in words about what we mean in words by uh -huh. something that, that isn't really meant in words at all. Uh -huh. Since it's something that's meant in the dead silence of a heart. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear you admit it finally, even if all you say... Is that you've never really said anything. <laughs> <laughs> Stop tackling, you reprobate. <laughs> but you've always used words so worthily in crafty defense of your trinity. Although he never needed such defense before you got him from me as a unity, eh? Oh, Benjamin, you are... <laughs> there, there, I made you want to argue for once. <laughs> but, but, uh, never mind. I use quite a few words myself, and I'm never quite sure he and I mean the same thing either. I suppose you can't be blamed. It must be more confusing with three than with one. <laughs> you blasphemous old cactus. <laughs> <sighs> now, I really want your opinion of Don Tadeo and whatever's brewing. Why seek the opinion of a poor old hermit? Because Benjamin Eleazar Bar Joshua, if all these years of waiting for one who isn't coming haven't taught you wisdom, at least they've made you shrewd. Insult me, rail at me, bait me, persecute me, but do you know what I'll say? Mm, you'll say, uh huh. No, <laughs> I'll say he's already here. I caught a glimpse of him once. What? Who are you talking about? Don Tadeo? No. Moreover, I do not care to prophesy unless you tell me what's really bothering you, Polo. Well, it all started with Brother Cornhoe's lamp. Lamp? Oh, yes. The poet mentioned it. He thought it wouldn't work. The poet was wrong. It worked. It worked, then. Splendid. And that started what? Me wondering. How close are we to the brink of something? Or, or how close to a shore? Electrical essences in the basement. Do you realize how much things have changed in the past two centuries? Benjamin. Benjamin, just think. Since the flame deluge, the memorabilia has been our special province, Benjamin. And we've kept it. But now I, I sense the predicament of the shoemaker who tries to sell shoes in a village of shoemakers. It could be done if he makes a better shoe. I'm afraid the secular scholars are already beginning to claim such a method. Then go out of the shoemaking business before you are ruined. A possibility. It's unpleasant to think of it, though. For twelve centuries, we've been one little island in a very dark ocean, keeping the memorabilia. We've always been bookmakers and memorizers, and it's hard to think the job's soon to be finished, soon to become unnecessary. I can't believe that somehow. So you try to best the other shoemakers by building strange contraptions in your basement? I must admit it looks that way. What will you do next to keep ahead of the seculars? Build a flying machine? Or revive the machina analytica? Or perhaps step over their heads and resort to metaphysics? You shame <laughs> me, old Jew. You know we are monks first, and such things are for others to do. I wasn't shaming you. I see nothing inconsistent in monks building a flying machine, although it would be more like them to build a praying machine. <laughs> ah, wretch. I do my order a disservice by sharing a confidence with you. I have no sympathy for you. The books you stored away may be hoary with age, but they were written by children of the world, and they will be taken from you by children of the world, and you had no business meddling with them in the first place. Ah, now you care to prophesy. Not at all. Soon the sun will set. Is that prophecy? <laughs> no, it's merely an assertion of faith in the consistency of events. The children of the world are consistent too. So I say they will soak up everything you can offer, take your job away from you, and then denounce you as a decrepit wreck. Finally, they'll ignore you entirely. It's your own fault. <laughs> the book I gave you should have been enough for you. Now you'll just have to take the consequences for your meddling. <sighs> but pay me no mind. I'll not venture to soothsay before I've seen this contraption of yours or taken a look at this Don Tadeo, who begins to interest me, by the way. 
Wait until I've examined the entrails of the new era in better detail if you expect advice from me. Well, you won't see the lamp because you never come to the Abbey. It's your abominable cooking I object to. And you won't see Don Tadeo because he comes from the other direction. If you wait to examine the entrails of an era until after it's born, it's too late to prophesy its birth. Nonsense. Probing the womb of the future is bad for the child. I shall wait... And then I shall prophesy that it was born and that it wasn't what I'm waiting for. Oh, what a cheerful outlook. So what are you looking for? Oh, someone who shouted at me once. Shouted? Come forth! Oh, what rot. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, to tell you the truth, I don't much expect him to come. But I was told to wait, and I wait. <laughs> Paolo. Bring this done today or past the foot of the mesa. <laughs> A coster of pilgrims, molester of novices. I shall send you the poet, and may he descend upon you and rest forever. Bring the don past your lair. <laughs> what an outrage. Very well. Forget I asked. But let's hope this don will be on our side and not with the others this time. Others, Benjamin? Manasseh, Cyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh, Caesar, our own King Hannigan. Need I go on? Samuel warned us against them, then gave us one. When they have a few wise men chained nearby to counsel them, they become more dangerous than ever. That's all the advice I'll give you. Well, Benjamin, I've had enough of you now to last me another five years, so... Insult me! Rail at me! Bait me! Oh, stop it. I'm leaving, old man. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> so? And how is the ecclesiastical belly fixed for the light? My stomach. Hmm? Huh? It's a mess, of course. How else would it be after listening to you? <laughs> <laughs> true, true. El Shaddai is merciful, but he is also just. Godspeed, old man. <laughs> After Brother Cornhoe reinvents the flying machine, I'll send up some novices to drop some rocks on you. <laughs> <laughs> they embraced affectionately. Oh, God with you, God. The old Jew led him to the edge of the mesa. Benjamin stood wrapped in a prayer shawl, its fine fabric contrasting with the rough burlap of his loincloth, while the abbot climbed down to the trail and rode back toward the abbey. Paolo could still see him standing there at sundown, his spindly figure silhouetted against the twilight sky. Be mindful, O oh Lord, of all thy servants, and may he finally win the poet's glass eye at Mumley Peg. Amen. the Abbey, a messenger from New Rome. I can tell you definitely, Father Abbot, there will be war. Dear God. All Laredo's forces are committed to the plains. Mad Bear has broken camp. There's a running cavalry battle, nomad style, all over the plains. Mm. But the state of Chihuahua is threatening Laredo from the south. So, Hannigan is getting ready to send Texarkana forces to the Rio Grande to help defend the frontier mm. with the Laredans' full approval. Of King Garaldi is a doddering fool. Wasn't he warned against Hannigan's treachery? The Vatican Diplomatic Service always respects state secrets if we happen to learn them. Uh -huh. Lest we be accused of espionage, we're always careful of Was them. he warned? Well, of course. Garaldi said the papal legate was lying to him. The idiot even told Hannigan about the legate's warning. Dear God. So, Hannigan did what? Monsignor Apollo is... is under arrest. Hannigan ordered his diplomatic files seized. There's talk in New Rome of placing the whole realm of Texarkana under interdict. So, now Marcus Apollo. And what of Dom Tedeo? Hmm. Hannigan looks out for his own. I don't know how, but I'm sure that Don will get here. But I must point out. This region may be in danger of being overrun in the not-too-distant future. Mm. Steps should be taken to secure the Abbey within the next few months. Now, I have instructions to discuss with you the problem of keeping the memorabilia safe. We kept the barbarians outside our walls for a thousand years. This Abbey has been under siege three times. 
We'll keep the books safe. We've kept them that way for quite some time. But there is an added hazard these days, my lord. And what may that be? A bountiful supply of gunpowder and grape shot. On the Feast of St. Bernard, the watchtower reported seeing a thin and distant dust trail. From the top of the wall, Paolo blinked and squinted across the hot, dry terrain, trying to focus myopic eyes on the distance. Dust from the horses' hooves was drifting away to the north. The party had stopped out there. I seem to be seeing 20 or 30 of them. Are there really so many, Father Galt? Approximately. Hmm. How will we ever take care of them all? I don't think we'll be taking care of the ones with the wolf skins, my lord abbot. Wolf skins? Well, they're not all nomads, Domney. Oh? The group split in two. The larger party galloped back toward the east. The remaining horsemen watched briefly, then reined round and trotted toward the abbey. Six or seven of them, some in uniform. The Don and his party, I'm sure. Well, I'd better go welcome them, Father. By the time Abbot Paolo had come down from the wall, the travelers had reined up just outside the courtyard. A horseman detached himself from the others, tried to fall, dismounted, and presented his papers. Bowing slightly, Paolo greeted him. Welcome in the name of St. Leibowitz, Don Tadeo. Welcome in the name of his abbey, in the name of 40 generations who've waited for you to come. Be at home. We serve you. The words had been saved for many years while awaiting this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tadeo mumbled something in reply. Paolo looked up into the scholar's icy eyes. They were cold and searching gray. Skeptical, hungry, proud. That this moment might be as a bridge across a gulf of twelve centuries, Paolo had prayed. Prayed, too, that through him St. Leibowitz, the last martyred scientist of that earlier age, would clasp hands with tomorrow. There was indeed a gulf. That much was plain. Paolo felt that he belonged not to this age at all. That he had been left stranded somewhere on a sandbar in Times River and that there wasn't really ever a bridge at all. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next, but one thing is sure. When the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz Alleluia, Alleluia. 
Part 9 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the chronicle, set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, and it came to pass in the reign of Hannigan of Texarkana that the king's cousin, Don Tadeo, a mighty man of learning, journeyed unto our abbey with cavalry for his safe passage. And he came to us that he might further his learning, for in our library we had kept as memorabilia all of the ancient writings that had not perished in the flame deluge twelve centuries before. And in these writings was much set down that he who skilled himself to interpret might profit by. Yea, even one of our order, Brother Cornhor, had himself done this before Don Tadeo came. For the brother searched out the secrets of electrical essence, and made a great light therewith, by the which the Don was much astonished when he saw it. To Don Tadeo and his men-at-arms the ways of our order were strange. Neither understood they the rule on which those ways do rest, nor did they comprehend the faith on which resteth the rule. One only law did Tadeo revere, and the name of that law was science. Upon science, said he, must all knowledge rest, and only upon science. All knowledge of man and the natural world, from the beginning unto now, all knowledge and all keeping of chronicles. Wherefore we pray God that Tadeo came to a better understanding ere he died. Unquote. One night after Vespers, the abbot sat at supper with Don Tadeo and the other guests. The custom at supper was for all to sit silently and listen while they ate to a reading. This night, Abbot Paolo de Pecos had ordained a reading from the book De Bello Tertio Mundi, which chronicles the War of the Flame Deluge. Now, even as in the time of Job, when the sons of God came to stand before the Lord, Satan also was present among them. And the Lord said to him, Whence comest thou, Satan? And Satan answering said, as of old, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to him, Hast thou considered that simple and upright prince, my servant, name, that hateth evil and loveth peace? And Satan answering said, Doth name fear God for naught? Hast thou not blessed his hand with great wealth and made him mighty among nations? But stretch forth thine hand a little and decrease what he hath and let his enemy be strengthened. Then see if he blasphemeth thee not to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold what he hath and lessen it. See thou to it. And Satan went forth from the presence of God and returned into the world. Now the prince's name was not as holy Job, for when his land was afflicted with trouble, and his people less rich than before, when he saw his enemy become mightier, he grew fearful, and ceased to trust God, thinking unto himself, I must strike before the enemy overwhelmeth me without taking his sword in his hand. And so it was in those days that the princes of earth had hardened their hearts against the law of the Lord, and of their pride there was no end. And each of them thought within himself that it was better for all to be destroyed than for the will of other princes to prevail over his. For the mighty of the earth did contend among themselves for supreme power over all. By stealth, treachery, and deceit they did seek to rule, and of war they did fear greatly and tremble, for the Lord God 
had suffered the wise men of those times to learn the means by which the world itself might be destroyed. And into their hands was given the sword of the archangel, wherewith Lucifer had been cast down, that men and princes might fear God and humble themselves before the Most High. But they were not humbled. And Satan spoke unto a certain prince, saying, Fear not to use the sword, for the wise men have deceived you in saying that the world will be destroyed thereby. Listen not to the counsel of weaklings, for they fear you exceedingly, and they serve your enemies by staying your hand against them. Strike, and know that you shall be king over all. And the prince did heed the word of Satan, and he summoned all of the wise men of that realm, and called upon them to give him counsel as to the ways in which the enemy might be destroyed without bringing down the wrath of his own kingdom. But most of the wise men said, Lord, it is not possible, for your enemies also have the sword which we have given you, and the fierceness of it is as the flame of hell and as the fury of the sun's star from whence it was kindled. Then thou shalt make me yet another, which is seven times hotter than hell itself, commanded the prince, whose arrogance had come to surpass that of Pharaoh. And many of them said, Nay, Lord, ask not this thing of us, for even the smoke of such a fire if we were to kindle it for thee, would cause many to perish. Now the prince was angry because of their answer, and he suspected them of betraying him, and he sent his spies among them to tempt them and to challenge them, whereupon the wise men became afraid. Some among them changed their answers, that his wrath be not invoked against them. Three times he asked them, and three times they answered, Nay, Lord, even your own people will perish if you do this thing. But one of the Magi was like unto Judas Iscariot, and his testimony was crafty, and having betrayed his brothers, he lied to all the people, advising them not to fear the demon fall out. The prince heeded this false wise man, whose name was Blackeneth, and he caused spies to accuse many of the magi before the people. Being afraid, the less wise among the magi counseled the prince according to his pleasure, saying, The weapons may be used, only do not exceed such and such a limit, or all will surely perish. And the prince smote the cities of his enemies with the new fire. And for three more days and nights did his great catapults and metal birds rain wrath upon them. Over each city a sun appeared and was brighter than the sun of heaven. And immediately that city withered and melted as wax under the torch. And the people thereof did stop in the streets, and their skins smoked, and they became as paper thrown on the coals. And when the fury of the sun had faded, the city was in flames, and a great thunder came out of the sky like a great battering ram to crush it utterly. Poisonous fumes fell all over the land, and the land was aglow by night with the afterfire, and the curse of the afterfire, which caused a scurf on the skin, and made the hair to fall, and the blood to die in the veins. And a great stink went up from earth, even unto heaven. Like unto Sodom and Gomorrah was the earth and the ruins thereof. 
even in the land of that certain prince. For his enemies did not withhold their vengeance, sending fire in turn to engulf his cities as their own. The stink of the carnage was exceedingly offensive to the Lord, who spoke unto the prince name, saying, What burnt offering is this that you have prepared before me? What is this savor that arises from the place of holocaust? Have you made me a holocaust of sheep or goats, or offered a calf unto God? But the prince answered him not. And God said, You have made me a holocaust of my sons. And the Lord slew him, together with Blackeneth the betrayer, and there was pestilence in the earth, and madness was upon mankind, who stoned the wise people together with the powerful, those who remained. But there was in that time a man whose name was Leibowitz, who in his youth, like the holy Augustine, had loved the wisdom of the world more than the wisdom of God. But now, seeing that great knowledge, while good, had not saved the world, he turned in penance to the Lord, crying, The abbot rapped sharply on the table, as was customary. The young monk who'd been reading the ancient account fell silent. And the silence prevailed during the remainder of the meal. Later, in the abbot's study, Tadeo questioned Paolo. And that is your only account of it, Lord Abbot? No, oh, there are several versions. They differ in minor details. Mm -hmm. No one is certain which nation launched the first attack. Not that it matters anymore. Mm. The text Brother Reader was just reading was written a few decades after the death of St. Leibowitz. Probably one of the first accounts, after it became safe to write again. Mm -hmm. The author was a young monk who had not lived through the destruction himself. He got it second-hand from St. Leibowitz's followers, the original book preservers. And he had a liking for scriptural mimicry, <laughs> as do we all. <laughs> I doubt if a single completely accurate account of the flame deluge exists anywhere. Once it started... It was apparently too immense for any one person to see the whole picture. Mm. In um, what land was this prince called uh, Name and this man Blackeneth? Mm, not even the author of that account was certain. Mm. We've pieced enough together since that was written to know that even some of the lesser rulers of that time had got their hands on such weapons before the Holocaust came. The situation he described prevailed in more than one nation. Mm. Name and Blackeneth were probably legion. Of course, I've heard similar legends. It's obvious that something rather hideous came to pass. But, uh, when may I begin to examine, uh, what do you call it? The memorabilia. Of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, would tomorrow be too soon? Oh, you may begin at once, if you like. Feel free to come and go as you please. Tadeo asked to begin in the library, so Brother Cornhoer planned a surprise. A demonstration of his electrical essence generator. Three monks stood behind the new machine, their hands tucked in their sleeves. A fourth monk stood at the foot of the stairs. A fifth monk stood on the landing and watched the entrance to the stairway. He's coming! A low hiss from the stairway. Four monks manned the treadmill. A fifth climbed the shelf ladder, took his seat on the top rung, pulled a mask over his face to protect his eyes, felt for the lamp fixture and its thumb screw. Brother Cornhoer directed the activity. And God said, let there be light. The treadmill team set their shoulders to the turnstile beams. And God saw the light, that it was good. The axle creaked. The wagon wheel dynamo began to spin as the monks strained at the drive mill. And God called the light day. 
Paolo Tadeo, Tadeo's clerk, descended the stairs. Contact! Oh! Oh! Incredible. Must be an ancient. But no. Unthinkable. Tadeo moved forward. What a strange machine. Touching nothing, asking nothing, peering at everything. The wire. He wandered about the machinery, inspecting the dynamo, the wiring, the lamp itself. Another corn whore. Talk to him. You like it, Lord Abbott? It's ghastly. Oh, it's hellish. Well, it is rather bright. It's a shocking way to treat a guest. Father Abbott. Yes, Don Tadeo. How have you managed to keep it hidden all these centuries? After all the years, I've tried to arrive at a theory of... Why have you hidden it? Well, well you misunderstand, Don Tadeo. The Brother Cornhorn, for the love of God, explain. The abbot tried to make amends. It had put Tadeo in the position of a mountaineer who'd scaled an unconquered height only to find a rival's initials carved in the summit rock. And the rival hadn't told him in advance. It must have been shattering for him. Yes, 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 yes. Tadeo gave no sign of rancor, even offered apology, after the inventor of the device had given an account of its recent design and manufacture. But the apology succeeded only in convincing the abbot further that the monks had blundered. And the blunder was serious? Yes, 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 yes. Paolo would have removed the lamp from the basement immediately. But Tadeo insisted he liked it, only to discover then that it was necessary to keep at least four novices at work cranking the dynamo and adjusting the arc gap. So he begged, remove the lamp, please. But then it was Paolo's turn to become insistent that it remain in place. A situation which caused the poet to versify about the demon embarrassment and the outrages he perpetrated in the name of penitence or appeasement. <laughs> For several days, Tadeo and his clerk studied the library itself, the files, the monastery's records, apart from the memorabilia, as if by determining the validity of the oyster, they might establish the possibility of the pearl. Inspection of the premises, though, was more than academic, and that did not escape the abbot's attention. Father Galt, why are they making detailed drawings of our fortifications? Well, I hadn't heard of it, Lord Abbot. You mean Dom Tadeo? No. The officers who came with him. They're going about it quite systematically. How did you find out? The poet told me. The, the poet? Oh, Lord. Unfortunately, he's telling the truth this time. He pickpocketed one of their sketches. You have it? No, no. I, I made him return it. Mm. But I don't like it. It's ominous. Why do you suppose they're making the drawing? Unless we find out otherwise, we'll assume their interest is professional. As a walled citadel, the abbey is a success. It's never been taken by siege or assault, and perhaps their professional admiration is aroused. Come to think of it, if an army meant to strike west across the plains, they'd probably have to establish a garrison somewhere in this region before marching on Denver. And here, they'd have a fortress ready-made. I'm afraid that that's occurred to them. Hmm. What do you do? Uh, I, I, I don't know yet. Father, why not talk to Tadeo about it? He's Hannigan's kinsman. He has influence. Hmm. I'll try to think of a way to approach him. Hmm. For a while, though, we'll watch what's going on. In the days that followed, Tadeo completed his study of the oyster and satisfied it was not a disguised clam, focused his attention on the pearl. The task was not simple. Quantities of facsimile copy were scrutinized. Then chains rattled and clanked as the more precious books came down from their shelves. Then the actual manuscripts dating back to Leibowitz's time, long sealed in barrels, locked in special storage vaults. Then they were pulled out. After the fifth day of it, 
Tadeo's manner resembled that of a hungry hound catching scent of red meat. Magnificent! Look, Brother Cornhor, fragments from a 20th century physicist. Uh huh. The equations are even consistent. Oh, yes. I've seen that. I could never make head or tail of it. Is the subject matter important? I'm not sure yet, but the mathematics is beautiful. Beautiful. Look, here. This expression. Uh huh. It's lovely. This simple looking expression is so deceptive. How so? It represents not one, but a whole system of equations in a very contracted form. Oh. It took me a couple of days to realize the author was thinking of the relationships, not just of quantities to quantities, but of whole systems to other systems. I see. I don't know all the physical quantities involved, but the sophistication of the mathematics is just. just. Quietly superb, Father. If this is a hoax, it's inspired. Yes. If it's authentic, we may be in unbelievable luck. I must see the earliest possible expression of it. Brother Arm Brewster groaned as yet another lead-sealed barrel was rolled out of storage. What did you say? He wants another one. To Arm Brewster, the custodian of the memorabilia, each unsealing meant anguish. His task in life was the preservation of books. Usage was secondary, to be avoided if it threatened longevity. Paolo relaxed as he watched Tadeo's earlier skepticism melt away. The community has been curious about your labor, Don Tadeo. Oh, would it、uh, would it be possible for you to tell us something about it in、uh, the general terms that non-specialists might understand? You'd like me to explain the work in the simplest possible language? Something like that, if it's possible. Well, that's just it. You know, Father, the untrained man reads a paper on natural science and thinks, "Now, why couldn't he explain this in simple language?" He can't seem to realize that what he tried to read was the simplest possible language for that subject matter. In fact, a great deal of natural philosophy is simply a process of linguistic simplification, an effort to invent languages in which, say, half a page of equations can express an idea which could not be stated in less than a thousand pages of so-called simple language.、Uh, do I make myself clear? Perfectly. Perfectly, and and since you do make yourself clear, perhaps you could tell us about the work then, unless the suggestion is premature. Well, no, we now have a fairly clear idea of where we're going and what we have to work with here. The pieces have to be fitted together, and and they don't all belong to the same puzzle. But I I have no objection to explaining the general scope. But、uh, what bothers you? Only.、Uh, An uncertainty about my audience. I I would not wish to offend anyone's religious beliefs. But how could you? Well,、uh, many people's ideas about the world have become coloured with religious.、Uh, well, what I mean is. But if your subject matter is the physical world, how could you possibly offend, especially this community? We've been waiting for a long time to see the world start taking an interest in itself again, and at the risk of seeming boastful, I, I might point out that we have a few rather clever amateurs in natural science right here in the monastery. There's Brother Majek. I don't think you've met him yet, but and then of course you know Brother Cornhoer and Cornhoer. Yes, now that I just can't understand. The lamb. But but surely no no no, you... no 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 not the lamb. It's Cornhoer himself. I don't understand. That gadget of his is a standing broad jump across about twenty years of preliminary experimentation. Cornhoer just dispensed with the preliminaries. Do you believe in miraculous interventions? I don't. But there you have a real case of it. Wagon wheels. <laughs> What could he do if he had a machine shop? I can't understand what a man like that is doing cooped up in a monastery. Perhaps Brother Cornhoer could explain that to you. Yes,、uh, well,、um, if you really feel no one would take offense at hearing、uh, non-traditional ideas, I'll be glad to discuss our work. Good. It should be fascinating. A time was agreed upon, and Paolo felt relief. The gulf between Christian monk and secular investigator of nature would surely be narrowed by a free exchange of ideas. But then, 
Prior Galt reminded him natural science was not the only field in which research was going on. You can't ignore the officers, Father Abbott, and their sketchbooks. And Satan spoke unto a certain prince, saying, Fear not to use the sword, for the wise men have deceived you in saying that the world would be destroyed thereby. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Alleluia, alleluia, part 10 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues The Chronicle. Set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, in the year of our Lord 3174, King Hannigan of Texarkana, ever zealous of his own increase, schemed to conquer the realms of Denver and Laredo. Moreover, he yearned to bring under his yoke the warrior tribes of the Great Plains, and this might he only do if they were made weak. Therefore he diseased their cattle, for he was a cunning man. Now in that same year there came unto our abbey the king's cousin, Don Tadeo, a mighty sage. He came that he might read our ancient texts, yea, very ancient, for we had held them safe twelve hundred years since the time of the flame deluge. Don Tadeo hoped to read our books, learn the ancient skills, and profit therefrom. Now this Don Tadeo had come unto the abbey attended by men-at-arms, that he might travel safely. And these soldiers did make in secret drawings of our walls and fortifications, that they might propose later unto the king that he take our abbey for himself, and make of it a mighty fortress for his wars. They hoped that none would see them make these drawings. But the poet saw them, he who lived at that time in the guesthouse. And the poet told the abbot. Unquote. One night, Abbot Paolo made a feast at high table for Tadeo and the military officers. When supper was done, Tadeo was to speak about his work and that of other scientists. Candlelight blanched the faces of the robed monks, who stood motionless behind their stools and waited for the beginning of the evening meal. The abbot made an announcement. The rule of abstinence for today is dispensed at tonight's meal. We shall have guests, as you may have heard. All religious may partake of tonight's banquet in honor of Don Tadeo and his group. You may eat meat. And conversation, if you'll keep it quiet, will be permitted during the meal. The abbot glanced at the table set for himself, Father Galt, the honored guest, and his party. 
bad arithmetic in the kitchen again. Eight places had been set. Three officers, the Don and his assistant. Two of us, that makes seven. Paolo took his place at the table, glanced toward the entrance. Father Galt should be bringing them in. Previously, the visitors' meals had been served in the guest house rather than the refectory to avoid subjecting them to the austerity of the monk's own frugal fare. When the guests came, Paolo Sorry. counted again. Still seven. Why the eighth place setting, Father Galt? Search me, my lord. Tadeo filled the place on the abbot's right, and the others fell in toward the foot of the table, leaving the place on Paolo's left empty. During the blessing, Someone slipped quietly into the seat on the abbot's left. Amen. Sedete. The abbot glanced sharply at the figure. Oh, it's no. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Learned Don, distinguished hosts. Oh, now what are we having tonight here? Hmm? Roast fish and honeycombs in honor of the temporal resurrection. That's upon us. Oh, dear God. <laughs> or have you, my lord Abbot, finally cooked the goose of the mayor of the village? <laughs> May I remind the poet. <laughs> Such culinary excellence one enjoys in this place, Don Tadeo. Uh -huh. Ah, yes, fine. You should join us more often. I do hope Brother Chef has his usual gusto tonight, his inward flame, his enchanted touch. <laughs> Perhaps we shall have his inspired... Mock pork with maize a la Friar John. <laughs> that sounds interesting. What is it? Mm -hmm. Greased armadillo with parched corn <laughs> boiled in donkey milk. It's a regular Sunday special. <laughs> Poet, oh, I apologize for his presence done today. Oh, he was not invited. My Lord Hannigan, too, keeps several court fools. I'm familiar with the species. You needn't apologize for him. Uh, allow me instead to apologize for the abbot, sire. Well, mind you, I suppose you'd be right not to accept my apology for him. Poet, right, before I throw you out, let's probe the depths of your own. Oh, it's pretty deep, all right. <laughs> apologize. <laughs> On behalf of my Lord Abbot, Apologize. Drop it, Father Gold. Drop it. Oh, that's all right, my lord. I don't mind apologizing for you in the least. You apologize for me. I apologize for you. And isn't that a fitting maneuver in charity and goodwill? <laughs> Nobody need apologize for himself. Which is always so yummy. <laughs> if you would but allow me to serve as your humble helper, my lord, you would never have to eat your own crow. Uh, for example, I might apologize to important guests for the existence of bedbugs. <laughs> And to bed bugs for the abrupt change of fare. <laughs> well, I would assume all the blame for you, of course. It's a fine system. One I was prepared to make available to you, too, most eminent scholar. My system of negotiable and transferable apologetics would have been a particular value to you, Don Tadeo. Who would have been a value to me? Ah, yes, it's such a pity. Somebody stole my blue-headed goat. Blue-headed goat? Oh, he had a head as bald as Hannigan's, you brilliance. And blue as the tip of Brother Armbruster's nose. <laughs> I meant to make you a present of the animal, but some dastard filched him before you came. <laughs> Do we need a blue-headed goat? I wasn't where we had a pressing need for a blue-headed goat. But the need is obvious. They say you're writing equations that will one day remake the world. They say a new light is dawning. If there's to be light, then somebody will have to be blamed for the darkness that's past. Ah, <laughs> then the goats. A sickly jest, Abbot Paolo. Is he the best you can do? You'll notice he's unemployed. No, 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 no. Let us talk of something You sensible. mistake my meaning, your brilliance. The goat is to be enshrined and honored, not blamed. Crown him with the crown St. Leibowitz sent you, and thank him for the light that's rising. Then blame Leibowitz and drive him into the desert. That way you won't have to wear the second crown, eh? the one with thorns. <laughs> Responsibility, it's called. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> and when your patron's army comes to seize this abbey, the goat can be placed in the courtyard, taught how to bleat. There's been nobody here but me. Nobody here but me. Whenever a stranger comes by. Why, you... C Captain Joseph. <laughs> Ah, the captain's a fighter as well as a draftsman. Uh -huh. Your sketches of the Abbey's defenses show much promise of artistic growth. I predict one day your drawing of the underwall tunnels will be hung in a museum. <laughs> <beautiful fire. laughs> captain Josard, you will kindly sit down. Let me now! No! You, poet, will excuse yourself from table. Now! 
Oh, well, if I must, I must, but never let it be said that a poet abdicated his responsibilities. Vigilance, your brilliance, eternal vigilance. I shall leave my glass eye here on the table as a sort of substitute to scrutineer. <laughs> oh, good evening, my lords. Colonel... I suggest you and the lieutenant take Captain Josard back to his quarters and sit on him till he cools off. At once, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Don Polo. I'm deeply ashamed that such a thing could have come about. No, no, it, it, it is my fault. I, I should have had the poet thrown out as soon as he showed up. He provoked the whole thing, and I failed to stop it. The, the provocation was clear. Provocation by the fanciful lie of a vagrant fool? Josard reacted as if the poet's charges were true. Oh, then, then you don't know that your soldiers are preparing a report on the military value of our abbey? What? Can this be true? Yes. And you've permitted us to stay? We keep no secrets here. Your companions are welcome to make such a study if they wish. I would not presume to ask why they want the information. The poet's assumption, of course, was merest fancy. Oh, of course. Surely your prince has no aggressive ambitions? Surely not. And even if he did, I'm I'm sure he would have the wisdom, or, or at least the wise counselors, to lead him to, to understand that our abbey's value as a storehouse of knowledge is greater than its value as a fortress. Father Abbott, we'll speak of this again before I leave. A pall had fallen on the banquet. But it began to lift during the group singing in the courtyard after the meal. So when the time came for the scholars' lecture in the great hall, embarrassment seemed to have ended. Paolo led Tadeo to the lectern. My Lord Abbot... Reverend fathers and brothers, I have been amazed at what we have found here. A few weeks ago, I would not have believed, did not believe that documents such as you have in your memorabilia could exist. It's still hard to believe. For, for example, here is a uh, quotation I found downstairs from a four-page fragment of a book which may have been an advanced physics text. A few of you may have seen it. Quote, If the space terms predominate in the expression for the interval between event points, the interval is said to be space-like, since it's then possible to select a coordinate system in which the events appear simultaneous and therefore separated only spatially. If, however, the interval is time-like, the events cannot be simultaneous in any coordinate system, but there exists a coordinate system in which the space terms will vanish entirely, so that the separation between events will be purely temporal, it is occurring at the same place, but at different times. Uh, has anyone here looked at that reference lately? Anyone ever remember seeing it? <laughs> anyone know what it means? <laughs> it's followed by a page and a half of mathematics, which I won't try to read. But it treats some of our fundamental concepts as if they weren't basic at all, but evanescent appearances that change according to one's point of view. It ends with the word therefore, and the rest of the page is burned, and the conclusion with it. The reasoning is impeccable, however, and the mathematics quite elegant, so I can write the conclusion myself. Brothers, it seems the conclusion of a madman. It began with assumptions, however, which appeared equally mad. Now, this is only one example of the many enigmas posed by these papers you've kept so long. Papers describing systems which touch our experience nowhere. Were they within reach of the ancients? Certain references tend to indicate it. One paper refers to elemental transmutation. 
which we just recently established as theoretically impossible. And then it says, experiment proves. But how? It may take generations to understand some of these things. I, I'm sure you realize your present facilities are inadequate, not to mention inaccessible to the rest of the world. Uh, how, however, that uh, problem isn't what you asked me to talk about this evening. I, I merely mention it because it's been so fortunate for me to have access to your materials. Now, one of my current preoccupations is the nature of light. Particularly, its refrangibility, it, uh, its uh, uh, bendability, breakability. And some of your texts are proving very helpful. Uh, by the way, I hope none of this offends anybody's religious beliefs. Why? Uh, uh, big pardon? Why? Why, uh, Abbot Paolo? What is there about the refrangible property of light that you thought might be offensive to religion? Well, I... Uh, Monsignor Apollo, whom you know, grew quite heated on the subject. He, uh, he said that light could not possibly have been refrangible before the flood because the rainbow was <laughs> so <frozen. laughs> <laughs> Monsignor Apollo is a good man, Don Tadeo, a, a good priest. But all men are apt to be incredible asses at times, especially outside their domains. <laughs> I'm sorry I asked the question. <laughs> well, the answer relieves me, my lord abbot. I seek no quarrels. Uh, well, um, if there are no further questions, uh, perhaps I should uh, spend a moment telling you a little about the Collegium. I must say, the picture, as I see it, seems very encouraging. We're flooded with applicants who want to study with us. In fact, the Collegium is assuming an educational function as well as an investigative one. Interest in natural science is on the increase, and our work is being liberally endowed. These are symptoms of revival and renaissance. A very widespread renaissance. Studies are being undertaken in many fields. Now, to mention a few, Don Vichemotin, investigating the possibilities for the artificial production of ice. Don Frieder Haug, seeking to transmit messages by electrical variations along a wire. And, in addition to these studies, Don Menoma is heading a project which seeks further information about the origin of the human species. Now, since this is primarily an archaeological task, he asked me to search your library for any suggestive material on the subject. However, perhaps I'd better not dwell on this at any length, since it's tending to cause controversy among the theologians. But if, if there are any questions... Uh, uh, sir? Uh, yes? Uh, sir, I was wondering if you were acquainted with the suggestions of St. Augustine uh, on that subject. Uh, I am not. Uh, he was a fourth-century bishop and philosopher. He suggested that in the beginning, God created all things in their uh, germinal causes, uh, including the physiology of man, and that the, uh, uh, the germinal causes inseminate, as it were, the formless matter, which then gradually evolved into the more complex shapes, and eventually man. Has this hypothesis been considered? I'm afraid it has not, but I, I shall look it up. Thank you. Uh, now, perhaps the most daring research of all is being conducted by my friend Don Esser Schon. It is an attempt to synthesize living matter. Don Esser hopes to create living protoplasm using only six basic ingredients. Now, this work could lead to... Uh, uh, Yes, uh, you, you have a question, Brother Armbruster? If you would do an old man the kindness, this uh, Don Esser Sean, who uh, limits himself to, what is it, six basic ingredients? I was wondering, are they permitting him to use both hands? <laughs> Why, I... Uh... And uh, may, may I also inquire... Whether this remarkable feat is to be performed from the oh, sitting or standing or prone position, <laughs> or perhaps on horseback while playing two trumpets. <laughs> Brother Armbruster, you have been warned. You are excommunicated from the common table until you make satisfaction. You may wait in the chapel. Uh, yes, yes, my lord. Yes, yes, my lord. Yes. Yes, well, 
so much for that. In conclusion, a brief outline of what the world can expect, in my opinion, from the intellectual revolution just beginning. Ignorance has been our king. Tomorrow, a new prince shall rule. Men of science shall stand behind his throne, and the universe will come to know his might. His name is Truth. His empire shall encompass the earth, and the mastery of man over the earth shall be renewed. A century from now, men will fly through the air in mechanical birds. There will be buildings of 30 stories, ships that go under the sea, machines to perform all works. And how will this come to pass? In the same way, all change comes to pass, I fear. It will come by violence and upheaval, by flame, by fury. For no change comes calmly over the world. <coughs> it will be so. We do not will it so. Ignorance is king. Many would not profit by his abdication. Many enrich themselves by means of his dark monarchy. They are his court, and in his name they defraud and govern, enrich themselves and perpetuate their power. Even literacy they fear, for the written word is another channel of communication that might cause their enemies to become united. Their weapons are keen honed. They use them with skill. They will press the battle upon the world when their interests are threatened. And the violence which follows will last until the structure of society as it now exists is leveled to rubble. And a new society emerges. I am sorry, but that is how I see it. The words brought a new pall over the room. Paolo's hopes sank. It seemed to Deo knew the military ambitions of Hannigan. He had a choice. To approve them, disapprove them, or to regard them as impersonal phenomena beyond his control. Evidently, he accepted them as inevitable. How can he escape his own conscience? and disavow responsibility. But then the words came back to him. For in those days, the Lord God had suffered the wise men to know the means by which the world itself might be destroyed. He had also suffered them to know how it might be saved, and as always let them choose for themselves. And perhaps they had chosen as Tadeo was choosing, to wash their hands before the multitude. There was silence. Half the community was staring toward the entrance. Father God? What, what is it? An old man with a beard and shawl, my lord. It looks like... No. He wouldn't come here. Benjamin? The figure stirred. It drew its shawl tighter about spindly shoulders and walked slowly into the light. It stopped again, muttering to itself as it looked around the room. Then, leaning on a crooked staff, the old apparition moved slowly toward the lectern, never taking its eyes from Tadeo, who, when no one stirred or spoke, grew pale as the decrepit vision approached. The face of that bearded antiquity blazed with hopeful ferocity. His eyes twitched over Tadeo. His mouth quivered and smiled. He reached out one trembling hand toward the scholar and stared, hopefully, into the scholar's eyes. Oh. Then a great sigh, as hope vanished. 
the knowing smirk of the old Jew of the mountain spread over his face. He turned, faced the community, spread his hands, and shrugged. It's still not him! As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich. And that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. A Canticle for Leibowitz Alleluia, Alleluia, Part 11 of a series in 15 parts Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz Here continues the Chronicle Set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, now come we to the last year of the abbacy of Paulo de Pecos. It was in this year that soldiers made drawings of our abbey's fortifications, whereby Abbot Paulo was anxious in his heart. He knew how quickly King Hannigan would usurp the monks and take the abbey unto himself as a fortress for the king was ever avid of empire. Now these soldiers were come here as escorts, attending the king's cousin from the palace at Texarkana, and this cousin, Don Tadeo, was a great scholar, come hither for study. For in our library, unread by the world and uncomprehended for the most part by us, there reposed the memorabilia. These were the written words, such as had escaped burning, which yet remained from the days before the flame deluge, when almost all knowledge ceased, as did almost all of life. And that was twelve hundred years ago. Only now, in Don Tadeo, was there at last a scholar sufficient in skill and cunning to draw out from these writings their hidden lore and give it back to the world. Unquote. During the tenth week of Tadeo's visit, a messenger from New Rome, King Garaldi, head of the dynasty of Laredo, demanded Texarkana troops evacuate his realm forthwith. Don Tadeo and Abbot Paolo listened to the messenger with astonishment. Then Paolo sadly shook his head. Whatever possessed the old fool, surely he must have realized what the consequences would be. Well, if he didn't, my lord abbot, he very soon found out. 
He died of poison that night. Oh, dear God. And a state of war was proclaimed between Laredo and Texarkana. Presumably a fairly short-lived war. Yes, Don Tadeo. I think you can assume the war ended the day after it began. And that Hannigan now controls all lands and peoples from the Red River to the Rio Grande. There's more. Hannigan II, by grace of God, Mayor, Viceroy of Texarkana, Defender of the Faith, ha! and Vaquero Supreme of the Plains... After finding Monsignor Marcus Apollo guilty of treason... Dear God! ...has caused him to be hanged. Oh, what? And then, while still alive, cut down, drawn, quartered, and flayed. I need hardly add, Texarkana is under interdict by papal decree. Mm. Any news of Hannigan's countermeasures? No, not yet. What a tragic affair. Uh, but, Paolo, I think I ought to offer to leave at once. Why, Tadeo? You don't approve of Hannigan's actions, do you? Oh, no. Between ourselves, I condemn them. But in public, there is the collegium to think of. If it were only a question of my own neck, well... I understand. Rumors kept coming from the plains. The cattle plague was sweeping like wildfire among the herds of the nomads. Famine seemed imminent. What remained of Laredo's scattered forces were being wiped out by hit-and-run assaults of Mad Bear, who was thirsty for vengeance against those who brought the plague. The gulf between Paolo and Tadeo kept widening. Tadeo hastened to finish his work. Well, Abbot Paolo, my work is nearly finished here. We'll be leaving in a very few days. Aren't you worried about the fighting on the plains, Tadeo? We're to camp at a butte about a week's ride east from here, and a group of, uh, uh... Our escort will meet us there. I do hope your escort group hasn't reversed its political allegiance since you made the arrangements. It's getting hard to tell friend from foe these days. Especially if they come from Texarkana, you mean? I didn't say that. Let's be frank with each other, Father. I can't fight Hannigan. He makes my work possible, no matter what I think of his policies or his politics. I appear to support him superficially, or at least overlook him, for the sake of the Collegium. Now, if he extends his lands, the Collegium may profit. If the Collegium prospers, mankind will profit from our work. The ones who survive, perhaps. True. But that's always true. No. No, twelve centuries ago, not even the survivors profited. Must we start down that road again? Well, what can I do about it? Hannigan is prince, not I. But you promised to begin restoring man's control over nature. Who will use that control? To what end? How will you hold him in check? Such decisions can still be made, but if you and your group don't make them now, others will soon make them for you. Mankind will profit, you say, but by whose sufferance? The sufferance of a prince who signs his letters X? Or do you really believe that your collegium can stay aloof from his ambitions when he finds out you're valuable to him? What you really suggest is that we wait a little while. That we dissolve the collegium or move it to the desert and then somehow, with no gold, no silver of our own, revive science in some slow, hard way and tell nobody that we save it all up for the day when man is good and pure and holy and wise. Now, that is not what I meant. Oh, that is not what you meant to say, but that is what you're saying means. Keep science cloistered. Don't try to apply it. Don't try to do anything about it until men are holy. Well, it won't work. You've been trying it here in this abbey for generations. We but... haven't withheld anything. Oh, no, you haven't withheld it, but you, you, you sat on it so quietly nobody knew it was here. You did nothing with it. But haven't you heard about Isaac Edward Leibowitz? Do you see his statue over there in the corner? Haven't you heard about a scientist like yourself who founded this order? He founded it in order to save what could be saved of the records of that civilization. Saved from what, though? And for what? Look. Look at this statue. Look at it. See where it's standing. See the kindling. Books. Books for kindling. Yes. They didn't just burn intellectuals in the great simplification. They burnt books and everything else that stood for any kind of knowledge. That's how little the world wanted your science then. And for centuries afterward. So he died for our sake. When they drenched Leibowitz and the books with fuel oil, legend says, he asked for a cup of it. They thought he mistook it for water, so they laughed and gave him a cup. 
He blessed it and said, This is the chalice of my blood. And he drank it before they hanged him and set him on fire. Shall I read you a list of all the martyrs? Shall I name all the battles we fought to keep these records intact? Father. All the monks blinded in the copy room for your sake. Yet you say we did nothing with it, withheld it by silence. Not intentionally, but in effect you did. And for the very motives you imply should be mine. If you try to save wisdom until the world is wise, Father, the world will never have it. I can see the misunderstanding is basic. To serve God first, or to serve Hannigan first, that's your choice. I have little choice, then. Would you have me work for the church? Thursday within the octave of all saints. Tadeo and his clerk, preparing to leave, sorted their notes and records in the library. Overhead, the arc lamp still sputtered and glared. The team of novices pumped wearily at the hand-powered dynamo as the novice atop the ladder kept the light adjusted. And Don Tadeo had a proposition for Brother Cornhoer. You and I, Brother Cornhoer, we'd make a good team. I wish you'd join me, at least for a while. Do you think your abbot would grant you leave? Oh, I would not presume to guess. Now, I I've heard mention of brothers on leave. Brothers working on leave have kept the rest of us from starving at times, but it's seldom done. Of course, we have a few brothers studying in New Rome now. But... Ah, now that's it. A, a scholarship at the Collegium. Yes? There'd be a stipend. I I'm sure your abbot could put that to good use. Well, I don't know. Father, you don't seem pleased. I'm flattered, of course. But such matters are not for me to decide. Well, I understand that, but I, I wouldn't dream of asking your abbot if the idea displeased you. My, my vocation is to religion. However, if Abbot Paula were to send me... I see you would reluctantly come. Look, I'm sure I could get the Collegium to send your abbot at least a hundred gold pieces a year while you were with us. Oh. Uh, but, pardon me, did I say something wrong? Meanwhile, in his study, Paolo fought the pain in his gut. And a knock at the door brought the prior with more bad news. I'm sorry to disturb you, Reverend Father, but it's a matter of some urgency. I've just come from the infirmary. Yes? It's Brother Claret, Monsignor Apollo's clerk. Claret? You mean he escaped? They didn't kill him with Marcus? Well, they may have meant to, and God knows how he made it all the way here. He's in pretty bad shape. Will he live? Touch and go. Brother Pharmacist isn't too hopeful. As far as I can gather, they tortured him to get evidence against Marcus. From one or two things he let drop, I'd say he blames himself for what happened. Anyway, I, I thought you ought to see this. It's a document he had in his pocket, a, a copy of a proclamation by Hannigan. All right, let's hear it. The point of it is, uh, uh, in this sentence, uh, we, the only legitimate ruler over the church in this realm, hereby declare to our loyal people that Pope Benedict XXII is a heretic, murderer, sodomite, and atheist. Who serves him serves not us. Dear God. Uh, the rest, uh, uh, it's mostly gobbledygook. Uh, except just at the end, uh, there's another big take heed, and then he orders the licensing of the clergy, makes the administration of the sacraments by unlicensed persons a crime, and makes an oath of supreme allegiance to him a condition for licensing. Uh, that's it. Signed with his mark. In the library, Tadeo, eyes of fire with exuberance, pulls Brother Cornhoer aside. Brother Cornhoer. Yes? I have located a source here that should, I think, be of interest to Don Mayo. Now, of course, I know his Don story. Don Mayo? Uh, is he the one who's uh, trying to correct Genesis? Yes. Uh, that is... Uh, well, that's all right. Uh, some of us feel Genesis is more or less allegorical. Well, what have you found? Now, we located one fragment from before the flame deluge that suggests a very revolutionary concept. Now, if I interpret the fragment correctly, man was not created until shortly before the flame deluge. What? 
Then where did civilization come from? Well, not from humanity. It was developed by a preceding race, which became extinct during the flame deluge. But Holy Scripture goes back thousands of years before the diluvium. You're proposing that we're not the descendants of Adam? Not related to historical humanity? Then wait, I, I only offer conjecture that the pre-flame deluge race, which called itself man, succeeded in creating life. Now, shortly before the fall of their civilization, they successfully created the ancestors of present humanity, uh, after their own image, as it were, as a servant species. But even if you totally reject revelation, that's a completely unnecessary complication under plain common sense. Well, it might seem so, until you consider how many things it would account for. Well, you know the legends of the simplification. They all become more meaningful, it seems to me, if one looks at the simplification as a rebellion by a created servant species against the original creator species, as the uh, fragmentary references suggest. Now, it would also explain why present-day humanity seems so inferior to the ancients, why our ancestors lapsed into barbarism when their masters were extinct, Dear why the... Oh, uh... Uh, but, Paolo, I was just explaining... I that... heard. I heard. God have mercy on this house. Spare us, Lord. We knew not what we did. I should have known not to... So do... we are but creatures of creatures, then, sir philosopher. Made by lesser gods than God, and therefore understandably less than perfect. Through no fault of ours, of it course. It is only conjecture, but it would account for much. And absolve of much would it not. Man's rebellion against his makers was no doubt merely justifiable tyrannicide against the infinitely wicked sons of Adam. I did not say Show that... Show me, <laughs> sir philosopher, this amazing reference. Uh, uh, here it is. You found this over in the unclassified section, I believe? Yes, but it... And if you'd bothered to look up the cross-reference in the unclassified card index, you would have seen that it came from a play about robots by an author named Chapek, about the creation of artificial people as slaves and their eventual revolt against their makers. A play. And more to the point, Tadeo. If you were devoted to the idea of open-minded scientific inquiry, you would consider all available sources, including the one and only source that survived complete. You might choose to disagree with our evaluation of it, but it is a primary source. There's no question of that. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. My remarks were only conjecture. Now, freedom to speculate is necessary to and the invention. And the Lord God took man and put him into the paradise of pleasure to dress it and to keep it. And God commanded To speculate him. is necessary to the advancement of science. Now, if you would have us hampered by blind adherence, unreasoned dogma, then you would prefer to and leave the God world And God commanded the... him, saying, Of every tree of paradise thou shalt eat, but of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil thou shalt not Then eat. you'd prefer to leave the world in the same black ignorance and superstition that you say your order has thou struggled against. Thou shalt not eat. For in what day soever thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt die but the death. But then we could never overcome famine, disease, or misbirth, or, or make the world one bit better than it has been for twelve centuries. And the serpent said, God doth know that in what day soever thou shalt eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But the world will be no better than it's been for twelve centuries if every direction of speculation is to be closed off and every new thought denounced. Today, oh, it never was any better. It never will be any better. It will only be richer or poorer, sadder, but not wiser until the very last day. You see, I knew it. I knew, I knew you would be offended, but you told me, oh, what's the use? You have your own creation account. The account you... I was quoting, Sir Philosopher, was not an account of the manner of creation, but an account of the manner of temptation that led to the fall. Yes, yes, but the freedom to speculate is essential. No one has tried to deprive you of that, nor is anyone offended. But to abuse 
The intellect, for reasons of pride, vanity, or escape from responsibility, is the fruit of that same tree. You question the honor of my motives? Uh, at times, at times I question my own. I accuse you of nothing. Ask yourself this. Why do you take delight in leaping to such a wild conjecture from so fragile a springboard? Why do you wish to discredit the past, even oh. to dehumanizing the last civilization? Oh, damn it, damn it, damn it! All these records should be placed in the hands of competent people! Get! Uh. That brought the dynamo to a stop. The brothers operating it were too shocked to continue. What is it? What's happened to the light? I think they just gave up on it. Bring candles. And you, brother, up there on top of the ladder, come down. And bring that, that, that lamp with you. Now, sir philosopher, if you can make it out by candlelight, read this. From Hannigan? A proclamation. Read it and rejoice in your cherished freedom. Ah, and whosoever reads in this alcove henceforth, let him read Ad Lumina Christi. So, so done, Tadeo. You read it. Yes. If by some unlikely chance you'd like political asylum no, here... No, no, thank you. Then may I ask you to clarify your remark about placing our records in competent hands? It was said in the heat of the moment I retract it. But you haven't stopped meaning it. You've meant it all along. So, will you be leaving today or tomorrow? Today, I think, would be better. When you get back... Deliver a message. Of course. Say that anyone who wishes to study here will be welcome, in spite of the poor lighting. Don Mayo especially, or, or Don Nesta Schoen, with his six ingredients, tell them, too, that when the time comes, as it will, that not only priests, but scientists are in need of sanctuary. Tell them our walls are thick out here. Paolo turned and trudged up the stairs to be alone in his study, for the knot was tightening his guts again. Lord, now let us know thy servant depart in peace. He wanted Father Galt to hear his confession. Better, though, to wait till the guests had gone. Can you come back later? I'm afraid I won't be here later. Oh, done today. Come, come in. I thought it only proper to... to leave you these. What do we have here? Sketches of your fortifications. The ones the officers made. I suggest you burn them immediately. Why... Why, why have you done this after our words downstairs? Oh, don't misunderstand. I would have returned them in any event. If I had returned the sketches any sooner, the officers would have had plenty of time and opportunity to draw up another set. <sighs> Don Tadeo, I... I promise no effort on your behalf. I, I know. Because I think what you have here should be open to the world. It is. It was. It, it always will be. They shook hands. Tadeo left. No truce. Only mutual respect between foes. Perhaps it would never be more. But why must it all be acted again? The answer was near at hand. There was still the serpent whispering, For God doth know that in what day soever you shall eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods. The old father of lies, clever at telling half-truths. <laughs> How shall you know good and evil until you have sampled a little? 
taste and be as gods. But infinite power couldn't bestow godhood on men, nor could infinite wisdom. For that, there'd have to be infinite love as well. Paolo summoned Galt. It was very nearly time to go. From the place of ground zero, oh Lord, that was the year of the unprecedented torrent of rain on the desert, causing seed long dry to burst into bloom. From the curse of the fault. That was the year that a vestige of civilization came to the nomads of the plains, and even the people of Laredo began to murmur that it was possibly all for the best. New Rome did not agree. From the beginning of it was the year that the old Jew returned to his former vocation of physician and wanderer. The year that the monks of the Order of Leibowitz buried an abbot and bowed to a new one. From the reign of the it was the year a king came riding out of the east to subdue the land and own it. It was a year of man, a year of carnage, the first of many hundreds. Then, after the generations of the darkness, came the generations of the light. And they called it the year of our Lord, 3781, a year of his peace. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Alleluia, alleluia, part 12 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the Chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, now in the year of our Lord 3781, it befell that the whole world was loud with rumors of war. Moreover, this was a war which would be great and terrible, yea, even such as would bring an end to the world. Nor was this new, for long ago mankind had fought such a war, and only a few survived. And out of that destruction little knowledge remained, save only what we preserved of the ancient writings, here in this abbey, 
as our memorabilia. And from these writings, in the fullness of time, six centuries since, there arose much of the old knowledge again, the secrets of the power called atomic, and the small machines for swift counting, and the large machines for journeying to the stars. But with this knowledge, alas, there rose not up wisdom. As ever of old, one nation is enemy unto another, and none can say, certainly, will the peace hold. Indeed, all there is is uncertain. Save only this, should war come, it is not like to cease until it has run its course. And that being done, farewell world. Wherefore it is apt that those who con the auguries of war have appointed to signal in secret the first news of battle being joined, three words, three words that recall the eldest war of all. Lucifer is fallen. The signal flashed across the continent, whispered in conference rooms, circulated in memoranda marked top secret, and withheld from the press. The words rose in a threatening tide behind a dike of official secrecy. There were several holes in the dike, but the holes were plugged by bureaucratic Dutch boys whose fingers became exceedingly swollen. At the airport, one of the Dutch boys, the Minister of Defense, was caught by several reporters. Minister, do you yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Mr. Minister, yes. what is your comment on Sirish Donberger's statement that the radiation count on the northwest coast is ten times the normal level. I have not read the statement. Well, assuming it to be true, what could be responsible for such an increase? The question calls for conjecture. Perhaps Sirish discovered a rich uranium deposit. No, strike that out. I have no comment. Sorry, sir, 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 sir. Yes. Sir, thank you, sir. Do you, do you regard Sirish as, a, as a, a competent, responsible scientist? He's never been employed by my department. Well, that is not a responsive answer, sir. It is quite responsive, since he has never been employed by my department, and I have no way of knowing his competence or responsibility. I am not a scientist. Uh, but, sir, you have answered. Yes. Is it true? that a nuclear explosion occurred recently somewhere across the Pacific. As Madam well knows, the testing of atomic weapons of any kind is a high crime, an act of war under international law. We are not at war. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, Mr. Minister, it does not. I did not ask if a test had occurred. I asked whether an explosion had occurred. We set off no such explosion. If they set one off, does Madam suppose this government would be informed of it by them? Uh, no, sir, that does not. Yes. Uh, Mr. Minister. Yes. A delegate Jerulian has charged the Asian coalition with the assembly of hydrogen weapons in deep space. And he says our executive council knows it and does nothing about it. Is that true? I believe it is true that the opposition's tribune made some such ridiculous charge, yes. Well, why is the charge ridiculous? Because they're not making space to Earth missiles in space, or because we are doing something about it? Ridiculous either way. I should like to point out, however, that the manufacture of nuclear weapons has been prohibited by treaty ever since they were redeveloped. Prohibited everywhere, in space or on Earth. Well, there's no treaty to prescribe the orbiting of fictional materials, is there? Well, of course not. Space-to-space -space vehicles are all nuclear-powered. They have to be fueled. And there's no treaty to prohibit orbiting of other materials from which nuclear weapons might be manufactured? To my knowledge, the existence of matter outside our atmosphere has not been outlawed by any treaty or act of parliament. It is my understanding that space is chock full of things like the moon and the asteroids, which are not made of green cheese. Oh, sir, 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 sir. Yes. At the risk of seeming droll, what is your opinion of the weather? <laughs> <laughs> Rather warm in Texarkana, isn't it? I understand they're having some bad dust storms in the southwest. We may catch some of it hereabouts. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sir, are you in favor of motherhood? <laughs> I am sternly opposed to it, madam. It exerts a malign influence on youth, particularly upon young recruits. The military services would have superior soldiers if our fighting men had not been corrupted by motherhood. <laughs> May we quote you on that? Certainly, madam. But only in my obituary, not soon. Oh, thank you, sir. I'll prepare it in advance. <laughs>
Meanwhile, out in the desert of the southwest, at the Leibowitz Abbey, the abbot Dom Zerke de Pecos struggled against his nature. I am myself without machines capable of scribing multitudinous languages, but this machine, when I need it, is not available to me. Confound it! Abbot Zerke was not a contemplative man, oh, this machine as a monk or as a leader. Approach it. He'd made vows to I'm cultivate contemplative work. life in I'm his flock. Person. And in himself, scribe multitudinous languages. He was not very good at either of these. I am confounded, confounded. Nature pushed him toward action, even in thought. His mind refused to sit still and contemplate. A quality of restlessness made him a bolder leader, sometimes even a better one than some of his predecessors. But it was also a liability. Even a vice. Oh, no, not again. In fact, on bad days, the abbot could not control his temper. Lights go, but nothing happens. Or nothing happens, and lights go. Or the lights don't work, and it works. Or the machine doesn't work, and the lights go on. Today was such a day. It was the autoscribe's fault, of course. This malignant machine was on the blink again. It miscapitalized, mispunctuated, misheard, and misread. Maybe it's Miss Wired. Well, how would I know if it was Miss Wired? Follow code pattern of wire A black to area black, red to red. What is this? Caution. Tweaking and tugging at connections in a search for loose wires, uh, he was assaulted leads to by a high voltage capacitor, which had discharged itself to ground through the Reverend Father Abbott's person. Brother Pat. Oh. Shall I call the repair service again, Father Abbott? Mm, help me off the floor first. Why bother with the repair service? You called them three times. They've made three promises. We've waited three days. Yes. I need a stenographer. Now, preferably a Christian. That thing is a damned infidel, or worse. Yes. Get rid of it. I want it out of here. Uh, the autoscribe? The autoscribe. Sell it to an atheist. No, that, that wouldn't be kind. Sell it as junk. I'm through with it. Well, Domine, it is convenient to be able to write letters in languages you yourself cannot speak. It is? You mean it would be? That contraption? Come here. Yes. Listen, brother. They claim it thinks. I didn't believe it at first, but you know what? What, Father? Nothing could be that perverse without premeditation. It must think. It must know good and evil. I tell you, it, it chose the latter. <laughs> Please take the smile off your face. Oh. It's not funny. Y yes, Father. I have got to get a radiogram off to New Rome. Well, shall I get my pad, Reverend Father? Do you speak Alleghenian? No, I don't. Neither do I, and Cardinal Hathstraff doesn't speak Southwest. Why not Latin, then? Which Latin, the Vulgate or modern? I don't trust my own Anglo-Latin, and if I did, he'd probably not trust his. Well, what are these little knobs? Don't, don't touch... Oh, you didn't move that, did you? Well, I, I might have wiggled it a little, but I, I think it's back where it was. Well, I hope so. Look up there. It says factory adjustments only. Oh. Well, let's try turning up this... What's this a uh, little bit? Brother Joshua used to be some kind of engineer. I forget what. But he was in space. They have to know a lot about computers. I've already called him. He's afraid to touch it. Yeah, maybe it needs to be wriggled a bit. Oh, here. Uh, if you'd excuse me, my lord. Oh, ye of little faith. I, I thought I heard someone outside. Before the cock crows thrice. Besides, you touched the first knob, didn't you? Well, but, but the cover was off and out, out, out. Before yes, I decide it was your fault. Yes, my lord. Well, there's some response here. Maybe he did something after all, something useful. So far, so good. No shocks. No. Factory adjustments only, indeed. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Radiogram. Dictate record. Southwest in. Allegheny and out. Microphone on.
priority urgent to Eric Cardinal Hofstraff, Vicar Apostolic, Extraterrestrial Provinces, Vatican, New Rome. Eminent Lord, in view of the recent renewal of world tension, hints of a new international crisis, and even reports of a clandestine nuclear armaments race, we should be greatly honored if your eminence deems it prudent to counsel us concerning certain plans held in abeyance. I have reference to the document of A.D. 3749 titled, Where the Flock Shall Wander. Our state of readiness with respect to this document has been maintained, and should it become desirable to execute the plan, we would need perhaps six weeks' notice. After he'd finished speaking, Dom Zerke no. pressed a button marked Process, Process. Text. And see what we have here. Oh. Oh. Seems to be... All right. Let's see here. Let's see some results. A red lamp blinked on. The machine was silent. With a glance at the factory adjustments only notice, the abbot closed his eyes and pressed a button marked readout. Hmm. He probably would have taken the voice playback on trust. His knowledge of Allegheny was nil. If his eye hadn't strayed to the simultaneous printout, what he saw there was his own message, untranslated, emerging backwards. What is that? And that was exactly what the voice playback was reading. I have seen numerous bizarre events out of this machine, but never have I seen anything like this! It's too much! Brother Pat! Hey, Pat! What's the matter, Reverend Father? Don't you like our modern technology? Not particularly, Brother Joshua. Where's Pat? He's out, my lord. Can't you fix this thing? Really? Really? Uh, no, I can't. Then I'll send a radiogram. I'm sorry, you can't do that either. They just padlocked the shack. They? The zone defense interior. All private transmitters ordered off the air. A defense alert? Why? There's talk about an ultimatum. That's all I know, except what I hear from the radiation counters. Still rising? Still rising. Call Spokane. I just did. I talked to Father Leone. They've noticed it, too. The increased radiation count. That's... Uh, that's not all. Well? It, it's connected with that seismic disturbance a few days ago. Uh-huh. It's carried by the upper winds from that direction. Now, all things considered, it, it looks like fallout from a low-altitude burst in the megaton range. Are you telling me that Lucifer has fallen? Yes, Domney, I'm afraid it was a weapon. Not possibly an industrial accident. No. But if there were a war on, we'd know. An illicit test? No, no, not that either. If they wanted to test, they'd do it on the far side of the moon, or better, Mars, and not be caught. I agree. So what does that leave? A threat? A warning shot fired over the bow? That's all I could think of. So that explains the defense alert. Still, there's nothing in the news except rumors and refusals to comment and dead silence from Asia. The shot must have been reported by the satellites. Unless... Well, I don't like to suggest this, but... Unless somebody's discovered a way to shoot a space-to-Earth missile past the satellites without detection. Until it's on the target. Is that possible? Well, there's been some talk about it. The government knows. The government must know. And yet we hear nothing. Nothing. We are being protected from hysteria. Isn't that what they call it? Maniacs! But the dike of secrecy broke. Several Dutch boys were swept away by the raging tide. The tide swept them right out of Texarkana to their country estates where they became unavailable for comment. Others remained at their posts and staunchly tried to plug new leaks. But the fall of certain isotopes in the wind created a universal byword, spoken on street corners and screamed by banner headlines. Lucifer is fallen. So the Minister of Defense, his uniform immaculate, his makeup unsmeared, and his equanimity unruffled, again met the press. This time the affair was televised throughout the Christian coalition. Abbot Zerke watched intently. 
Office Minister. Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister. Uh, Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Minister, yes. you seem rather calm in the face of the facts. Two violations of international law, both defined by treaty as warlike acts, have recently occurred. Doesn't that worry the War Ministry at all? Madam, as you very well know, we do not have a war ministry here. We have a defense ministry. Oh, no, really? And as far as I know, only one violation of international law has occurred. The question was based on a Near East neutralist account, which reported that the E-21 disaster was the result of an Asian weapon test underground which broke free. Yeah, right. And right. the same right. account said that the E-21 test was sighted from our satellites and immediately answered by a space-to-earth warning shot southeast of New Zealand. But, now that you suggest it, was the E-21 disaster also the result of a weapon test by us? Madam, you have my full denial if you must dignify the fantastic charge. The so-called Itawan disaster was not the result of a weapon test by us. Nor do I have any knowledge of any other recent nuclear detonation. Thank Sir, you. Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Minister, yes. Over here. Uh, Mr. Minister, what did happen in Itawan? I gather there was a subsurface nuclear detonation in the megaton range, and it got out of hand. It was obviously a test of some sort. Whether it was a weapon or, as some Asian fringe neutrals claim, an attempt to divert an underground river, it was clearly illegal, and adjoining countries are preparing to protest to the world court. Yes. Is there any risk of war? I foresee none. But, but the Asian coalition has threatened an immediate all-out strike against our space installations. No ultimatum has been delivered. The threat was for Asian home consumption, as I see it, to cover their blunder in Itawan. Yes. How is your faith in motherhood today, Mr. Minister? <laughs> I hope motherhood has at least as much faith in me as I have in motherhood. You deserve at least that much, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Zerky switched off the television. Dear God, are we helpless? Are we doomed to do it again and again and again? This time it'll swing us clean to oblivion. And why, for the love of God? Is the species congenitally insane? If we're born mad, where's the hope of heaven? Or isn't there any? Oh, dear God, forgive me. I don't mean that. Come in. A telegram from New Rome, Reverend Father. Answer to yours. Thank you. Brother Joshua here yet? Waiting outside, Dominic. Send him in. Yes, Reverend Father. I'll get him right now. He'll see you now. Yes, my lord. Brother Joshua, come in and shut the door. Since we lost our radio transmitter, I sent Brother Pat into town to contact New Rome by regular wire. The reply just came. It's about where the flock shall wander. You know what that is, don't you? Yes, my lord. Well, here's what they say. Where the flock shall wander to be activated immediately. Prepare cadre to leave within three days. Wait for confirming wire before departure. Report any vacancies in cadre organization. Begin conditional implementation of the plan. Eric Cardinal Hofstraff, Vicar Apostolic of Extraterrestrial Province. How much do you know about where the flock shall wander? I know what it is, Domini, but not in detail. Well, it started as a plan to send a few priests along with a colony group heading for Alpha Centauri. But during the last world crisis, Where the Flock Shall Wander became an emergency plan for perpetuating the church on the colony planets if the worst came to pass on Earth. We have a ship. A starship? No less, in New Rome, and we have the crew for it. Where? Right here. Here at the Abbey? Yes. But, but who... Oh, oh. But, Domney, my experience in space has been entirely in orbital vehicles, not in starships. Before Nancy died and I came here, I... I, I know all about that. There are others with starship experience. You know who they are. There are even jokes about ex-spacers who seem to feel a vocation to our order. You remember when you were a postulant how you were quizzed about your experience in space? Yes. You must also remember being asked about your willingness to go to space again, if the order asked it of you. Yes. And you were not wholly unaware that you were conditionally assigned to where the flock shall wander if it ever came to pass. I... I, I guess I was afraid it was so, my lord. Afraid? Suspected, rather. Afraid, too, a little. 
because I've always hoped to spend the rest of my life in the Order. As a priest? That? Uh, well, I, I haven't decided yet. Where the flock shall wander will not involve abandoning the Order. The Order goes too? And the memorabilia with it. The whole kid and... Well, where to? The Centaurus colony. How long would we be gone? If you go, you'll never come back. Yes, of course. Three questions. Don't answer now. Start thinking about them and think hard. First, are you willing to go? Second, do you have a vocation to the priesthood? Third, are you willing to lead the group? And by willing, I don't mean willing under obedience. I mean enthusiastic or willing to get that way. Think it over. You have three days to think. Maybe less. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love the Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Alleluia, alleluia, part 13 of a series in 15 parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, now during the abbacy of Dom Jethra Zerke, the world had come once more to enjoy its ancient heritage of skills and wealth. Nevertheless, the world had also come once more to the brink of a new war, and this would, with the new skills, destroy the world and all who lived therein. Moreover, this war was nigh begun. Great engines of battle had already rained down fire and destruction in more places than one, and only a frail truce stood between the possibility of life and the likelihood of death. If life on earth should perish, then the memorabilia, the memory of earth, must go where life remained, among the human colonies on distant stars. To that end there stood ready a starship primed and provisioned, and ready to depart should war itself follow upon the words, Lucifer is fallen, which words were to herald the probability of war. And lo, these words were already spoken. Outward in space, therefore, this vessel would journey, manned by monks of our order, skilled in the craft of such machines, and in the keeping of the memorabilia. The abbot searched in his mind who might best captain the ship, and it seemed good to him to choose one of the lay brethren, Joshua by name. Him, therefore, he bade consider the matter, to become the captain, and therewith to become a priest also, and bade him furnish an answer within three days. 
And as they went to supper, Abbot Zerki and Brother Joshua found in their path, at the door of the refectory, the peasant woman whose custom it was to bring unto the abbey for sale baskets of tomatoes. And this same woman, Mrs. Grails by name, was not as others are. For the world is much peopled with those born disfigured. Yea, and that long since, for eighteen centuries now, from the time of what men call the Third World War. And behold, Mrs. Grail's disfigurement was very grievous, for on her left shoulder she had a second head. It was a small head. It never opened its eyes. It gave no evidence of sharing in her breathing or her understanding. It rolled uselessly on one shoulder, blind, deaf, mute. Perhaps it lacked a brain. There was no sign of independent consciousness or personality. Her other face had aged, grown wrinkled, but the superfluous head had the features of infancy, although toughened by the gritty wind, darkened by the desert sun. Oh, e evening, evening, Father Zerke. A most pleasant evening to you. Well, hello, Mrs. Gray. Uh, and to you, brother. Good evening. Uh, a minute, Father. Only a minute for an old tomato woman, if you have it to spare. Why, of course, I'd be glad to talk to you. Here, Father, here. Take a little something for your poor boss. Oh. Here. No, <laughs> no, Mrs. Grails, you shouldn't feel oh, any no, no, need no, no, to no. do here, that. Here, take a bit. Take a bit. Oh, I know is how you always say by fret. But I be not so poor as you might think on me. And you do good work. Well, thank you, but I if can't. If you don't take, take of it, that no good man of mine will have it from me and do him the devil's work. Please, Miss. Here I sold my tomatoes, and I got my price near, and I bought my feed for the week, and even a play pretty for Rachel. Oh, I want you to have of it. All here. right, all right, thank you. Uh, now, Father, a minute more, and I'll keep you no longer. Surely. It's little Rachel I wanted to see you about. There's the baptism and the christening to be thought of. And I wish to ask you if you do the honor. M Mrs. Grails, go see your own parish priest. He should handle these matters, not I. I have no parish, only the abbey. Oh. Talk to Father Sello at St. Michael's. It has to be recorded in your own parish. Only as an emergency could I, I have I, 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 that I know. But I saw Father Sello. I brought Rachel to his church, and the fool of a man would not touch her. He refused to baptize uh, uh, Rachel? That he did, the fool of a man. And Mrs. Grails, he's no fool. I know him well. He must have his reasons for refusing. If you don't agree with his reasons, then see someone else. Talk to the pastor at St. Maisie's, perhaps. I and that, too, have I done. And there isn't a one anywhere as will have anything to do with all her. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll call Father Sello for you, but that's oh. all I can do. And we'll see you again, I'm sure. Oh, thank you kindly. And beg your shriveness for keeping you. Good night, Mrs. Grails. Oh, good night, Father. Good night, brother. Oh, good night, Mrs. Grails. Why were you staring at her like that, Brother Joshua? I thought it rude. Didn't you notice? Notice what? Then you didn't notice. Well, oh, let it pass. But who is Rachel? And why won't they baptize the child? Is she Mrs. Grail's daughter? That's what Mrs. Grail's contends, but there's some question as to whether Rachel is her daughter, her sister, or merely an excrescence growing out of her shoulder. Rachel? Her other head? Don't shout so she'll hear you yet. And she wants it baptized? Rather urgently, wouldn't you say? Seems to be an obsession. Well, how do they settle such things? I don't know, and I don't want to know. I'm grateful it's not up to me to figure it out. The old-timers say Rachel wasn't there when Mrs. Grails was born. Is that true? Perhaps. Some are willing to tell it under oath. How many souls has an old lady with an extra head, a head that just grew? Things like that cause ulcers in high places. Uh, what was it you noticed? I mean, why were you staring at her like that? It smiled at me. What smile? Her extra... Her, Rachel. She smiled. I, I thought she was going to wake up. Oh, come on. No, she smiled. You imagine it. Yes, my lord. Then look like you imagined it. Uh, I can't, my lord. Hmm. Let's go on inside.
In the refectory, no food had yet appeared. Tables were bare. Supper had been deferred. The abbot rapped for silence, then gestured his prior, Father Leahy, toward the lectern. The prior looked pained for a moment before speaking. In the event that an attack warning is sounded, the following brothers are to report immediately to Old Abbey Courtyard for special instructions. If no attack warning comes, the same brothers will report there anyway the day after tomorrow morning, right after matins and lords. Names, brothers Joshua, Christopher, Augustine, James, Samuel, Thomas, The monks listened with quiet tension. Morris, Carl, there were 27 Benedict, names in all, David, but no novices among them. Andrew, Chrysostom, Some were eminent Basil, scholars. Damasus, there were a janitor and a cook as well. Placidus, At first Hugh, hearing, one might assume Isaac, the names had been drawn Robert, from a box. Mark, By the time Father Leahy had finished the list, some of the brothers were eyeing each other curiously. And this same group will report to the dispensary for a complete physical examination tomorrow after Prime. Domni? Yes. <clears throat> Just one thing. Brothers, let us not assume there is going to be war. Let's remind ourselves that Lucifer has been with us, this time for nearly two centuries, and was dropped only twice in sizes smaller than Megaton. We all know what could happen if there's war. The genetic festering is still with us from the last time man tried to eradicate himself. Back then, in St. Leibowitz's time, maybe they didn't know what would happen. Or perhaps they did know but couldn't quite believe it until they tried it. Like a child who knows what a loaded pistol is supposed to do but who never pulled a trigger before. They had not yet seen a billion corpses. They had not seen the stillborn, the monstrous, the dehumanized. They had not yet seen the madness and the murder, the blotting out of reason. Then they did it, then they saw it. Now, now, the princes, the presidents, the presidiums, now they know with dead certainty. They know it, and they've kept the peace. My sons, they cannot do it again. Only a race of madmen could do it again. <laughs> the abbot paused. Someone had laughed. In the midst of silence, someone had laughed. Zerki frowned. An old man had laughed. An old fellow with a brushy beard stained yellow about the chin, wearing a burlap bag with armholes. <laughs> he continued to laugh at Serki. He looked old as a rain-worn crag. Who are you, if I may ask? Have I seen you somewhere before? I I, I don't quite understand. Uh, call me Lazarus. Lazarus? Zerki shrugged and signaled for the meal to begin. After supper, Lazarus limped off down the road, then paused to listen to the wind. The wind brought the throb of rocketry from the south. Ground-to-space interceptor missiles being fired into orbit. The old man gazed at the faint red disk of the sun while he leaned on his staff and muttered to himself, or to the sun. Omens. Omens. <sighs> that night was a troubled night. A night that belonged to Lucifer. It was the night of the Atlantic assault against the Asian space installations. In swift retaliation, 
an ancient city died. This is your emergency warning network, bringing you the latest bulletin on the pattern of fallout from the enemy missile assault on Texarkana. Outside of the disaster area, The following day, Brother Joshua found the abbot listening to the government radio. You sent for me, Domney? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sit down. In a surprise attack, the space forces of the Atlantic Confederacy last night struck at three concealed Asian missile sites located on the far side of the moon, known to be involved in a guidance system for space-to-earth missiles. It was expected the enemy would retaliate against our forces in space, but the barbarous assault on our capital city was an act of desperation which no one anticipated. A ceasefire order has been issued by the World Court with a suspended proscription involving the death sentence against the responsible heads of government of both nations. Being suspended, the sentence becomes applicable only if the decree is disobeyed. Special Bulletin. Our government has just announced its intention to honor the ceasefire for ten days if the enemy agrees to an immediate meeting of foreign ministers and military commanders on Guam. Ten days? It doesn't give us enough time. The Asian radio, however, is still insisting that the recent thermonuclear disaster in Itawan, causing some 80,000 casualties, was the work of an errant Atlantic missile, and the destruction of the city of Texarkana was therefore retaliation in kind. Where's the truth? What's to be believed? Or does it matter? When mass murder's answered with mass murder, there's no longer much meaning in asking whose axe is the bloodier. Evil on evil piled on evil. Was there any justification in our police action in space? How can we know? Certainly there was no justification for what they did. Or was there? We only know what that thing says, and that thing is a captive. The Asian radio has to say what will least displease its government. Ours has to say what will least displease our fine, patriotic, opinionated rabble, which is what the government wants it to say anyhow. So what's the difference? Dear God, there must be half a million dead if they hit Texarkana with the real thing. Oh, God of Jacob, God even of Cain, why do they do it all again? Forgive me, Brother Joshua, I'm, I'm raving. Are the brothers in the courtyard yet? About half of them were when I passed. Good. Now I want you to start looking over these, these plans for where the flock shall wander. Read the praises. Look at the table of organization. Read the procedural outline. You'll have to study the rest in detail, but later. Yes? This is robot operator six calling. Reverend Father Jethra Zerke Abbott, please. Speaking. Urgent priority wire from Sir Eric Cardinal Hofstraff. New Rome, shall I read? Yes, read the text of it. I'll send someone down later to pick up a copy. Text as follows. The flock is to undertake its journey. First part of work assigned to your order is to begin immediately. Please confirm receipt. Receipt acknowledged. Will there be a reply? Um, reply as follows. To His Eminence Eric Cardinal Hofstraff, obedient greetings from Jethra Zerke Abbott. Concerning the matters in question, I have now issued orders that the brethren who will be going forth shall this day be ready to be sent to New Rome by the first available flight. End of text. Out. So, Brother Joshua, you've read the crux of the plan. Are you ready to get nailed on it? I... I'm not sure I understand. I asked you three questions yesterday. I need the answers now. I'm willing to go. That leaves two to be answered. I'm not sure about the priesthood, Tommy. Look, look, you'll have to decide. An abbot will be elected by secret ballot of the professed, of course, but you are the most obvious choice if you have a vocation to the priesthood. Have you or haven't you? There's your inquisition, and the time's now, and a brief time it is, too. But, Reverend Father, I'm not through studying. It doesn't matter. Besides the 27-man crew, others are going, too. Six sisters and 20 children, some scientists and three bishops. They can ordain you when they feel you're ready. You'll be in space for years, you know. But we want to know whether you have a vocation, and we want to know it now. I don't know. Would you like a half hour? Would you like a glass of water? <laughs> I tell you, son, if you're going to lead the Brethren of Leibowitz, you'll have to be able to decide things here and now. Can you speak? Domney, I'm, I'm not certain. You can croak, anyhow. I don't think I'm able. Listen. None of us has been able. 
But we've tried, and we've been tried. It tries you to destruction, but you're here for that. This order has had abbots of gold, abbots of cold, tough steel, abbots of corroded lead, and none was able, although some were abler than others, some saints even. Oh, the gold got battered, the steel got brittle and broke, the corroded lead got stamped into ashes. Me, I've been lucky enough to be quicksilver. I spatter, but I, I run back together somehow. What are you made of, son? Puppy dog tails, and I'm scared, Reverend Father. <laughs> Take an hour to think. Uh, a drink of water, a, a drink of wind. Totter off a while. If it makes you seasick, throw up. If, if it makes you terrified, scream. If it makes you anything, pray. But come into the church before Mass and give us your answer. The order is fissioning, and the part of us that goes into space goes forever. Are you called to be its shepherd, or are you not? Go and decide. I guess there's no way out. Of course there is. You have only to say, I'm not called to it. Then somebody else will be elected, that's all. But go, calm down, and come to us in the church with a yes or a no. The darkness in the courtyard was nearly total. Only a thin sliver of light from under the church doors. Twenty-six of his brethren were in there waiting. He could see the red dot of the sanctuary lamp. Fire, kindled in worship, burning in praise. Fire, loveliest of the four elements of the world, and yet an element, too, in hell. It had also scorched the life from a city this night. How strange of God to speak from a burning bush. And of man to make a symbol of heaven into a symbol of hell. He peered up at the stars of morning. Well, there would be no Edens found out there, they said. Yet there were men out there now. Men who looked up to strange sun in stranger skies, gasped strange air till strange earth, where it was even less like paradise than earth had been. Fortunately for them, perhaps, the closer man came to perfecting for themselves a paradise, the more impatient they seemed to become with it and with themselves as well. When the world was in darkness and wretchedness, it could believe in perfection and yearn for it. But when the world became bright with reason and riches, it began to sense the narrowness of the needle's eye, and that rankled for a world no longer willing to believe or yearn. Well... They were going to destroy it again, were they? This garden earth, civilized and knowing. To be torn apart again that man might hope again in wretched darkness. And yet the memorabilia was to go with the ship. Was it a curse? It was no curse, this knowledge unless perverted by man, as fire had been this night. Oh, Lord, call me a priest. Call me abbot, even. Set me to watch over my brethren. Is Reverend Father really so sure of me as all that, to drop it on me in this way? He must be more certain of me than I am of myself. Lord? Lord. Dawn. Time to tell the abbot. And tell him what? Joshua started toward the church, slipped inside, and went to kneel next to the abbot. Well, Brother Joshua, 
are we to lay upon thee the burden of this office? If they want me, Reverend Father, I shall accept. You're certain? If they choose me, I shall be certain. Good enough. Thus it was settled. While the sun rose, a shepherd was elected to lead the flock. It wasn't easy to charter a plane for the flight to New Rome. By mid-afternoon, though, clearance had been granted, and Zerki said his farewells. Brethren, you are the continuity of the Order. With you goes the memorabilia. Wherever man goes, you and your successors will go, and with you the records and remembrances of 4,000 years and more. Be for man the memory of earth and origin. Remember this earth. Don't forget her. But never come back. If you ever come back, you might meet the archangel at the east end of earth, guarding her passes with a sword of flame. I feel it. Space is your home hereafter. God bless you. And pray for us. Goodbye, son. He moved God slowly among them, bless pausing you. to embrace and bless each one. God bless you, Dunson. He had spoken Goodbye, as if the son. destiny of Brother Joshua's group were you, as clear-cut as the prayers prescribed for God tomorrow's you, office. God bless but you, both he God and God they God knew God bless you, that he had only been reading the palm of a plan. For Brother Joshua's group was only beginning the first short lap of a long and doubtful journey, a new exodus from Egypt, under the auspices of a god who must surely be very weary of the race of man. Those who stayed behind had the easier part. Theirs was but to wait for the end and pray that it would not come. From the place of ground zero, Oh, Lord, deliver us from the rain of the cold. Oh, Lord, deliver us from the rain of the strong While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com.
a canticle for Leibowitz. Part 14 of a series in 15 parts, adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the chronicle, set down daily by the brethren. The brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, and it came to pass in the year of our Lord 3781 that the city of Texarkana was destroyed by mighty engines of battle, whereat many did fear that much war would ensue, even unto all nations, and would make an end to the earth. Nor was there only fear, but also great sickness, for the death which laid waste to Texarkana was borne beyond on the winds of heaven, making mortally ill many whom it touched. And of these doomed persons many came to our abbey, for it was not far distant. And there came likewise a mission of mercy to tend them. This mission served under the banner of the green star. And with this mission a doctor of medicine. And this physician did seek out Abbot Jethro Zerki, to ask his leave that they might tend the sick in our courtyard. This tending was to be of two kinds— all those not mortally sick would be given skilled care. But those certain to die would be given leave to die forthwith, without further pain, by means of a fatal draft. And this fashion of dying was by civil law lawful. Unquote. So said the doctor, Dr. Kors, who'd come to Abbot Zerke's office. Zerke, hands on hips, stared at him, eyes blazing. Due process, they call it. Due process of mass state-sponsored suicide with all of society's blessings. Well, it's certainly better than letting him die horribly by degrees. Is it, Dr. Kors, better for whom? The street cleaners? Better to have your living corpses walk to a central disposal station while they can still walk? Less public spectacle? A few million corpses lying around might start a rebellion against those responsible. And that's what you and the government mean by better, isn't it? I wouldn't know about the government. What I meant by better was more merciful. I have no intention of arguing theology with you. If you think you have a soul that God would send to hell if you chose to die painlessly instead of horribly, then go ahead and think so. Forgive me. I wasn't getting ready to argue theology with you. I was speaking only of this spectacle of mass euthanasia in terms of human motivation. The very existence of the Radiation Disaster Act, and like laws in other countries, is the plainest possible evidence that governments were fully aware of the consequences of another war. Are the implications of the fact meaningless to you, Doctor? Of course not. But for the present, we're stuck with the world as it is. And if they couldn't agree on a way to make an act of war impossible, then it's better to have some provision for coping with the consequences than to have no provision. Yes and no. Yes, if it's in anticipation of somebody else's crime. No, if it's in anticipation of one's own. And especially no if the provisions to soften the consequences are criminal too. Like euthanasia? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. I feel the laws of society are what make something a crime or not a crime, and there can be bad laws, ill-conceived, true. But in this case, I think we have a good law. If I thought I had such a thing as a soul, and there was an angry God in heaven, I might agree with you. You don't have a soul, Doctor. You are a soul. You have a body, temporarily. A semantic confusion. True, but which of us is confused? And are you sure? Let's not quarrel, Father. I'm not with the Mercy Cadre. I work on the exposure survey team. We don't kill anybody. We have two mobile units. We can bring them into your courtyard and start right to work. We'll take the obvious radiation cases and the wounded first. We treat only the most urgent cases. Our job's clinical testing. The sick ones get treatment at an emergency camp. Yes, and the sickest ones get something else at a mercy camp? Only if they want to go. Nobody makes them go. But you write out the permit that lets them go. Uh, I've given some red tickets, yes. I may have to this time. Here, this is one. Read it. Tells the man he's sick, very sick. Estimated exposure in radiation units, blood count, urinalysis, and the fine print. It's directly quoted from public law, 10 WR 3E. It has to be there. The law requires it. It has to be read to him. He has to be told his rights. And what he does about it is his own affair. Now, if you'd rather we park the mobile units down the highway, we You just read it to him, do you? Nothing else. What? 
It has to be explained to him if he doesn't understand it. Good Lord, Father, when you tell a man he's a hopeless case, what are you going to say? Read him a few paragraphs of the law, show him the door, and say, Next, please, you're going to die, so good day? Of course you don't read him that nothing else. Not if you have any human feeling at all. I understand that. What I want to know is something else. Do you, as a physician, advise hopeless cases to go to a mercy camp? Of course I do. If you'd seen what I'd seen, you would too. Of course I do. You'll not do it here. All right. Down the highway, the roadside park. We can set up there. But it's two miles. Most of them will have to walk. They're sick, hurt, fractured, frightened. Children, too. You'd let them be herded off down the highway and sit in the dust and I, the sun? I don't want it to be that way. Look, you were just telling me how a man-made law required you to read and explain this to a critical radiation case. I offered no objection to that in itself. Render unto Caesar to that extent, since the law demands it of you. Can you not then understand that I am subject to another law? That it forbids me to allow you or anyone else on this property under my rule to counsel anyone to do what the church calls evil? Oh! I understand well enough. Okay. You need only make me one promise, and you may use the courtyard. What promise? Simply that you won't advise anyone to go to a mercy camp. Limit yourself to diagnosis. If you find hopeless radiation cases, tell them what the law forces you to tell them. But don't tell them to go kill themselves. Uh, well, I think it would be proper to make such a promise with respect to patients who belong to your faith. I'm sorry, but that is not enough. Why? Others are not bound by your principles. If a man is not of your religion, why should you refuse to Do allow him to... Do you want an explanation? Yes. Because if a man is ignorant of the fact that something is wrong and acts in ignorance, he incurs no guilt. But while ignorance may excuse the man, it does not excuse the act which is wrong in itself. If I permitted the act simply because the man is ignorant that it is wrong, then I would incur guilt because I do know it to be wrong. It is really that painfully simple. Painfully simple. Listen, Father, they sit there and they look at you. Some scream. Some cry. All of them say, Doctor, what can I do? And what am I supposed to answer? Say nothing? Say you can die and that's all? What would you say? Pray. Yes, you would. Yes, I would. You? Listen. Pain is the only evil I know about. It's the only one I can fight. Then God help you. Antibiotics help me more. Dr. Kors, you want to use the courtyard? Just promise not to recommend euthanasia to any patient while you're there. And if I refuse? Then I suppose they'll have to drag themselves two miles down the road. Of all the merciless... On the contrary, I'm the... offering you an opportunity to do your work as required by the law you recognize without overstepping the law I recognize. Whether they go down the road or not is up to you. Uh, all right. I promise. Do you keep promises, Dr. Corus? The mobile station was set up in the courtyard right away. Zerki thought about the promise Kors had made. Worthless, perhaps. But still the man was sincere, seeing misery everywhere and detesting it, and sincere in wanting to do something about it. Sincere, that was the hell of it. From a distance, one's adversaries seemed fiends, but with a closer view, one saw the sincerity, and it was as great as one's own. Perhaps Satan was the sincerest of all. Brother Pat brought him a message. The message informed him that Brother Joshua and the others had departed from New Rome for an unspecified destination in the West. The message also advised him that information had leaked to Zone Defense Interior, who'd asked questions about the rumored launching of an unauthorized starship. The legal situation was tangled, but evidently the starship was not yet in space. Zerki prayed that the group would get away without a test in the courts, which might take weeks or months. He suddenly realized 
his thinking had changed during the previous day or two. A few days ago, everyone had been waiting for the sky to burst asunder. But nine days had passed since Lucifer had prevailed in space and scorched a city out of existence. Despite the dead, the maimed, and the dying, there had been nine days of silence. Since the wrath had been stayed thus far, perhaps the worst could be averted. He'd found himself thinking of things that might happen next week or next month, as if, after all, there might really be a next week or a next month. The refugees were noisy in the courtyard. The quiet of the old abbey was shattered by strange sounds. The boisterous laughter of men telling jokes, the cry of a child, the rattle of pots and pans, hysterical sobbing, a medic shouting. After bearing it as long as he could, Zerki picked up a pair of binoculars and climbed the stairs to one of the old watchtowers where a thick stone wall cut off most of the sounds from the courtyard. From the tower, he could see the highway. Centuries old. The highway was the same road used by pilgrims, donkey carts, wild horsemen out of the east, artillery, tanks, and ten-ton trucks. Its traffic had gushed or trickled, according to the age and season. Now, there were six lanes and robot traffic. Earlier, a monk had returned from an errand in the city and had reported that Green Star was setting up another refugee camp at the park two miles down the highway. With the binoculars, he could see tents being pitched. There was a big red engine of some sort. It seemed to have a firebox and something like a boiler. At least a dozen trucks were parked on the side road. One seemed to be hauling bricks. Another was burdened with pottery and straw. There was a load of urns or vases all alike, packed together with cushioning wads of straw. Recognition came to him. Once he'd driven past a crematorium and seen men unloading a truck. He swung the binoculars again, searching for the great red engine. What had at first glance appeared to be a boiler now suggested an oven or a furnace. Late that evening, Dr. Kors came looking for the abbot. The physician looked haggard, unnerved. I just broke my promise. Proud of it? Not especially. We'll leave at once, of course. I just thought I'd tell you. Wait a minute. You'll tell me the rest. Will I? Why? So you can go threaten hellfire? She's sick enough now, and so is the child. I'll tell you nothing. You already have. I know who you mean. Radiation sickness. Uncontrollable vomiting. Flash burns. The woman has a broken hip. The father's dead. The fillings in the woman's teeth are radioactive. The child almost glows in the dark. And I can't do anything for them except the euthanasia unit. I've seen them. Then you know why I broke the promise. What did you tell her? If you love your child, spare her the agony. Go to sleep mercifully as quick as you can. That's all. We'll leave. Zerki found the woman lying on a cot with the child. They were huddled together under a blanket. Both were crying. The 
courtyard smelled of death and antiseptic. Father? Yes. We're done for. See? See what they gave me? A red ticket? Yes, I know. You know what this is? It's a rosary. It's for you. Keep it. Use it. Thank you. Bear it and pray. I know what I have to do. Don't be an accomplice. For the love of God, child, don't. The doctor said that Don't be an accomplice. Don't. The woman was silent. The next day, with errands in the city, he ordered a car, climbed in, dialed its destination, and sank back wearily while the automatic controls engaged the gears and nosed the car toward the gate. In passing the gate, he saw the woman standing at the roadside, the child with her. He jabbed at the cancel button. The car stopped. What are you doing out of bed, child? You're not supposed to be up, not with that hip. Where do you think you're going? To town. I've got to go. It's urgent. Not so urgent that somebody couldn't do it for you. No. Nobody else can do it for me. I've got to get down. All right, then. I'll take you to town. I'm driving in anyway. No. I'll walk. i You can't walk to town, child. Come on now. Let's get you back to bed. I've got to get to town, I tell you. All right, then. Get in the car. I'll take you to town. The car waited for a break in the traffic, then swerved onto the highway. Two minutes later, as they approached the Green Star Mercy Camp, he dialed a slower speed to have a look. The woman put her hand on the door handle. She was eyeing the car's controls. Zerke quickly punched up fast lane. The car shot ahead again. She took her hand from the door. Oh. <laughs> Are you in pain, daughter? It doesn't matter. Offer it to heaven, child. You think it would please God? If you offer it, yes. I cannot understand a God who is pleased by my baby's pain. No, no, it's not the pain that is pleasing to God, child. It's the soul's endurance. Save your breath, Father. I'm not complaining. My baby is. But she doesn't understand your sermon. She can hurt, though. Oh, she can hurt. She can't understand. Don't do it, daughter. Just don't do it. I'll think about it. I had a cat once when I was a boy. He was a big gray tomcat with that sort of slouchy insolence that makes some of them look like the devil's own. He, he was pure cat. Do you, do you know cats? A little. Cat lovers don't know cats. You can't love all cats if you know cats. The ones you can love if you know them are the ones that cat lovers don't even like. Well, Zeke was that kind of cat. This has a moral, of course. Only that I killed him. Stop! Whatever you are about to say, stop! A truck hit him, crushed his back legs. He dragged himself under the house. Once in a while he'd make a noise, like a cat fight thrash around a little, but mostly he just lay quietly and waited. He ought to be destroyed, they kept telling me. After a few hours he dragged himself from under the house, crying for help. He ought to be destroyed, they said. I wouldn't let them do it. They said it was cruel to let him live. So finally I said I'd do it myself if it had to be done. I got a gun and a shovel and I took him out to the edge of the woods. I stretched him out on the ground while he dug a hole. Then I shot him through the head. It was a small bore rifle. Zeke thrashed a couple of times. He got up. He started dragging himself toward some bushes. I shot him again. It knocked him flat, so I thought he was dead. And I put him in the hole. And after a couple of shovels of dirt, Zeke got up and he pulled himself out of the hole and he started for the bushes again. I was crying louder than the cat. I had to kill him with a shovel, and while I was chopping with it, Zeke was still thrashing around. They told me later it was just reflex, but I didn't believe it. I knew that cat. He wanted to get to those bushes and just lie there and wait. I wish to God that I had only let him get to those bushes and die the way a cat would if you just let it alone, with dignity. I never felt right about it. Zeke was only a cat, but... I... Shut up! But even the ancient pagans noticed nature imposes nothing on you that nature doesn't prepare you to bear. If that is true, even of a cat, 
then is it not more perfectly true of a creature with a rational intellect and will, whatever you may believe of heaven? Shut up, damn you! Shut up! They drove into the city. Zerki stopped to post a letter, stopped at St. Michael's to speak with Father Sello, stopped again at the Zone Defense Interior Office. Each time he returned to the car, he half expected the woman to be gone. But she sat quietly, holding the baby. Are you going to tell me where you wanted to go, child? Nowhere. I've changed my mind. Good. Then we'll go back home. On the way back, as they approached the Mercy Camp, a police officer stepped out ahead of them and pointed his traffic baton at the vehicle's obstruction detectors. The autopilot reacted automatically and brought the car to a stop. The policeman came up to the car and stared at the red tickets, still hanging at the throats of the woman and the child. Oh, afternoon, Father. You from the Abbey up there? Yes, I am, officer, and this woman and baby are staying there as well. Uh Uh-huh. Is that right, ma'am? I'm getting out here. No, I forbid you. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Where do you get off forbidding a lady to get out? A baby. Let me take the baby, please. Is that your kid, lady? She's mine. He, uh, holding you prisoner or something? No. What do you want to do, ma'am? It's up to you. Stay in the car. Ma'am, what do you say? We're both getting out here. No. Hey! You want to face a charge? All right, ma'am. You and the kid, you can get out now. I'll get somebody to help you. Of course. Hey, Doc. Yes? Come over here a minute, will you? Yes, what is it? Can you see to this woman and her baby while I take care of this nut in here? Sure. Nurse, take this child to tent three and give the mother a hand. Am I under arrest? I'm thinking about it. Any particular charge? How about attempted kidnap? Listen, Father, I know how you feel about all this. You! Zerky's fist shot out of the window and into the doctor's face. It caught Coors off balance, and he sat down hard on the road. Hey, all right, you get out of there. Now, stay there. One move and I lock you up. The policeman pulled the priest out of the driver's seat and pushed him hard against the side of the car. The officer went to talk with the doctor. Thoroughly ashamed, Zerki pressed his forehead against the metal of the car and tried to pray. It mattered little to him at the moment what they might decide to do. What am I doing? He could think what only of the woman and the child. He was certain she'd been ready to change her mind, if oh, only they'd not forced him to stop here. All right, Father, you're a lucky nut, I'll say that. What? Dr. Kors refuses to file a complaint. He says he had one coming. What's, uh... What's your job up there at the Abbey? I am the abbot. Ah, the head guy, huh? Uh, yes, officer. That uh, give you a license to commit common assault? I'm sorry. If Dr. Kors will hear me, I'll apologize. Yeah. Listen, let's just forget the whole thing. Only you stay away from this place, you hear? Yes. All right, get moving. But if you so much as drive past here and spit, that'll be it. Yes, Alone with his shame, Zerki drove back to the abbey, where he sought out the prior, his confessor. I believe you've been warned about that temper before? Yes, Father. You realize the intent was relatively murderous? There was no intent to kill. Are you trying to excuse yourself? No, Father. The intent was to hurt. I accuse myself of violating the spirit of the fifth commandment in thought and deed, and of sinning against justice and charity and bringing disgrace and scandal on my office. You realize you've broken a promise never to resort to violence? Yes, Father. I deeply regret it. And the only mitigating circumstances that you just saw read and swung. Do you often let yourself abandon reason like that? Elsewhere as well, reason had been abandoned. A weird and brooding silence from both capitals. A kind of numb fury. Both at battle alert.
So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody is different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Alleluia, alleluia, the final episode of a series in 15 parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller, Jr. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A Canticle for Leibowitz. Here continues the Chronicle set down daily by the brethren, the brethren of Isaac Edward Leibowitz, in their abbey in the desert of the southwest. Quote, now come we to the year of our Lord 3781. And it came to pass in that year that much slaughter was done in the world. The city of Texarkana was laid low by great engines of battle launched by the nations of Asia. Nor were the nations of the west free of blood guiltiness. So that all men were fearful, for if from these first passages of arms a general war should ensue, then all would certainly perish. Therefore the justices of the world came together in the world court of nations, and declared for all to hear that there should be a ten-day truce, wherein men might settle their differences without recourse to arms. Nevertheless, peace was no certain outcome. And should it fail, one starship stood prepared to flee this earth and journey outward to the distant stars, to the far colonies of man already there, to carry, if this world were destroyed, the memorabilia, the memory of earth. Also one copy of this chronicle. And the ship's company, were men skilled in the use of such vessels before they entered religion. These monks traveled to New Rome, and thence to the western shore where the starship was, that they might instantly depart should war come. And to those who remained at the Abbey of St. Leibowitz, the vows remained, as they ever had, to live the remainder of their lives, be they long, be they short, according to the holy rule and to pray for the salvation of the world." Unquote. His prayers for the moment completed, the abbot left the church to go back to his office. And there in the courtyard, on the way, was a reminder of war and the folly of war. Ever since World War III, 1800 years ago, all kinds of genetic mutations had occurred. And here was one of them. Mrs. Grails, the fruit and vegetable woman with a basket of tomatoes on her right hip and on her left shoulder a second head. One person with two heads. Or was it perhaps two persons with one body? A neat question easily answered until recently, for the second head had been a mere lump of flesh. But of late, there had appeared to be faint stirrings of life in it. Mrs. Grails had taken to calling it Rachel, and was anxious for it to be baptized. I brought you somewhat, Father Zarekee. 
Some tomatoes, see? Oh, oh thank you, Mrs. Grail. Uh, you'll have to see Brother Elton, though. He does the buying for our kitchen. Oh, not for buying, Father. <laughs> no. I brought them to you for free. Oh, you've got lots to feed with all the poor things you're taking care of. So they're for free. Where'll I put them? The emergency kitchen's... <sighs> Uh, no. You, you can leave them here. I'll get someone to carry them to the guest house. Carry them myself. I carried them this far. Thank you, Mrs. Grails. It's very good of Father, 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 wait. A minute, Your Honor. Just a minute of your time. I'm sorry, Mrs. Grails, but it's as I told you last time. Baptism is a matter for your parish. There's nothing no, I can no, no, do no, about Father, it. No, not that. It'd be somewhat else I wanted to ask of you. Would you hear my confession, Father? Big shriveness for bothering you, but I'm sad for my naughties, and I would it were you who shrives me. Why not Father Salem? Oh, I tell you the truth, for your honor. It's that the man is an occasion of sin for me. I go mean and well for the man, but I look once on his face and forget myself. God love him, but I can't. Well, if he's offended you, you'll have to forgive him. I won't forgive that I do. But at a goodly distance... Ever since he was refusing to christen Rachel, I go losing my temper with him on sight. <laughs> so, all right, Mrs. Grails, I'll hear your confession. But I've got something I have to do first. Meet me in church in a few minutes. Will that be all right? Aye, aye, bless you, Father. She nodded profusely. Zerke could have sworn the Rachel head mirrored the nods. Ever so slightly. He reached his office just in time for the beginning of the bulletin. The conference of foreign ministers on Guam has just ended. No joint policy statement has yet been issued. The ministers are returning to their capitals to confer with their governments. An earlier report which alleged that the conference was breaking up amid bitter invective has been denied by the ministries. The ten-day waiting period ends today, but it is generally held that the ceasefire agreement will continue to be observed. However, defense remains at battle alert. Our next bulletin will be broadcast. Oh, dear God. The abbot left his office and started for the church. But on the way, he glanced up to the watchtower and saw the prior there, staring out over the wall. Father Leahy? Yes, Reverend Father. What are you staring at? If it's coming, you won't have time to see it until the flash. And then you'd better not be looking. Stop it. It's unhealthy. Yes, Reverend Father. I wasn't watching for that, though. I was watching the buzzards. Buzzards? There have been lots of them all day. Dozens of buzzards just circling. Where are they? Over the Green Star Cap down the highway. Oh, well. That's no omen, then. That's just healthy vulture appetite. He went to the church. Mrs. Grails was waiting for him, kneeling in a pew. And she seemed half asleep. Mrs. Grails? He spoke to her twice before she heard him. Mrs. Grails. And when she rose, she stumbled a little. She paused to feel at the Rachel face, exploring its eyelids and lips with withered fingers. Is something wrong, daughter? I, father, I feel the dread one about, I do. The dread one's close, very close about us here. I feel need of shriveness, father. And something else as well. Something else, Mrs. Grails. I need be giving shriveness to him as well. To whom? I, I don't understand. Shriveness? To him who made me as I am. I... I never forgave him for it. Forgive God? How can you? He, he is just. He is justice. He is love. How can you... Can't an old tomato woman forgive him just a little for his justice? Afford I be asking his shriveness on me? Abbot Zerke swallowed, hard. He glanced down at her bicephalous shadow. It hinted at a terrible justice, this shadow shape. In her world, it was conceivable to forgive justice as well as to forgive injustice. For man to pardon God as well as for God to pardon man. Blessings, Father, for I have sinned. She spoke haltingly. 
He found it hard to concentrate. There was the business about her mate. There were the murky and secret things that he could only make sense of a little of it seemed to make the horror worse. Oh, please, Father. Father, I don't... <gasps> the dread one. The dread one. A light was shining through the church. Don't look up, Mrs. Grails. The light grew brighter and brighter until the church was full of bright new. Wait! Wait till it dies! Wait! Wait, wait till it dies. Mrs. Grails? Mrs. Grails? I never meant to. I never meant to never love. Now! Love. Quickly! Oh. Run! Zerky ran down the aisle toward the altar. The light had dimmed, but it still roasted the skin with noon bright sun glare. How many seconds remained? He stumbled into the sanctuary, removed the ciborium from the tabernacle, grabbed up the body of his god and ran for it. The world fell in on him. When he awoke, there was nothing but dust. He was pinned to the ground at the waist. He lay on his belly in the dirt and tried to move. One arm was free, but the other was caught under the weight that held him down. It held whatever remained of him below the waist. His free hand still clutched the ciborium, but he had tipped it in falling. The top had come off, spilling several of the small hosts. Cautiously, he picked each of them out of the sand. Is, is anybody left? A trickle oh of blood God. kept seeping into his eyes. My God. Help me. My God, my God, help me. What? 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 No answer. There was not much pain, only a ferocious itching that came from the captive part of him. He tried to scratch. His fingers found only bare rock. He clawed at it for a moment, shuddered, and took his hand away. The itch was maddening. Well, Dr. Coors, how do you know the itch is not the more basic evil than the pain? He laughed a little at that one. The laugh caused a sudden blackout. He clawed his way out of the blackness to the accompaniment of someone screaming. Suddenly the priest knew the screaming was his own. Zerky was suddenly afraid. There was agony now, even in breathing. But he could bear that. The dread had arisen from that last taste of inky blackness. The blackness seemed to brood over him, covet him, await him hungrily. Pain he could bear. But not that awful dark. Once he surrendered to that darkness... There would be nothing he could do or undo. Ashamed of his fright, he tried to pray, but the prayers seemed somehow unprayerful, as if the last prayer had already been said, the last canticle already sung. The fear persisted. Why that inky dark? You really believe there's something on the other side of it, don't you? 
And why are you shaking so? The dark began oh. to descend again. Uh, the blink, uh, and the blackness went away. He remembered the child. Dear God. The child dying of radiation, whose mother had chosen the mercy camp for the child and for herself, despite all he could do. And remembering them, he discovered what he was afraid of. He had said, Nature imposes nothing that nature hasn't prepared you to bear. Dear God, let me live long enough to practice what I preached. He was afraid to slide away into that blackness before he'd endured as much as God might help him endure. Let it be for the child and her mother. The decision seemed to diminish the pain. He heard the voice again, the soft echo voice, this time in a kind of childish sing-song. Who, who is it? It can't be Mrs. Grails. Mrs. Grails would have forgiven God and run for home. Should I have told that to Dr. Kors? Listen, my dear Dr. Kors, why don't you forgive God for allowing pain? Be granting shriveness to God, as she'd said, before anything, before love. He slept a while. It was a natural sleep and not that ugly, mind-seizing nothingness of the dark. A rain came, clearing the dust. When he awoke, he was not alone. He lifted his cheek out of the mud and looked at the bird who sat there doing a little shuffle dance and peering at him gravely. Dinner's not quite ready, Brother Buzzard. You'll have to wait. It would not have many meals to look forward to. Its feathers were singed from the flash, and it kept one eye closed. The bird was soggy with rain. The voice again. He thought it might be an hallucination. The voice again. But the bird was hearing it too. It kept peering at something out of Zerke's range of vision. Help! Help. Help! And the two-headed woman wandered into sight around a heap of rubble. Mrs. Crails. She stopped and looked down at Zerky. Thank God. Thank God. Mrs. Crails. Mrs. Crails. See if you See can find... See if you can find... See if you can find... See if you can find... Rachel. Rachel. She knelt there in front of him and settled back on her heels, watching him with cool green eyes and smiling innocently. There was something about her eyes that caused him to notice nothing else for several seconds. But then he noticed the head of Mrs. Graves slept soundly on the other shoulder while Rachel smiled. It seemed a young, shy smile that hoped for friendship. Listen. Listen. Is anyone... Is anyone... Else alive? Else alive? She savored the words, smiling over them. Oh, my God. She was trying to say something. <sighs> By the repetition, was she trying to convey the idea... I am somehow like you. But she had only just now been born. He looked down at her knees. Zerke remembered that Mrs. Grails had arthritis. In the knees. Both knees. But the body 
which had belonged to Mrs. Grail's, was now kneeling there, and sitting back on its heels in that limber posture of youth. He glanced at the face of Mrs. Grail's. It was gray. The lips seemed bloodless. He felt certain it was dying. He could imagine it withering and eventually falling away like a scab or an umbilical cord. So who is Rachel? And what? He moistened one fingertip and beckoned her to lean closer. If no man... Whatever she was, thee, and she'd probably received too much radiation to live very long. He began tracing a cross on her forehead. <gasps> but she pulled away. Her eyes fell on the ciborium. She picked it up. She held the golden cup in her left hand, and in her right, delicately between thumb and forefinger, a single host. She was offering it to him. Lord... I am not worthy. But only say the word. He received the wafer from her hand. Cool fingertips touched his forehead. And he heard her say one word. Live. Live. Then she was gone. The image of those cool green eyes lingered with him as long as life. He had seen primal innocence in those eyes. Afterwards, he lay with his face in the wet dirt and waited. Nothing else ever came. Nothing that he saw or felt or heard. The abbot was dead, the abbey a ruin. The memorabilia, on its way to Alpha Centaurus, carried there by what remained of the brethren of Leberwitz, who, when the visage of Lucifer had mushroomed above the horizon, rising slowly like some titan climbing to its feet after ages of imprisonment in the earth, had sealed their hatch and left the earth, in their starship. Now, on the shore beside their blast-off point, the breakers beat monotonously, casting up driftwood. An abandoned seaplane floated beyond the breakers. After a while, the breakers caught the seaplane and threw it on the shore with the driftwood. It tilted and fractured a wing. There were shrimp carousing in the breakers and the whiting that fed on the shrimp and the shark that munched the whiting and found them admirable in the sportive brutality of the sea. A wind came across the ocean, sweeping with it a pall of fine white ash. The ash fell into the sea into the breakers. The breakers washed dead shrimp ashore with the driftwood. Then they washed up the whiting. The shark swam out to his deepest waters and brooded in old, clean currents. He was very hungry that season.
Canticle for Leibowitz. The final episode of a series in fifteen parts. Adapted from a novel by Walter Miller Jr. Bart Heyman was Abbot Zerke. Marsha Lewis played Mrs. Grails and Rachel. Herb Hartig was Father Leahy and the announcer. Narration by Carol Cowan. Adaptation John Reeves. Music by Greg Fish and Bob Budney, and the Edgewood College Chant Group. Engineering and mixing Marv Nunn. Special effects Vic Marsh. The program was directed by Carl Schmidt. A Canticle for Leibowitz was produced by Marv Nunn and Carl Schmidt for WHA and NPR, with funds from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio